The year was 4,280, according to the Yulan calendar. On the territory of the Poant Empire, the continent of Yulan, a mysterious masked girl in a black jumpsuit was hovering in the air, striking the ground with her staff, and a man on the ground was constantly dodging her blows. The force of her blows was so strong that flashes could be seen far beyond the mountains. It was Delon Coward, a young girl with purple hair. She was shouting to her grandfather that he was not afraid to see her and that he had nowhere to run. Constantly pointing her spear, she was shooting fire at the old man, who was constantly trying to hide from her on the ground. She shouted at him that he would not escape her today and he was the only one who would die. It was Hamlin a stout old man who was cursing at her and shouting that she had followed him to fight him to the death. He kept shouting that she shouldn't even think that she could defeat him. And as he screamed, he began to draw magic from his palm, and it turned into fire. Hamelin quickly shouted the spell, Dance of the Salamander, and launched huge pillars of fire in Delon's direction. The fire enveloped the girl from all sides and trapped her in a ball of fire, but her face showed no fear or confusion. She began to draw a cooling ball in the air around her with her staff, thus extinguishing the enemy's fire. Hamelin called her a turtle hiding behind a shell. Delon laughed out loud at him. She continued to mock Hamelin, saying that he had said that he would become the strongest firebender. Hamelin was furious and shouted that Delon was being ridiculous. His rage was overwhelming, and he felt as if he was going to tear himself apart. But then suddenly Delon heard the spell, Scorching Stroke. In her back, she was pierced with pain and electric shock. She turned around with a roar of surprise and saw the mummy next to her. And an incredible battle began. The mummy was constantly attacking Delon with aggression and incredible strength. The mummy was shouting to Delon that she had the holy level of earth magic. And Delon, confused, simply kicked him, throwing him back a few meters. In an instant, Delon thought that Hamelin had used an assistant but melee combat was not an advantage for her, so she had to use magic to defeat him. She spun around and created a circle of fire around her and shouted a spell directing it at the mummy. There was an incredible explosion, and the stones under the mummy's feet split. The mummy continued to mock Delon for her good spell, but it was too slow. Delon's next kick was even stronger, and the mummy flipped several times in the air. Dylan thought that perhaps she should limit the mummy's movements and use a new strategy, namely, to summon the earth shield, and then she could restrain its speed. But then Hamelin insidiously intervened in the battle, and with his sword, he launched a pillar of fire at Dylan's body, setting fire to the ground beneath her. The force of the fire was so strong that Dylan did not understand what was happening, and could not use her staff. She was in so much pain and heat that she thought it would be better to go down to the ground. But then the mummy blocked the air between Delon and the ground with her sword. The mummy was laughing and shouting to Delon, but she probably didn't know that she could kill with both hands and use both sword and dagger at the same time. Shouting goodbye, the beautiful mummy plunged the blade of her dagger into Delon's back. Blood spurted out and Delon's body convulsed with pain. The girl began to fall. Her body showed no signs of life. Her face turned white and blood flowed down her legs. Everything stopped in an instant, and Delon lay in the bloody sand, not moving. Hamelin shouted to her with satisfaction that he had spent a lot of his efforts to lure her to a place where no one would find her body. The mummy stood behind him and laughed nastily. But at that moment, Delin came to her senses. She looked up and gritted her teeth saying that Hamelin had no pride left in the magician if he had thought to trap her. She began to struggle to get up and continued to tell Gamelin that he was only an earth mage, who was so arrogant as to go against a fire mage who had a thousand-year-old holy level of great magic. Hamelin mockingly replied that the job was done and it didn't matter how. The mummy began to demand payment for her deeds. The bandaged miracle stood there begging for money, but Hamelin did not listen. Or, Delon thought she was being too careless, but she told Hamelin that he was underestimating her, because she had more experience than him. And even if I die, it won't be by your hand, Delon shouted. Delon quietly put her palm on the ground and whispered a spell. Oh, Mother Earth, I believe in you. Instantly she rose up and shouted, The Divine Earth Crush. A crown appeared above her head, glowing with blue light, 
and magic came into play. Dellen quickly rose into the sky from where she shouted to Hamelin to look at her one last time in the sky. This is my power, a heavenly field of fire, she shouted to him. Hamelin stood there in shock. He could not believe his eyes. At that moment, he thought, where did she get so much power? And he swung his sword, and a stream of fire came out. And an incredible thing happened. Dellen's heavenly field of fire met Hamelin's at the same time. And there was a huge explosion. Hamelin's last words were that it was impossible, and he would never believe it. His grandfather was burning in the fire. The mummy quietly muttered that the old battle was lost. The shockwave was terrible. Trees were torn up by the roots. Mountains were crushed into small stones. The earth and air were on fire, and it seemed as if the end of the world had begun. Five thousand years passed. The year was 9,990. Wushan Village, Fenglai Kingdom. Two men stood watching the children train. They were Lori and Roger. Lori said that today they had applicants who were full of energy. Roger replied that these kids were new to the group, so they wanted to show off their skills. Lori looked at Roger's face and said that he somehow looked too embarrassed and excited. They were discussing Lenly, the future leader of Wushan, who was stronger than a normal person. But his opponent in the battle had much more experience. It was Lenly Baruch, a young blonde boy who did not seem to be a big or pumped-up athlete. His opponent was five times bigger than him, had thick arms and stomach, and seemed like he was going to crush Lenly with his weight. And in an instant, the big man fell face first into the ground. It was clear that he was not happy about this disgrace. Lenly did not expect such a fall from his opponent and was surprised, but he continued to fight with zeal. He again took his opponent in an arm lock and threw him over himself, hitting him painfully on the ground. Lori, Roger, and the other boys watched the fight with surprise and admiration and someone in the crowd praised Lenly for managing to defeat an opponent who was older than him. How did you manage to knock me down? The fat man shouted in shock. Lenly smiled and gave him a hand to get up. Laurie watched and said that the group of applicants was good, but no one could be compared to Lenly. This guy had been training since he was a kid. The knight was fully armored and holding a spear. He asked the guys how the applicants behaved in general. Laurie just opened his mouth to tell about his impressions, calling him Captain instead of his first name. Then the knight quickly swung his spear and unexpectedly hit the unsuspecting Lenly. He hit the boy's shoulder so painfully that he lost his balance and cried out, Uncle Hillman, come on. The children in the crowd were frightened by what they saw. Captain Hillman skillfully twisted his spear around Lenly's body like a spiral, which he helplessly spun like a toy. But at some point, Lenly gathered himself and managed to get to his feet, catching his balance. And then, unexpectedly for everyone around him, he quickly grabbed the sharp spear of the surprised captain. With a sharp yank, Lenly bent the spear to the ground and jumped on top of it. The crowd of children whispered. Lenly began to spin on the spear, then stood on his feet, then stood on his hands. He looked like a circus acrobat. Hillman took off his helmet and said with satisfaction that little Lenly had great skills and none of his attacks had hit the boy. To himself, the captain thought that Lenli was indeed a real miracle of Wushan, maybe even the entire Fenglai kingdom. This was just a small test, so I will teach you more later, the captain promised the kid. Hillman turned to the entire crowd of children and asked if anyone knew how many levels the warrior class was divided into. He then asked the amazed children if anyone knew anything about these levels and could tell him, Tomorrow we will start physical training. But today, I will teach you the basics of warriorhood, Hillman promised them. Hillman walked over to a large stone standing nearby and touched it lightly with his fist. Shouting at that moment, Strike Chi! The stone broke into small stones in front of the amazed crowd of children. Hillman explained to all the children that this is what the true power of a sixth-level warrior actually looks like. And the captain continued his story about ranks. Having the first level is the minimum requirement to join the army. A third-level warrior can become an elite soldier, and if you reach the fifth or sixth level, you can become a captain. Lenly slyly asked Captain Hillman what he had to say about level nine soldiers. Hillman replied that Lenly was able to dodge his attacks, but if he showed his full strength, the boy wouldn't be able to escape him. I've never met a real warrior of the ninth level in my life, 
the captain replied to the disappointed boy. Above the ninth level, there are four other legendary supreme warriors who have become saint-level warriors, Hillman continued to explain. Hillman explained that the great generals of Yulan are only level eight. If there is a level nine warrior, then in Fenglai he will become the number one warrior, but level nine is not the maximum level. The four great warriors are the Dragon Blood Warrior, the Purple Flame Warrior, the Striped Tiger Warrior, and the Immortal Warrior. Roger asked Hillman how come he had never seen a ninth level warrior, but could describe the four great warriors in such detail? The crowd of children heard this answer and began to laugh out loud. And then Laurie slapped Roger in the face and hissed at him that he was an idiot. Couldn't he see how excited the children were? On a hill not far from this training camp, there was a huge old castle with strange architecture. It was the home of Lenly, or rather the home of the Baruch clan. It was a huge building of Japanese architecture of that time, and with all the appropriate attributes. In the courtyard of the house sat a man who had carved a sculpture of a child's face out of wood. He muttered that time had passed very quickly, and Lenly was already twelve years old. It was time to tell him everything. Turning to the sculpture he was holding in his hand, he asked, if you are still alive, will you support my methods? At that time, three sons had already left the Baruch family clan, and the story of this family would probably end soon. This was Nog Baruch, Lenly's father, a tall, stout man with a beard about forty-five years old with tired eyes. Nog walked over to the shelves with the carved busts of his children and whispered, Maybe your generation is the last chance for our family, little Lenly. Don't let us down. The Barak clan's estate covered a huge area, but most of the land was abandoned and uncultivated. Lenly ran around the courtyard of the old manor with all his might, shouting and looking for his father, but he was nowhere to be found. A little boy ran out to meet him and threw himself around his neck, screaming, Brother, I learned so much today. It was Horton Baruch, Lenly's younger brother. Lenly was surprised by the boy's scream and asked him where their father was. Horton did not listen to him, but showed him a small rag. Lenly smiled and asked him what he had done with it. The proud little boy replied that he was wiping everything around him. He went on to say that he wiped the column, the jugs, and even the toilet paper. He was very proud of himself. Today, my brother, I learned the most important thing. How to use a rag, Horton shouted. He even rubbed his father's favorite dishes with it to shine. Lenly heard this and laughed out loud throughout the yard. He bent down to the boy and whispered to him not to say anything about the dishes to his father, just in case. At this time, Hiri, the butler, came out to them and reported that the master was in the study waiting for someone. Lindley ran to his father's study, and when he met him there, Nog asked him how today's training was going. Lindley called out to his father again, but he turned to the burning fireplace and looked at the fire without hearing him. Nog quietly told him that as the heir to the Baruch clan, and as the future leader of Wushan, he had to be better than the others. Father seems unhappy and gloomy today. I wonder what happened, thought Lenly. There was some tension. He asked his father if he would teach him today. Nog agreed, and asked Lenly to repeat the areas of Yulan. Lenly explained that there are twelve kingdoms west of the ridge, and thirty-two principalities divided into two divisions. In the empires, the laws of the emperor are inviolable and they consist of the Central Empire, the Yulan Empire, the Southeastern Empire, the Rin Empire, the Eastern Empire, the Roholt Empire, and the Northern Empire, the O'Brien Empire. And then Lenly's speech was interrupted. They heard the doorbell ring, someone came in and greeted Nog. But Nog didn't hear anything, that someone had entered their house and continued to interrogate Lanley. Philip, a traitor, came into the room and greeted Nog with words of joy that he had invited him to visit. Nog hugged Philip and said that he was also very happy to see him. He was an old friend of his. Nog turned to his son and told him that he should know everything about the Holy Alliance in which he lived. And he explained to Philip that Hillman was about to bring what he had invited him to come for. Philip impatiently kept asking where Captain Hillman was and why he was taking so long to come. Suddenly, Hillman brought into the room a huge sculpture of a lion, the size and fleshiness of which was impressive. Philip was completely delighted with the sculpture and offered Nog five hundred gold coins for it. He looked at the sculpture in detail for a long, long time 
and shouted out joyfully that it was definitely the cruel lion. But Nog answered him that 500 gold coins was a very small price. This sculpture is of historical importance, and it is worth much more. Meanwhile, Lenly looked at the men and thought in amazement that this was his father's favorite sculpture, and was he selling it for so little? But Philip began to persuade Nog, saying that the history of Yulun is very rich, and there are such treasures at every turn. However, he really likes this sculpture, but he thinks that its artistic value is not very high. Lenly continued to think that things must not be going well in the family. Otherwise, his father would never have sold this sculpture. The boy ran out in despair and turned to Captain Hillman, tears in his eyes. But the latter stopped him abruptly, telling him to forget everything and to stay out of his father's business because he was too young. Philip's servants packed the sculpture of the cruel lion on rails and carefully carried it home to their master. Philip turned to Hillman and said that although he ruled twelve cities, he had never met anyone stronger than him. The sculpture was very heavy, but Hillman easily moved it from one place to another with one hand. He had never seen anything like it. Hillman thanked him. Philip offered Captain Hillman to serve him, and he was ready to pay him a huge salary. But he abruptly refused, explaining to him that Wushan was his home, and apologized because he could not accept the offer. Captain Hillman and Lenly went out of the house into the yard, where it was quiet and they could talk in peace. Doing the way, Lenly asked him if things were really that bad in the family. Hillman told him that his father was a very good man, but that he was of little importance to Wushan. Gritting his teeth, Hillman said, These bastards with their new money. Once upon a time, the Baruch clan was prosperous. They both stood there and watched in silence as the sculpture of the beloved cruel lion was carefully carried away from their home. Dog approached them unnoticed. He told Kamatan Hillman not to talk like that. It was not the fault of these people. Nog lowered his graying head and whispered quietly, sullenly, that he was very ashamed in front of his entire family. I just want to revive my luck, even if it means selling off the family inheritance. Looking back, we are probably guiding our descendants, Nog continued. It often happens that talented, beautiful works lie idle, and there is no interest in them. Linley asked him why he sold the sculpture of the cruel lion, and why he, being a very good carver, didn't sell his sculptures. Nog explained to him that they belonged to the Baruch clan. In the past, they had a powerful sculpting technique that surpassed many masters. Compared to them, he was a mediocrity. Linley was very angry and he made a promise to himself that when he became an adult, he would help his father revive the clan. Hillman listened and said that although he had no talent as a sculptor, he recognized that becoming a sculptor was as hard as becoming a warrior. But Linley has the opportunity to become an eighth-level warrior. It was a warm summer night. The moon was full and the sky was clear, inky, and strewn with bright stars. Linley found his father in the ancestral hall and asked him what they were doing out here so late. Nog said in a sad voice that it was time to tell him their family's long-held secret. He asked the boy to come to the shelves with the sculptures. He explained that he had turned twelve years old and was considered an adult, according to the Baruch family's traditions. Linley was shocked to hear that there were some family secrets in his family. But Nog asked his son to tell him the story of their family which they had studied together, and Lenly began to tell that according to the legend, they are descendants of a sculptor who was an eighth-level warrior. He created techniques of modeling and battle, but after his death, no one could grow to his level, and so the family was split up. The father put his palm on the table and said that he was right, but unfortunately this was not their true story. The room where they were standing began to glow brightly, and Lenly was very scared. He had never seen anything like it. Suddenly, a fierce column of hot fire rose from his father's hands. Lenly's body was filled with incredible fear. Nog shouted loudly that all the sculptures of their ancestors reflected their entire family's past. Lenly saw an unknown old thick book on the table and shouted loudly to his father, What is it? Nog told the boy what Hillman had told him, that Lenly already knew about the four supreme warriors. Lenly confirmed it and Nog began to read the old book and tell the true story of their family, which he had never told his son. The first warrior of the family was of dragon blood. It flowed in his veins, and he lived on the Yulan continent. 
In the year 4560, in the city of Linan, Baruch killed a titanic ice snake and a black dragon, and because of this, he became very famous. And in 4579, Baruch fought a nine-headed imperial snake. The waves crashed and smashed the nearest towns. He fought the dragon for a day and finally took off all the heads, and then founded a clan and became its leader. Ryan Baruch was already the second dragon-blooded warrior on the Yulan continent. In the year 4690, Ryan Baruch tamed a saint-level golden dragon in the mountains of magical beasts and became known as the Golden Dragon Rider of the Saint. Together with the Golden Dragon, he tamed all the magical beasts and became a legend of the Mountain of Magical Beasts. The third warrior of dragon blood was Azar Baruch, who, in the year 5395, fought against a blood-eyed lion in his first battle. He defeated the lion and made it flee, but he was afraid of becoming world famous. Nog continued to read the magical family book louder and louder, and Lenly listened intently, holding his breath. Azar Baruch alone maintained the Holy Alliance and fought the forces of the Dark Alliance for hundreds of years. Nog continued to read. No one but our family knows the true story. Nog told the impressed young Lenly, The blood of Baruch has been passed down in our family for five thousand years. The blood of a dragon-blooded warrior runs in our veins, Nog continued. To say that Linley was shocked is an understatement. He could not believe what he was hearing. His eyes were wide open. A dragon-blood warrior. Nog shouted these words loudly to the whole room, and a long echo echoed through the room. The last warrior disappeared from the continent two thousand years ago. A hundred years after the clan was founded, four dragon blood warriors appeared. But none have appeared since, Nog said. To become a dragon blood warrior, one must have a high concentration of dragon blood in the human body. Lenly thought that his family had indeed once been very strong and could fight back against anyone, but not anymore. Definitely, the concentration of dragon blood has significantly decreased in our blood, Lenly continued his thought. Here Nog began to read the old book again, continuing with the words, but generation after generation. But Lenly interrupted and asked what this dragon blood manual was. And is it possible to reverse the dragon bloodline? Nog explained to him that their blood was passed down from generation to generation, but sometimes someone would manifest dragon blood. The secret manual of dragon blood guides a warrior on the path of a warrior calls dragon blood into the body and releases energy. But this manual was lost a thousand years ago. In order to protect our family, we must keep it a secret, he said. You're twelve years old now. I can pinpoint the dragon blood in your body, Nog said loudly. Putting his hand on his son's shoulder, he said that he really hoped that he would have dragon blood, or his younger brother. Nog took out a strange long dragon blood needle from a drawer. It was a very powerful magic item. Lenly's insides cringed with wild fear. He was still a child, so he was afraid of all kinds of injections. This needle is an indicator. It will be able to determine whether you really have dragon blood or not, his father told him. Nog told the boy to get ready. He was going to prick his finger. A little more and Lenly would have lost consciousness. The boy stretched out his right hand to his father. It was shaking with fear and his legs began to bend awkwardly. Nog lightly touched the boy's finger with the needle, and for some reason everything began to glow, both the finger and the magic needle. The father looked at the needle and his hands trembled. He really did not want to hurt his beloved son. When he finally pierced that finger, blood began to drip from the needle, and they both stood there looking at it in silence. And then a strong earthquake began. The ground shook so hard that all five statues in the room disappeared. Nog and Lenly began to hold each other's hands, but they couldn't hold on to their feet from the tremors and fell heavily to the ground. The man got up and ran to the courtyard to see what had happened. He felt that something terrible was happening there. At that moment, Lenly noticed a strange black ring on the floor, lying in the corner and absorbing light. Still holding the needle in his hands, he looked at it and thought, Maybe he should put it away. What was that light? I don't know. Is it good or bad? Different thoughts swarmed through his mind. 
He finally made up his mind and picked up the ring and began to examine it, looking through it. Nothing seemed strange to him. He decided to keep it for now and put it in his pocket, in the safest place. That evening in Wushan, Captain Hillman and the rest of his unit went out to patrol the streets of the village. Hillman told the soldiers that if they compared him and Lenly, he believed that when he was ten years old, he would be superior in strength. But the little boy was so strong and skillful that he doesn't have even half of his talent. Biruk's family can no longer practice their secret manual, Nog told me that, Hillman said. One of the warriors in the squad asked Hillman what Nog's strength level was, because he didn't look very strong. I don't know. I only know that all previous generations of the Baruch family were sculptors who were skilled in martial arts. But I don't think it takes strength alone to reach the eighth level, replied Hillman. They continued to patrol the streets on the outskirts of the village, carefully looking into all the dark corners of the settlement. And then at the end of the road they saw some disturbances, and one of the warriors saw that something strong and unusual was happening there and that everyone should be careful. When they looked closely, they saw a mountain of magical animals. Captain Hillman peered very carefully into the darkness and analyzed what he saw. He was surprised to see the huge horns of an unknown beast. And then Captain Hillman shouted loudly to someone, You! The crowd of soldiers could not understand what he was talking about. A huge buffalo with red eyes came out to them, with human figures on its back. Someone shouted to them, Hello, everyone! When they came closer, they saw that there were people with weapons on the back of the buffalo. The most important of them had red hair. He shouted to his men that the guards had responded. Someone shouted that he did not believe that there were people with powers in the guard. The soldiers hysterically shouted to Hillman that these strangers were looking down on them. Hillman asked if they were mercenaries. But the strangers were silent for some reason. Their faces were full of aggression and anger. There was a fierce hatred in the air. Captain Hillman loudly explained to the strangers that they did not welcome such guests here and would not let anyone through. One of the strangers whispered to the red-haired man that they might have to fight, and he jumped off the buffalo. I'm going to teach this uncle a lesson, who doesn't even know how old he is, the stranger shouted. And he hit the soldier of the guard with all his might, and he fell to the ground in surprise. In response, the soldier of the guard gave the stranger a good punch. Now it's your turn, they shouted to Captain Hillman. The stranger pulled out his huge dagger and rushed at Captain Hillman with it. Hillman drew his forged sword and struck the stranger with unprecedented force. The stranger did not expect him to be so strong. Stranger was thrown twenty meters away with a roar and fell painfully on his back in the bushes. If you are not afraid of death, then attack me, the captain shouted at him. He was very aggressive. The stranger struggled to his feet, saying that he would beat him much harder than the last time. Everyone sitting on the buffalo's back, including the girls, watched the fight with bated breath. The stranger shouted something incomprehensible to everyone and swung his dagger at the captain again. He ran with a terrible scream at Captain Hillman, who stood firmly on his feet and motionless, ready to take any blow. Captain Hillman quickly thrust his spear toward the stranger who was running toward him with a beastly face, with a terrible whistle. The dagger and spear of Captain Hillman and the mad stranger clashed in the air. A terrible battle broke out. The air rang with the blows of weapons and the swings of their arms, and the ground was deafeningly humming. But Captain Hillman stood bravely and firmly on his feet and skillfully wielded his spear and sword in all directions. The stranger did not yield for a moment. He was very angry and waved his dagger as much as the captain. Watching this wild and terrible fight, Luke finally shouted at them, Stop at last, both of you! The stranger stopped angrily. He could not understand how it could be that his opponent was so strong. Luke stood on the bull's head and told the captain that he recognized his strength, but did not want to quarrel with him, and suggested that they stop fighting. He explained that they were not angry people and had come here on important business. Captain Hillman told the stranger that their city would never accept such bandits. And then the stranger's soldiers and the guards heard a strange loud sound coming from the mountains. Luke looked back in fright and shouted that everything was very bad. Had he caught up with them? No one could understand what he meant. Captain Hillman could not understand what he was talking about. He was constantly looking into the distance to see something. 
Then a huge red dragon appeared in front of everyone's eyes. It was just gigantic, with red scales and spikes. Oh my god, what is this? All the soldiers shouted in a chorus. It was the seventh rank of the magical beast, the Velocity Dragon. The girls who were on the buffalo shouted that it had caught up with them, and one of them mockingly asked if they still wanted to continue their battle. People ran out the doors and climbed out the windows, all looking at the magic dragon in disbelief. Meanwhile, in the Baruch family's ancestral hall, Lenly decided to hang the dark ring around his neck so he wouldn't lose it. And then he heard his friends screaming, saying how could he sleep when there was such a screaming outside. The boy jumped out into the yard and saw his two friends and told them that it was late. What were they doing here? But the children kept shouting to the whole yard that it was some kind of terrible magical beast. So this is not an ordinary earthquake, thought Linley. And fear stiffened his body and his legs began to shake. There must be something in the ancestral hall that does not let sounds through, he thought. But his friends began to call him to go see. All three of them ran very quickly to the outskirts of the village, heading straight for the unusual sound coming from the distance. And then the ring hanging from a string around Linley's neck began to glow with a bright blue light. It looks like I've been asleep for a very long time. Some unknown girl in the air stretched sweetly. She materialized right in the air and started moving right behind Linley. Did that boy wake me up? She said in surprise, stretching to her full height. It was Dellen Coward. The girl could not believe that she was really woken up by this strange little boy. She began to move invisibly through the air behind Linley, being completely light and transparent. Meanwhile, the red dragon came as close as possible to the buffalo and the warriors who were on it, and the guard squad. One of the warriors shouted that there was a magician who controlled it, but everyone covered his mouth so as not to draw the dragon's attention to them. They all saw an elderly man in a hat with a monocular who shouted at them, You will not escape this time. But Luke was very familiar with this man, so he boldly asked him what was true. The man in the hat stood on the neck of a red dragon, holding a spear with a green stone, and shouted, We meet again, my friend, but let's not have any of that shit today. Just give me this thing, he ordered Luke menacingly. In Luke's hands was a large stone of unprecedented beauty, shimmering from all sides, blue and green. He took it out of the inside pocket of his colorful vest and rubbed it on his sleeve. It was the Dibero Shadow Diamond, worth 10,000 gold coins. It could be used as a core to improve the quality of a weapon. If it was put into a staff, it would improve the quality of the weapon, and the time it took to cast magic would decrease difficult to create weapons. Captain Hillman was shocked to think that this could be the very legendary, but his thoughts were interrupted by a man in a hat who shouted, Diamond de Barrow, we finally meet. Not that we didn't want to, but there are no such idiots who want to offend a high-ranking magician, Luke replied. But the magician started shouting that he had not only refused the exchange, but had also stolen it from him. Roger shouted at the top of his lungs that it was very, very expensive for them. In response, Luke shouted that the magician wanted it for a thousand gold coins. How could anyone agree to such terms? All the soldiers on the buffalo began to shout that they could not accept such a bad deal. The magician shouted that he was ready to trade with them. Don't even think about refusing. Stop hinting, give it to me, he shouted. Luke shouted back that they did not agree to that at all. And then suddenly the magician launched huge pillars of fire right at Luke's feet. Luke was furious and shouted, I, the Salu clan of Fenglai. He placed Dookie's armor in front of the stream of fire that was flying directly at him. The mage sharpened his monocular and looked at Luke's armor and said that it was not bad at all. Luke fearlessly pointed his sword and shouted to him that no one was afraid of him at all. Fire magic, Luke shouted the spell and a blue bright glow shone around him. We will decide everything today in battle, the mage shouted nervously to him. All the warriors who were sitting on the buffalo quickly began to jump down with fire. Feel the power of the seventh-ranked magical beast, the Velocity Dragon, the magician shouted, and the dragon opened its mouth and gave out a column of fire. Everyone who got down from the buffalo began to line up in a fighting seven and took out all their weapons. The two girls who had come down from the buffalo shouted a spell, Holy water! Luke, with all his fury, threw himself into this fierce battle alone. The girls cast magic. The red dragon gave out fierce fire. Everything was mixed into one big pile. 
The battle moved to the walls of the outpost, which Luke completely destroyed with his sword. Hillman's soldiers rushed to him. The warriors of the magician, the warriors of Luke, mixed their slaughter into one heap. It was no longer possible to discern who was beating whom. This terrible massacre destroyed all the buildings that stood in its way, burning everything around. Huge pieces of buildings were flying in all directions, some of them flying towards the Red Dragon. What kind of incomprehensible attack is this? A very angry mage shouted loudly, which could be heard throughout the neighborhood. Twenty minutes later, the Red Dragon was in the center of the battle. Everything was on fire, both houses and trees. Frightened residents were running out of the destroyed houses, and Hillman ordered his soldiers to take all the refugees to the city center. Luke's soldiers hit the dragon's body with everything they had at hand, including swords, spears, and clubs. Bless us all with the ice battle armor, Luke shouted loudly, throwing his head back. His strong body and the bodies of the soldiers were instantly covered with ice armor, which was in the form of a ball of thick ice. An incredible ice magic barrier was created for all the soldiers, preventing any magic power from passing through. The silhouette of a flying lion appeared in the sky, on which the magician's archer stood, trying to take aim. The battle came so close to the magician that the warriors began to fly over his head. He was forced to fight back with his spear. Are you all tired of living? The furious magician shouted to all the warriors. He was shocked to see them all fighting. But at that moment, sharp arrows suddenly flew past his head. The village was on fire. Some houses had already burned to the foundations, and Captain Hillman was in deep shock. Roger and other soldiers rushed to him. They did not know what to do. Hillman gave them an order to inform the Lord that they could not stay here. I think we should evacuate all the people of Wushan immediately, because there will be many deaths, Hillman exclaimed. We can't stop this battle. We can rebuild the destroyed houses, but we can't bring back the dead people, said the captain. Is there no other way out but to evacuate? asked Hillman the soldiers. The soldiers asked Captain Hillman if there was any other option but to evacuate the villagers. They all thought that this was absolutely stupid. The captain was silent, his hands were shaking, and the soldiers saw this and ran to the old lord with all their might. Meanwhile, the three teenagers ran as fast as they could through the narrow streets of Wushan to meet the strange sound. They were terribly curious about what was happening there, and none of them felt fear at that moment. If we are late, we will miss Hillman defeating the magic beast, said one of them. The other boy replied that the strongest magic beast was only of the fourth rank, and even if a fifth rank beast appeared, it would be no match for him. The teenagers were running down the street and a crowd of people was running toward them, wearing whatever they could, crying and screaming. The children did not understand what was happening. Linley ran and thought about the magical animals, not noticing the crowd of people he encountered. Until one man shouted to him, Why are they running there? It's too dangerous and there's a fierce battle going on. Luojue quickly ordered everyone to flee, because there will be insurmountable consequences for them. The stranger continued to shout at them. The teenagers finally stopped at the outskirts of the village, and after catching their breath, they looked at each other all of them hearing the scary sounds. And then Lenly began to see some strange and unusual flashes in the forest. The children shouted that it must be a cruel, magical beast and they had to see it, and they ran fearlessly into the forest. The patrolling soldiers shouted to the boy that Master Lee should not go there. But the children asked the patrolling soldiers that they really wanted to see the dragon. Their conversation was interrupted by a terrible explosion. The flames of fire rose high into the sky and a fierce blast wave hit the bodies of the children and the patrolling soldiers. Lenly covered his face with his hands in surprise from the intense fire and shock wave. His body was covered in heat and dust. The patrolling soldiers shouted to them that the place was too dangerous for them as well. Lenly shouted, What kind of magical beast is this? And again there was a terrible explosion. It was stronger than the previous one. And the patrolmen and teenagers began to run away as fast as they could. It's a seventh-ranked magical beast, a velociraptor. And it's controlled by a magician, Lori shouted to them. It's coming again. Everyone take cover, he shouted again, and everyone started running to find somewhere to hide. As they all ran, they saw the body of one of the strangers, lying unnaturally with his arms outstretched and not moving. 
The teenagers saw this and began to scream in terror throughout the forest. Lori ran over and saw that it was one of the mercenaries who had come with him, and he was lying dead. At that moment, Captain Hillman ran up to them and started yelling at them to get out of here immediately. Hillman was yelling for everyone to be careful because another huge fireball was coming at them. But unfortunately, the ball came too close to them, exploding on impact into small pieces of fire that caused a blast wave. The captain announced to everyone that the mercenaries would most likely not last long, so they had to evacuate quickly. The forest behind them began to burn more and more. The wind that came out of nowhere was insidiously fanning the fire. I told you. The magician was shouting in defiance as if he had gone mad, that no one could match him a high-class wizard. The battle turned into a fiery massacre. A dragon, warrior's fire, screams of the villagers, blood, and the endless sounds of clanging weapons. The corpse of another warrior was lying on the ground. It was Lou Isa. The magician shouted to everyone that today everyone would be like Lou. And then Lenly finally saw for the first time in his life the Velociraptor, which was impressive in its gigantic size. One of the mercenaries rushed at him with a sword, and in response the Velociraptor launched a strong column of fire. The guy fell down from surprise, but it was good that he remained alive and unharmed. One of the mercenaries shouted that they should try to extinguish the dragon with a water geyser. The other mercenaries tried to slay the dragon with their swords going behind its spiked back, so that it would not notice them. And then the magician shouted for everyone to look at him and learn what eighth-rank magic looks like. He shouted the spell Dance of the Fire Snakes, and began to draw with his staff fire eights that really looked like snakes. Ugh, what a nasty spell he just said, Dellen thought. She was also there, hovering nearby in the air, watching this furious battle with great interest. All over the sky, the wizard was launching fiery circles and figure eights that looked like fiery fantasy dragons. And then Luke realized that it was an eighth-ranked spell and ordered everyone to flee. His girls shouted that the water geyser was also destroyed. The magician laughed, saying that it was too late and that everyone should accept their death. The terrible fire he launched engulfed the bodies of the mercenary girls. The girls began to burn in terrible agony and screaming. The picture was horrific. No one expected it. Then the fire spread from them to other mercenaries. One of them tried his best to shoot an arrow at the magician's head to stop him somehow. It was the archer who had appeared earlier with the flying lion. But it was all in vain. The arrow also burned. Luke shouted with a sword swing that he could not defeat an eighth-ranked magician, but he risked his duchy and still tried to cut the magician once. But the mage shouted as he entered the fight that Luke was the last of his team of seven. The magician continued to yell that Luke would not have enough strength, but he whispered to him that the magician was still a big asshole, and a barrel of fire from the magician flew into his body. The force of the blow was so great that the unfortunate boy was thrown several hundred meters straight into the forest. With the last of his strength, Luke climbed onto a lion that flew up to him and began to move away from the magician. Do you still have the strength to escape? The magician shouted after him, and he launched an unusual spell after him with his staff. Element of electricity, thunderstorm. Captain Hillman was amazed to see that this wizard was also a dual element wizard. The power of magical electricity struck Luke's body, and he fell from the lion to the ground. The magician was laughing all over the neighborhood. Hillman, gritting his teeth, continued to watch this irrepressible and vile wizard in silence. Lindley asked Uncle Seer Man who these unusual two-style magicians were. He readily replied that there were no more than two magicians in the kingdom who were stronger than this. If he wanted to, he could destroy this city in one go, and in that case everyone would prepare to die. Dellen mockingly thought that this was only the eighth rank. She hung in the air and watched all the warriors standing there in despair as well as little Lenly. Dillian couldn't calm down. How could this boy wake her up? Maybe the secret was in his blood. The girl looked at the frightened children in the crowd, and for some reason she felt funny. Dillian quietly muttered that such magic was only good for barbecuing, not killing people, not even power. Putting her hand out and focusing, Dillian began to form magic. Suddenly she shouted the spell, Giant Meteorite Drop. It was a ninth-rank magic. A small stone flew past her very quickly. 
Lenly, who was busy watching the battle, felt something strange fall on his head. The meteorite stone that Delon had launched fell on him and rolled to the ground. Oofed, Delon snorted in displeasure and mockery. At that time, the mage holding the diamond in his hand was giggling angrily that he had finally gotten the dark DeBarro diamond even though it had been ten years. He stood over Luke's body and twirled the mysterious diamond in his hands. The magician inserted the diamond into the handle of his staff and proclaimed that it was extremely beautiful. Calming down, he turned to the crowd and asked who was in charge and to come out to him. Captain Hillman bravely answered the magician that he was the most important warrior and boldly stepped out of the crowd. When the magician saw him, he cried out hysterically, saying that Hillman was a low-ranking warrior and that this battle had caused a lot of destruction to the people of Wushan, but only a couple of houses. And then a brilliant idea came to the magician's mind. He pretended that, in his opinion, the mercenaries were naive but strong, but apparently they had a lot of money with them. He then suggested that Hillman count the money, take it for himself, and consider the damage paid. Hillman did not understand anything, and mumbled what the magician wanted to say. But then, unexpectedly for everyone, the captain continued that he was very grateful to his highness for the kindness of the whole village of Wushan. The magician laughed evilly, jumped up on his dragon, and said that only gold coins melted from the fire. He sat on it and flew away. Roger asked Hillman if he could search the bodies, even though there was probably not enough money to rebuild the village but the captain flatly forbade him to do so. Finally, this whole nightmare is over, and this stupid magician is gone, the captain thought. He ordered the soldiers to bury the mercenaries with all their wealth, and according to the appropriate rules. And then one of the soldiers asked what we were going to do, because many residents were left without homes. Suddenly, everyone heard people thanking Nog. Lenly and Captain Hillman turned around and saw him as well. Nog told them to remove the tattoos, and that Ta Luke's family would rebuild everything at their own expense. He asked Hillman what kind of beast it was. He began to tell him that it was a velociraptor, and when he saw it, his legs shook, and if this magician wanted to destroy the village, they would not be able to resist him. But Nog was still very happy that no one was hurt, and sincerely thanked Hillman. But the captain was embarrassed and quietly replied that it was his duty, and he was very sorry that now he would have to pay for the new construction. Nog looked at his son and asked if he was hurt. He was silent and did not answer. But the man could not calm down, because he believed that he had to take responsibility for failing to protect all his subjects. Lenly thought that if he had been a dragon blood warrior, he would have been able to protect everyone and defeat the enemy. The boy remembered that the ritual to test his blood with a needle was still interrupted, but his father stood silently with his head bowed and thinking about something. Lenly was also upset. He thought that nothing had worked. Just like his father thought, he was useless and he would never become a dragon blood warrior. But Nog stroked the boy's head and asked him not to be upset, because no one had this blood in the last thousand years. But he said with hope in his eyes that the day would come when their clan would regain its glory. His father continued to reassure him, saying that if he failed and his younger brother did not succeed, there would be future generations. He sent everyone to rest after a very scary and intense day. The little boy asked him if he could become a wizard if he failed to become a warrior. The father looked at him in surprise, and Delon was also very surprised, sitting in the air and watching Lenly. Dylan thought again. Maybe Lenly summoned me because he wants to become a wizard. If it were that easy, there would be wizards everywhere. She laughed as she said it out loud. Dylan continued to hover in the air above the boy and his father and watch them. She was so curious. Holding hands, the father and son walked slowly toward their home. Dylan's mind was racing, wondering if her body was absorbing the rest of the magic power or not. In the darkness, sitting on his dragon, the magician looked at his diamond. He wanted to use it to create a new staff. And then his dream would finally come true. He would become the master of the universe. Suddenly, he heard a strange rustling in the bushes, someone mysteriously approaching him. The magician saw someone's strange feet coming toward him. He screamed in fright into the darkness. Who is it? And how dare a stranger approach him and talk to him? And he launched the magic of fire. The stranger finally told him that the magician was indeed very strong. 
as befitted an eighth-ranked wizard, and even after a victory, he never relaxed. The wizard lost his temper and launched the spell Tornado of Heavenly Fire at the stranger. The fire completely enveloped the stranger's body. The magician began to launch streams of fire with his staff again. He could not calm down, but kept releasing the fire again and again. Dylan was hanging in the air and kept thinking about how to make the boy become a magician, and she saw that this was his most cherished dream. She was very impressed with this boy. When morning came, Lenley's younger brother Horton came running to wake up his beloved older brother. He jumped on his sleeping brother with a scream and demanded that he wake up and come to breakfast with him. Lenley was sleeping very soundly. The little boy jumped on him and rolled off laughing. After a while, Lenley could barely open his eyes. He was so tired the night before. He got dressed and quickly made his bed with Horton. Sleepy, he went down to the kitchen where his father was waiting for him, and the three of them sat down to breakfast. Lenley told him that he had a strange dream, but for some reason his father cut him off. After five minutes, Nog finally asked his son what he had dreamed. Horton woke me up and I forgot everything, Lindley told him sadly. But then he remembered and shouted out loud that he had dreamed of a way to become a wizard. His father warmly asked him if he was serious about becoming a wizard. Horton loudly told everyone that it was all thanks to him and laughed. Lenley decided to ask his father how he could really become a wizard. Nog told him that every year, during the warrior recruitment season, or rather in the fall, the city of Fung Lai recruits wizards. There were wizards in the history of their clan of dragonblood warriors, but there were only two of them. But you have to remember, to become a wizard you need great talent. Out of ten thousand people, only one will be a wizard. His father said once again that if he really wanted to become a wizard, he would have to wait until the fall. Deline heard all this. A new day came, and the sun rose high, brightly gilding the roofs of the Lenly house. Dumog stood in his yard and continued to tell him that mages were sought for their talent. The boy asked him who was the stronger mage or warrior. They are both on the same level, but who must be stronger, the father explained. Lenly took a hammer and started carving the sculpture. He thought he only had six months left. Nog continued that, more importantly, the positions of mages are higher than that of warriors. For example, the position of an early eighth-rank two-elemental mage, even a ninth-rank warrior, will be much lower. Lindley asked him if their strength was so much higher, why the difference in position was so great. His father continued to explain that mages are divided into nine ranks. The first and second ranks are beginners. The third and fourth ranks are advanced mages. The fifth and sixth ranks are advanced. And the seventh and eighth ranks are also advanced. There are saints whose power is higher than that of the ninth rank. The boy listened to all of this with wide eyes and was greatly impressed. If it's a dragonborn warrior, his sword can kill a hundred warriors. When they meet an army of millions, the most they can do is kill the commander. But one forbidden spell from a mage can destroy an entire city. And the worst is a Saint Lavelle mage. Rank 9 and 8 mages are extraordinary in combat, which is why the position of a mage is so very high. The chance of a person becoming a mage's apprentice is 1 in 10,000, so don't expect much, Nog said. Lindley sat and silently carved and thought about his small chances. Dylan also listened attentively to the story, thinking constantly. Lindley was disturbed from his gloomy thoughts by his younger brother Horton, who shouted that he had finished making the sculpture. But everyone heard how Roger began to urgently gather the army and line it up. He lined everyone up and checked everyone's weapons. Captain Hillman was standing there watching the formation with attention and concentration. He made a sharp remark that everyone was crouching, and it didn't look like a line. Someone in the crowd asked if the captain would teach them. Hillman replied that the training time would not be short. The future warriors were excited to deal with magical beasts and learn new skills. Hillman announced to everyone that today they would all be hunting magic beasts. He also explained to everyone that this time the hunt would be dangerous, so not everyone would be able to take part in it, but only those who had the skills. The rest of us just stayed to practice, and everyone who understood went to pack. Uncle Sheeny Man whispered Lenly. He went on to say that you should never say in front of the strong that you can defend your house, because it may happen that you cannot save your own skin. Thus, 
it was decided to make the training more difficult so that everyone would learn to fight faster. Lenly asked to go to the beasts with the others to get stronger. The captain smiled and agreed, warning him that he might get injured. They went in the afternoon. Lenly thought to himself that he had to get stronger as soon as possible, so that his father wouldn't have to fight all the time alone. He made his way through the bushes and trees of the forest with his squad of volunteer warriors. Delen kept watching him and thought it was good that he decided to take part in the training. But he should find a companion. Suddenly a wild boar jumped out from behind a tree, and Lenly screamed out loud in fright. Delen smiled when she saw this action. The boy ran and waved his toy sword as he ran, imagining how he would fight the magical beasts. For some reason Delen remembered her last battle, which was too hard for her. She remembered how she had been hit by fire, and her body was burning painfully. Delen realized that the Earth Ring had protected her soul, but unfortunately not her body. During that magical battle, her soul had suffered greatly, which was why she had been asleep for so long until now. She remembered how many years later, when Lenly was a little boy, she got in touch with his consciousness, in which he called her a little fairy. And she whispered softly that it was not easy to absorb a little magic from the fire snake dance. Her thoughts were tearing her up. She thought she had become a spiritual object and she didn't want to. She had no power at all, so she had to meditate and gather some magical power. But the hardest part was that she couldn't move far from the ring. Meanwhile, Lenly was thinking that the path of a magician is not as easy as he thought. And then the boy couldn't help but shout out that he had to find the gift that Uncle Sini Man had hidden in the forest. Only then could he pass the test. Lenly began to wonder where he could hide it in such a large forest. After thinking about it, Delen decided to help the boy no matter what. The boy said out loud that the test was to train his fighting skills, so maybe the gift was somewhere near the animals. When Delen heard this, she was skeptical, thinking that he was either going to defeat them or become their food. Suddenly, Captain Hillman came out to the boy. Delen instantly realized that the boy was under the protection of humans, so everything would be fine. Hillman decided to go along with the youngest participant just in case. Lenly behaved like a real warrior, listening and looking closely at all the sounds in the forest. And then suddenly a hare jumped out of the grass and Lenly was childishly frightened. But after the hare, the boy and Captain Hillman heard a terrible unknown roar nearby. In the darkness, Lenly saw large green eyes glowing with light. A magical beast of the third rank jumped out at the boy. It was a wind wolf. The beast was three times the size of the boy, had huge claws and sharp canines. Dylan immediately shouted to Lenly to be careful, but no one heard her. The boy was very frightened by the surprise of what he saw and screamed. The wolf opened its terrible mouth and screamed at the boy, and the wind blew the boy several meters away. Dylan nervously thought that this was some kind of curse, and why did it have to happen now? She was forced to say the spell Earth Elemental Magic, Destroying Earth and launched her magic towards the boy. The ground beneath the wolf became as viscous as a swamp, and he sank into it with all his might. The wolf howled in pain and helplessness. He couldn't move a single paw. His body didn't obey as if something was holding him down. Dylan thought hysterically that she would not be able to hold the wolf back for long with her weak strength, and that the boy had to run away. But Lenly turned around and pulled his sword from its sheath and decided to fight. Dallin looked at this picture in amazement. She shouted again that the boy shouldn't do this and that he was not an opponent for this beast. But no one heard her again. The boy boldly approached the wolf's paws, which for some reason glowed with blue light. He grabbed his wooden sword and fearlessly struck at the beast's paw. Lindley was overcome with animal fear and finally realized that he was alone with the wolf. The boy could not understand why he could not move either, and he realized that in the eyes of the wolf he was just prey, not an enemy. Gathering all his childhood strength, Lenly decided to finally run away. It was absolutely pointless to fight the wolf because the forces were not equal. He ran as fast as ever, sweat streaming down his back, the wind whistling in his ears, his heart beating out of his chest. The boy skillfully jumped over all the puddles and pits, Delan guiding him from the air like a guardian angel. She mentally shouted nervously for the boy to run as fast as possible. Lenly ran 300 meters in 10 seconds, overcoming all obstacles. His eyes were big in fear. 
Duleen thought it was strange that the man who was guarding Lenly had disappeared. Hillman stood in a forest clearing, surrounded by wolves as big as the one that had been with Lenly. He mentally cursed. The captain quickly picked up his spear and began to circle the perimeter, thinking that he had planned everything from the beginning. He was slowly following the kid, but the appearance of wolves was not part of his plans. Hillman was in complete despair. He was very worried that the child must be in great danger now. And the battle began. Hillman was cutting down the wolves with his spear, hitting them on the backs. The wolves howled from the pain of his spear and still aggressively rushed at him. They bit Hillman's arms and legs, and a real mess began. The captain began to spin in a circle, pointing his spear and cutting down all the animals along the trajectory. The only thought that was in his head was to finish them all off as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, Lenly ran like a deer, with unprecedented speed. He was followed by a wolf that had escaped from the magical land. Dellen flew quickly after the boy and wondered what would happen to her if he suddenly died. In her mind, she was encouraging the boy, and Lenly could not tear himself away from the wolf, who was constantly on his heels. But then he stopped abruptly and screamed in fright. There was a deep abyss under his feet, and the boy thought that it was a dead end, and that he was probably dead. He quickly looked to the other side of the abyss and saw some vines, and immediately decided that if he grabbed them, he could survive. Dellen was shocked. Would the boy dare to jump? It was only a few meters away. But he had no other choice. The wolf was already catching up with him. So the boy began to accelerate to jump over, but the girl was not sure of his actions. And then for some reason, Lenly heard a real puppy barking behind him. The wolf turned around and started running away in the other direction. The boy was frightened and couldn't understand what had happened to the magical beast. But it didn't matter. The main thing was that he had escaped. Lenly stared after him in amazement. Dylan stared at the scene in amazement, but she could understand the feeling. Lenly lay down on the grass to rest. This idiot was very lucky, she thought. Dylan stared at Lenly on the grass and became quite sure that it had some significance. Hillman had finished his terrible fight. The wolf carcasses were scattered all over the clearing. He looked very tired. He said out loud to himself that it was really hard for him to cope with it. But most of all, he was worried about where little Linley was. He had to find him immediately. We have to end this trial now. The situation was getting out of hand, the captain decided, and fired a flare into the sky. The soldiers of the squad saw the green light of the rocket and realized that it was over. The rocket rose high into the sky, illuminating everything around. Meanwhile, at the Baruch family's estate, Nog sat by the fireplace and quietly drank tea. The butler also saw the light of the rocket and reported that it must be the signal of the end of the test. The butler was excited because it meant that Lenly would be coming home soon, and he had to prepare a celebratory dinner. The cup fell out of Nog's hands, and he realized that something was wrong if it was over so soon. He went outside and looked up at the sky and realized that the problem was no small one. Lenly looked at the sky and his expression kept changing. Even if it was only a third-ranked wind wolf, all I could do was run away, he thought. Just then, Lenly and Dellen started looking at the same spot in the sky. It's here, she thought. A huge black dragon was flying above them. Lenly shouted out in astonishment. What kind of beast is that? Everyone in the forest, including hunters and warriors, saw the black dragon. There was a commotion. Lenly assumed that the wolf had escaped because of this black dragon. They both stood there, dumbfounded and could not believe their eyes. And then the figure of an unknown magician in a green cloak with a huge sword appeared in the sky. The dragon called him Dylan and asked him, Why are you so stubborn? He replied that he had come to test how strong you were. The vile lizard shouted that even though Dylan was a holy magician, he was not afraid of him. Dylan offered to test him to see how long he could hold out, so he shouted the spell Battle Aura and pointed his sword at the dragon, and a green glow was emitted. In Earth Element, Stone Rain was the next spell he cast and stones fell from the sky. Deftly swinging his sword between the stones, Dylan began to attack the dragon with determination. As the stones fell to the ground with all their might, Lenly began to run, dodging them. While the boy was running, having all the chances to be crushed, 
Dylan could not understand why the Earth Spellcaster was here now. The stones were getting bigger and bigger, and the boy was already jumping over them. Lenly was very worried about his father. He realized that even if the dragon was just moving, every move it made would be a complete destruction. The power of the magicians was really scary. The rockfall continued and gained momentum. Chunks of mountains were already flying around, and the village of Wushan was finally hit. The patrolmen shouted to the villagers that everyone should take shelter, and people ran to the shelters, which were built in the rocks, in whatever clothes they had on. Nog stood there upset. It was another holy mage. The butler reported that the residents had taken refuge and he had to hurry to the shelter as well. He was thinking about his son, and that as a member of the Baruch family, he should be able to defend himself. The butler could not calm down. He asked if he should send people to get the boy. Nog told him that Shini Man was watching the boy and he would be safe. The stones were already covering everything around him, and Lenly began to crawl over them. And then something heavy hit his legs and he fell. He was lying on the ground and did not understand what had happened. Looking down at his feet, Lenly screamed that he saw a squirtle. At his feet stood a small animal with ears gray in color, similar to a rabbit or a kitten. The little animal looked at Lenly with its huge eyes. He couldn't tell what kind of animal it was, but it looked most like a mouse. Lindley sat down with the animal and apologized for falling on it so recklessly, and the animal was furious. The animal began to sneeze loudly and funny from the ground and dust. He was cleaning his paws and tail from the dirt. Lindley watched him and thought that he must be going crazy if he was talking to mice. Suddenly the ground under his feet went down and the boy fell into a hole. Dylan also looked closely at the unknown animal and could understand what it was. The animal started screaming in fright. Squirtle! Squirtle! Looking at the falling boy. Linley kept falling, hitting the stones and the ground hard with his whole body. Then the animal took off and flew toward Lenley, calling out, Squirrel! Squirrel! The boy opened his eyes and saw that there were vines twining along the walls, and he intuitively managed to grab hold of them. A black dragon was circling above the gap and the boy looked at it and did not understand how to get out of there. Lindley clearly understood that he could not die here. He had to live for the sake of his father and little brother. Suddenly at his feet he saw a small animal that continued to squeal hysterically, Squirtle. The blood flowing from his temple began to drip onto the ring that was tied around his neck. Squirtle looked at the boy carefully, and even there it was clear that he liked him. Suddenly... The furry wonder began to push the boy to the surface of the abyss. Delon noticed that Lenly's blood began to activate the ring. Once again, everyone felt a fierce shock in a corresponding destructive wave. The holy mage had managed to split the Earth Protector stone monster in half with his magic. The impact sent tons of stones flying around and covered everything up again. Double smasher! Dylan shouted a spell at the Earth Defender. He waved his sword furiously and smashed everything around him. Did the mage on the dragon shout at the Earth Defender, or did he see that level of holy magic? It was impossible to deal with such aggression, and demanded that he give him something. Dylan gritted his teeth and began to growl. The Earth Protector told him that if he didn't get it, Dylan would never know. And just as the magician started to say something, he clutched at the dragon's mane, and then Dylan shouted the spell Dispel, and that now no one would get it. Dylan started to pull out his sword, saying that he was wounded, but he could still fight for his life. Suddenly, the holy wizard answered him that he could easily kill him, but his time had not yet come, and his dragon flapped its wings and began to rise. Linley muttered out loud in amazement that this was a saintly master, and how could he walk away so easily? And what about the giant? The dragon, together with the magician, rose very high into the sky, and slowly began to disappear from sight. The little fluffy animal jumped up to the defender of the earth. He noticed something. And then Delon noticed that the defender was still activated. The stone giant raised his hand and hit the animal with all his might. The animal flew down with a squeal in pain, hitting the stones. It was scary to look at him. He flew like a ball, painfully bouncing off everything on the road. Lenly watched with fear and decided that he had to do something, because he would kill him. He picked up the first rock he could find and threw it at the giant with all his might. The boy shouted after him that he was the protector of Wushan village, Lin Lei Baruch. Fight the giant with me. Duling roared that the boy had gone mad and was provoking the magic of a saint-level earth protector. 
Linley whispered to the beast to hide quickly, because it would be hot. And the boy began to jump acrobatically on the stone giant to make it angry, and to make it follow him. He jumped from one rock to another, and the earth protector began to chase him furiously. Dellen watched and could not understand what this restless child was up to, but at least he was not killed. He continued to lead the giant, and then an incredible thing happened. The giant roared into the crevice to which Lenly was leading, and the boy succeeded in his plan. Dellen could not understand why Lin Lei did not run away from the edge of the gorge. The boy was running and jumping over all the obstacles. Then suddenly he slipped and began to fall straight into the gap towards the monster. Dylan screamed in fear, but no one heard her. The boy was really flying straight into the monster's jaws. And then Lenly's body began to rise in an incredible way. Someone or something was pulling him up, and he saw Dellen in all her glory. She had finally materialized, and he could see her. The guy asked her in astonishment who she was. Dellen introduced herself in a reserved and formidable voice, saying that she was Daring Cowart, which was her full name. She was a saint-ranked grand mage from the Puentian Empire. Lindley stared at her in confusion. The girls shouted that the guy couldn't tell anything about her from her clothes or something. But Lindley didn't understand anything anymore. He asked her again if she was really from the Puente's empire. Dellen pompously replied that, yes, she was from the Puente Empire, the empire with the best magic on earth. After calming down a bit, the girl asked what year it was. 9,990, Lenly blurted out in amazement. The Puente Empire was founded 8,000 years ago and lasted for 3,000 years before being destroyed in a war for territory. That was 5,000 years ago, Lenly quoted his knowledge. Dellen freaked out and dropped her staff. She couldn't believe it was 9,990. Lenly started to get it and asked if she was really a magician and saved him with her magic, but the girl didn't listen to him. She mumbled in shock that she had been asleep for 5,000 years for fuck's sake. Thanks to your blood, I finally woke up after 5,000 years. Dellen did not calm down. And then she gloated and asked Lenly what he really thought about defeating the Holy Mage and saving his family. Because he was nothing against him. Then Dellen, with a serious face, began to broadcast that she was a great wizard who lived in a ring. And she asked him if he realized how dangerous it was. He was an earth elemental, an earth protector, using the energy of the earth to live. She wondered if Lenly realized how powerful magicians were, and if he still wanted to be a magician. Meanwhile, the stones continued to fall around. The girl explained to the boy that when she was wearing the ring he found, she heard everything and knew what the boy was thinking. And to confirm her words, she asked if Lenly wanted to help his father and resurrect his family because if he doesn't have dragon blood in him, he will never be able to become a mere magician. Lenly whispered back to her, asking how she knew all this. Dellen rolled her eyes in annoyance. The boy was under the impression that he didn't know anything. Then, with all the confidence he had, he shouted that he wanted to study magic. The girl jumped in surprise. I've never seen him like this, Dellen thought with satisfaction. Lenly began to beg her even louder, becoming a shout and finally fell to his knees in front of her. Dillon looked at his suffering and suggested that he take her test first and then see the results. Suddenly, she frantically said that she had changed her mind and did not want to teach the first person she met. She had a crazy and restless personality. Her mood changed every minute. Suddenly, she ordered the guy to kill the defender of the earth. She was a little out of it. He was surprised and told her that he could not stand up to the giant with his strength. The boy suddenly looked down at his feet and asked what was that. He raised his sword and felt a great power. Its compatibility with the earth element is amazing, Dellen thought and smiled. This is very average, Dellen said monotonously. Ten times the strength, that's wonderful. Ten times the spiritual power of an ordinary person, she thought. Dellen began to direct a pillar of liberation magic at the giant, and Lenly rushed at him with his sword. You can't rely on your strength alone. You have to let the light become a part of your body, and only then will magic and your body become one, she explained to the boy. The boy listened to her advice, concentrated, and merged fire and magic into one, turning his attention to his sword. Shouting the spell Earth Elemental Magic, he struck the ground with his sword. 
His joy knew no bounds. He jumped and shouted that he had just used real magic. Linley shouted, raising his sword above his head, that he had done it. Delin was smiling at him with satisfaction. She was glad that she had motivated the boy even more. Not so bad for a first time, she thought, looking at the boy and his strength. So daring coward, who had been sleeping for 5,000 years on the Yulan continent, woke up sealed in a dragon ring. She also became the master of the teenager, who awakened her with the help of his unusual blood, teenager and soul. And so begins the story of the master and the apprentice. Lin Lei made his first significant step in his life. Lin Li returned home and went to bed, and soon Delin appeared in his room. When he opened his eyes sleepily and saw Delin's silhouette, Lin Li screamed at the top of his lungs that he was seeing a ghost. This frightened the girl herself. Frightened, he fell out of bed, and then, after waking up a bit, he mumbled that he had forgotten the events of yesterday. Delin asked him in surprise why he was so screaming and surprised. The guy called her Grandma Delin and asked her not to show up in the middle of the night because he was scared. Delin barked that he should call her Granny then, and she almost burst into tears. They looked out the window together. It was a beautiful, quiet night. Looking at the boy, Delin asked why he was so confident. Because I recently defeated a giant, and I feel great, Lenly answered her happily. He asked the girl with hope in his voice if he had already become a strong magician. Dylan laughed and advised him not to be so overconfident, that it was she who activated his magic and power, and controlled it as well, and he was just waving his sword. I hope you felt and realized how strong she is, Dylan said. The boy frowned and asked her if she was telling the truth. Even Uncle Hillman, a sixth-ranked warrior, could not defeat the giant, but he used magic to do it. The boy proved to her. You're right. Even if a magician's body is as strong as a warrior's, when using different types of magic, their fighting power is much greater than that of warriors, Delin explained to him. The boy asked her how it happened that she was so strong and became a spirit. Delin snapped back at him and smacked him on the head with her staff, shouting at him not to be rude to her. She went on to explain to him that even if he had dragon blood, he would still not be the equal of a saint-ranked magician. If it wasn't for that sneak attack by another St. Lavelle warrior, Delane would not have had to use self-destruction, and she was one of the top five mages, but now she was just a soul in a ring. Delane was extremely upset. In a battle five thousand years ago, she had used a forbidden spell, and only her soul remained. But if Lenly hadn't found the ring, there's no telling how long she would have slept. Lenly stood there and turned the ring in his hands thoughtfully. Delin asked him if he really didn't understand what had happened earlier. But it didn't matter. She thought it was all because of his unusual blood. Lenly asked the girl if he could really learn magic and become a great magician. Delin promised him that she would fulfill her promise and teach him magic. She would become his personal teacher. Someone knocked on the door. Lenly wondered if it was Uncle Hillman. Delin thought the boy was still in shock. It was indeed Captain Hillman standing at the door asking if Lin Lei was awake and if he could come into the room. Len Li happily answered him. Delin hissed that he didn't think she might be seen, but Len Li didn't hear them anymore. He loved his uncle so much. Hillman opened the door and walked into the room. He began to explain himself awkwardly and told him that at first he was supposed to protect the boy by being nearby, but then a pack of wind wolves appeared and he was delayed, and then the black dragon appeared. He really wanted to know how the boy managed to get out. He was very happy that the boy had returned unharmed, so he was finally at peace. And only the boy was going to tell him everything. When Delin hissed that he had better not tell him about her, otherwise there could be unpredictable consequences. The boy stumbled, so he decided to lie a little and started telling him that when he was running away from the wind wolf, he fainted. And then he had a strange dream. And I woke up at home, he said. What kind of thing? What are you talking about? Delin asked in surprise. The captain listened to Lenly in amazement and decided that he needed to rest today and would come to him tomorrow. It's all because I couldn't protect you, Hillman added. And then Delin grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and flew out the window with him into the yard. The kid was shocked. If I had known you were invisible, I wouldn't have been so nervous, the shocked boy shouted. Delin sharply answered him that they were flying to the mountains now and would begin his training. 
As an earth elemental mage, she could teach him only if Lenly had enough brains to understand the essence of earth magic, and she suggested that they check it out, and they flew on. When they arrived at an empty clearing, Delon sat the boy down and told him to cross his legs and put his hands on them, to concentrate. She cracked him on the head with her staff and shouted again, Concentrate! Duling said Lin Lei has a penchant for earth magic, and he's quite talented. She had noticed it last time. You have to think about your connection to the earth. She ordered him to make a sign with his hands, and hold them until he concentrated. Dylan said with satisfaction that she was ready to teach Lin Lee magic, and the first lesson was the basics, and they started with meditation. But Lin Lee couldn't hear her. He couldn't understand what sign she was talking about with her hands. Dellen explained that he had to think of any hand sign that he would make all the time when using magic. The boy showed two fingers on each hand. Dellen said, what kind of sign is that? And he seems to be a bit crazy. She exhaled and told him to just put his fingers down. The guy sat cross-legged, closed his eyes, lowered his hands to the ground, and touched it one finger at a time. In your thoughts, become one with it. Try to meditate. Absorb its power into yourself. Dellen said to him. The boy was trying very hard, it was obvious, and suddenly the stones lying on the ground around him began to bounce. They were being pushed by some force. All the stones rose into the air to the level of his shoulders. Lenly did not open his eyes, and then a miracle happened. The stones began to spin in a circle around him. It was as if they were alive. There were more and more of them, and a bright glow could be seen through the boy's fingers. Dellen whispered that his first meditation had such an incredible effect. It looked like he was as strong as Deline had been when she was a child, and maybe even stronger. The girl was very impressed. I think our meeting was no coincidence, she thought. Or maybe it was even fated, she continued to think. Among the stones, a familiar furry animal was watching the boy. And then something twisted in his nose and the boy sneezed loudly. Dellen mockingly asked how he could sneeze while meditating. And in an instant, all the stones fell to the ground. Since you have learned the power of meditation, you must now meditate every day. The boy asked her how he could use the magic he had learned. There are many strong magic skills that you can master using the magic of the earth, Delene explained. Okay, Auntie Spirit, the child replied. Delen burst out laughing again and barked at him to call her sister. Early in the morning, Lenly walked into the kitchen. His father, younger brother, and the butler were all there eating breakfast, and he greeted them all. Horton jumped into his arms and shouted that Lenly was so cool because he had fought the Wind Wolf and the Black Dragon, and he only had scratches. He asked Lenly to tell him what happened. Nog said to his son, Yesterday's hunt was a bit of a challenge, but your actions weren't so bad. If you are well, sit down with us for breakfast. I've never been praised by my father before, thought Lenly. Then Lenly saw D-Line and she sat down quietly and whispered that no one would see her anyway. She quietly asked the boy what was wrong with a father worrying about his son. Even if I go crazy, no one will see me, she laughed. Deline started jumping around the kitchen, and for some reason Nog looked in her direction. Dylan asked if Nog had noticed her, but he was surprised and reminded her that she had said that no one else would see her. Dylan explained to him that only people who are on the same spiritual level as her can find her. Because Lenly is the owner of the dragon's coiling ring, they have a spiritual connection. But that doesn't mean that no one can see Delen. The kid couldn't understand what that meant. Delen explained that only people on the level of a saint could sense her. She added that if it was inside the ring, even a saint mage wouldn't be able to see it. But she suddenly stopped talking. Looking at Noga once again, she said that it was impossible for his father to be a saint. He had no aura at all. He had barely saved their family business, so it was impossible for him to be a saint. Father, the boy said quietly looking at him. Nog calmly told him to stop flying in the clouds and finish eating. It must be an illusion, the boy thought to himself. His younger brother asked him to eat breakfast with him. Outside, the warriors began training led by Hillman. Lenly trained at night with Delen, where he honed his earth magic. And during the day, he trained with Captain Hillman where they learned martial arts. At night with Dalian, he would again lift piles of stones in a state of meditation. She controlled the whole process, 
The ground trembled during their magical training and shone. The stones flew around Linley in perfect circles, and there were several of them. He concentrated and progressed every training day. After a while, during one of the training sessions, Dellen told the boy to try to hit a stone and pointed to a huge rock. And Lenley concentrated and used his arm strength to smash the rock into gravel. Wow, not bad, your power of destruction has improved, she commented. The boy continued to lift huge rocks in the air and smash them. Dellen said that he would need to improve his accuracy. But overall, Lenley had mastered this type of magic. She was happy for him. Lenley was also happy with these results. Lenley clenched his fists and decided to enter the magic academy for his father's sake. Time is flying very fast. There is only a month left before the enrollment of students at the magic academy, Dellen reminded him. The professors at the academy won't care what family Lenley comes from. Even the fact that she is teaching him is not a guarantee that Lenley will be able to easily enter the magic academy, even if he beats his head against the wall. She continued that training mages is much more difficult than training warriors. Money, teachers, training. Lenley has to have it all. But with a teacher like her and the knowledge and skills she had acquired, Delan was sure that it would be enough to get into the academy. But the boy mumbled that he doubted it very much. Dylan couldn't calm down because she would need to buy more artifacts, equipment, and it all costs a lot of money. Denley asked her in shock that the skills and spells would not be enough for magic. He was starting to get frustrated. But Deline couldn't stop her speech and continued that if he didn't have enough money, his development would be very long. Lindley listened attentively in silence and thought that now the Baruch name was in its decline. His father had to sell his family heirlooms to make a living. He did not understand where he could get the money for all this. And then he had a brilliant idea. What if he could repair the magical beast and as long as it had magic power, it could fight instead of Lenly? Its fighting power must be enormous. Dealing heard this and shouted, Does he think that a magic beast will fall from the sky and obey him? She explained once again that first, Lenly would need to make a contract with the dragon, and if it was a velociraptor, he would need 10,000 gold coins for it. Lenly exclaimed that 10,000 was a cosmic sum. But the girl summarized that it was true. A real magician must also be rich. Alas, Lenly could not understand and asked what kind of animal would want to sign a contract with him. She explained that a magical animal could sign a contract with him. The boy almost started to cry, explaining that he didn't have a single gold coin and couldn't become a magician. Dellen was thinking when she noticed a glowing trail, the footprints of the little beast, she said. The tracks led to Lenly's house. Dylan quietly followed the little animal. He ran over the ruins. Dylan called out loudly to the boy and asked him if he remembered the little animal from the forest crevice. The animal, not hearing them, shouted, Squirtle, and jumped inside the house through a huge hole. He began to look around and scratch at something with his paws. Dylan and Lindley watched him quietly, and the animal continued to dig actively. He dug more and more aggressively, throwing stones and earth around. And then everyone saw a big, gorgeous diamond. The animal began to squeak loudly with pleasure. It's the shadow diamond that that magician had, Delin shouted. She ordered Lin Lei to grab the magic beast as soon as possible. The boy could not believe that this was a real magic beast. Meanwhile, the animal happily grabbed the diamond with its paws and hugged it. At that moment, Lin Lei reached out to grab it. The animal aggressively started screaming and throwing himself at him. But the boy grabbed him by the tail and started pulling him toward him. At that moment, the animal bit the boy's finger painfully, but it escaped from his hands. After catching it, the boy said that it looked very much like an ordinary mouse, but bigger. Dylan remembered that there are two types of mice. One of them are stone eaters, and they usually go in groups. The first type, the shadow mice, are magical beasts of the third rank, very fast and painful to fight. The second kind of mice, the stone eaters, have a very sharp sense of smell. Looking at its size, it is a shadow mouse. He is a lower-ranked magical beast, but if he allows him to make a contract with him, he will become his magical beast. The mouse was freaking out. Lenly restrained it with a magic ring. He had a better idea. Dalen thought, what if we could scare him with magic and make him sign a contract? 
She suggested becoming a demon so that the mouse could sense her. And the girl turned into a big demonic shadow that shouted at the mouse that it was she who had stolen the crystal, and that she would pay for it. The mouse was scared. Dellen screamed that it could not escape. Lenly asked if this would really help him get the contract. Dellen giggled and said to calm down, because shadow mice are not that brave. She turned to the mouse and screamed at him to sign the contract with Lenly. The mouse started to get nervous and glowed not realizing where it was being attacked from, and having managed to create a circle of fire, it escaped. It's an unusual shadow mouth, Dellen shouted. The mouse jumped all over the room, bouncing its body against all the walls at a frantic speed. Dellen shouted to Lin Lei, find a net somewhere because we have to catch it. But Lin Lei found another way out of the situation. He brought a fried chicken leg from somewhere. He began to wave it in front of the animal and asked him to eat it. The roasted leg, thought the hungry little animal, not taking his eyes off it. Lenly smiled and said gently that no one would hurt him. Dellen was screaming her head off because she had asked for a net, and Lenly had kept the chicken leg and was feeding it. Meanwhile, the animal was chewing on the leg with gusto and purring contentedly. Lenly began to stroke it on the head. Dellen mumbled in amazement that the animal was even letting himself be petted. She thought that she had spent all her energy to capture and subdue the animal but she didn't think it would ignore it so easily. But Lin Lei brought a chicken leg and stroked it, which is not something magical beasts usually allow. Lin Lei turned to the animal and told him that this diamond was his find and belonged to him, and that his name was Lin Lei Baruch, and this was his family's ancestral hall, so he could come here whenever he wanted. But then something strange began to happen. The animal bit the boy's finger again. Lin Lei screamed he did not understand why. A beast will always be a beast, Dellen said, but wait, is this a contract? She looked at the two of them in shock. Lenly's finger and the beast's foot joined together. Dellen explained that when an equal contract is made, you become closer to the magical beast. It can perform any task for you so they will have a strong bond. The boy asked what kind of contract it was. He could not understand its meaning. She went on to explain that when a magical animal is born, it has the opportunity to enter into an equal contract, but the animal can only enter into it once in its life. When a person breaks the contract, the animal can still enter into it with another. But in order for an animal to make a contract, it must trust Lenly and consider him its family and not want to leave you. Only then can the contract be concluded. They connected the finger and the paw again. Now the contract was considered concluded. The contract of two identical creatures. Now they would fight together. The contract is made, whispered Lenly. The mouse squeaked out, Bay, Bay, Bay. The boy asked Dellen if she could talk. The girl explained that it was a young mouse and that it did not speak properly yet, so it was just talking nonsense. Lenly happily shouted that it was his personal magic animal, a mouse. The mouse was still chewing on its leg and looking at him with its big eyes, but it was calm now. The mouse climbed up on his shoulder and made itself comfortable. Now that he was the owner of Baby, his next step was to take the test to the Magic Academy. I'll call you Baby and I'll talk to you more often, Lenly promised the mouse. Dellen remembered that anyone who studies magic dreams of becoming a student at a Magic Academy. If a magician didn't study there, he or she was no higher than the third rank. They decided to go to the Academy, and after a while they entered the city and saw a grand building with incredible architecture. It was a Magic Academy. Magicians were flying down from the sky to attend it. It was the largest kingdom of the Holy Alliance, the kingdom of Feng Lai, and the headquarters of the Shining Church, the city of Feng Lai. All the students who wanted to study at the academy came here. It was a rich city with beautiful houses, developed infrastructure, and happy people. Lenli saw Uncle Hillman and told him that this city was richer than Wushan. The man smiled at him and said he was sure Lenly would pass the test. He stuttered and continued confused, saying that it was a bit unexpected, but that the boy should listen to him. Dellen whispered in the boy's ear to watch his tongue. Hillman patiently explained to him that there had once been a dragon-blooded warrior in the Baruch family, but he did not show any magical talents. Therefore, even if Lenly did not pass the test, it would not mean anything. Lenly confidently asked Hillman not to worry about him. He was sure of his success. 
But Dellen could not stand it and concluded that it was impossible not to pass because she was his teacher. Hillman recalled that when he came to Baruch's house and didn't find Lenly, his father told him that the boy had gone to the academy, and he was furious. He shouted to Nog that if the child did not pass the test, it would affect his confidence in his abilities, and he would be mentally traumatized. Nog calmly told him that his son was not as weak as he thought. Hillman looked at Lenly and said that he still couldn't believe that Nog was right. They approached the magic training grounds of Feng Lai City, where hundreds of eager applicants had gathered. Lenly looked at the people and everything around him with delight. One of the teachers at the academy was yelling at one of the applicants that he was a failure. The boy was crying and screaming, proving that he had just touched the crystal, but he couldn't understand how the magician could tell that he had failed. The teacher began to shout at him that his mind power was only slightly stronger than that of an ordinary person, and he did not have the basic qualities to become a magician. He advised him not to spend the money because the boy's shockwave of elemental magic was too weak. The teacher continued to reprimand the boy, saying that he really thought that anyone could become a magician. But his elemental aptitude was very low, and there was no point in taking the test. The crowd of applicants listened to this conversation in fright and whispered that no one would probably pass. Dillin was also watching and couldn't understand why these methods were so old-fashioned. Her thoughts were interrupted by Lenly, who asked her to explain how the test worked. She began to say in a serious voice, This is the elemental aptitude test. It measures the power of the mind, and then the elemental aptitude. Usually, if the power of the mind is eight times higher than that of an ordinary person, then such a candidate has a good chance of becoming a magician. But this is a magic academy, so Lenly's mind must be at least ten times stronger. The boy began to doubt his abilities and asked what was in his head. Dellen reassured him because in the last test, Lenly was twenty times stronger. That's why this test is a must. Hillman called the animal to his shoulder, and the animal feeling his kind heart went without question. Lenly explained to him that he could not take him with him to the test, because these are the rules. And he began to push through the crowd of applicants to the arena where the examiner was standing. Upon entering the arena, Lenly bent down and greeted the examiner. The examiner turned to him menacingly and ordered him to say hello. The boy said that he was Lin Lei, twelve years old, and came from Feng Lai Kingdom, Wushan Village. The man wrote this information down in a notebook. The examiner ordered Lin Li to put his hand on the crystal to check everything. Lin Li put his hand on the crystal and thought, What if Delin's test is wrong? In an instant, the crystal glowed and a circle of fire lit up around it. The magicians around the stage began to watch the boy with interest. The examiner smiled and decided to see what the boy was made of, and cast the spell Elemental Predisposition. And then the wizards were alarmed. One by one, they began to shout out the results, Earth Element, Perfect Aptitude, Wind Element, Perfect Aptitude, Fire Element, Average Aptitude. Lenly was shocked. The crowd gasped. Hillman, Dellen, and the Beastie were also astonished. Do perfect dispositions, it looks like we have found a valuable specimen, said the examiner. Lindley couldn't believe his ears, his eyes, and the results, especially the wind element. Oh, I see, I completely forgot, Dellen shouted something incomprehensible. But she explained that she was tested for the earth element. In that case, she asked Lindley what element he would be studying, but then the examiner ordered the boy to enter the magic circle where they would test the power of his mind. Lenly entered the circle and suddenly something began to press on his back. Lenly whispered to Dellen, What is it? It's a very strong magic that will put pressure on your body to see how much you can take, she answered. It was very hard for Lenly. The examiner announced that everyone would hope that the boy was at least ten times stronger. And then Lenly decided to try to concentrate on meditation to make it easier. He spread his arms and legs and closed his eyes. The examiner was surprised to ask everyone if the guy was meditating or dreaming. Lindley uses the meditation technique he learned with Lenly to absorb the power of magic and weaken it. Even she knew it was possible. One of the magicians asked him if it had been twenty minutes and if he could continue. And the boy continued to stand patiently. And then the magicians became alarmed and began to whisper among themselves, how could this happen? 
the situation had changed. Lindley fell down and knelt on his knees. The examiner shouted that he could not believe that the boy, and stumbled. He turned to the boy and explained that he had used meditation to pass the magic pressure test. But he should have fallen, and no one had ever done that before. Captain Hillman could not bear to ask what this meant. He could not understand what had happened. My boy, you have passed the exam. As a representative of the Magical Academy, I invite you to study with us, the examiner said to everyone. Hillman shouted joyfully that this was great. The animal also squeaked with joy. The boy jumped for joy, constantly shouting the words Magic Academy. When the cheering subsided, the examiner sternly told Lenley that he was done with the test and that he should go check in and not disturb others. The boy danced with joy that he could now study at the Magic Academy. Captain Hillman and the animal danced with him. Hillman asked Lin Lei to hurry up and register, and he would run to his father to tell him the good news. Lin Lei took Bebe with him and rushed to register. His dream came true. The exam was still going on in the square, and there were a lot of people. Lin Lei ran up to the registration desk, but it was completely overwhelmed with suitcases and other junk. But he expected to see a completely different picture. And then he heard someone's disgruntled voice asking who had brought all those suitcases. Some old man came up to him and started attacking him, demanding to take all this stuff. For some reason he thought it was Lenley's stuff. The boy sharply told him that it was not his stuff. A guy came up to the counter and said that calling his things trash and junk was disrespectful to him. It was Yale, the son of one of the biggest businessmen in Yulan. He understood his grandfather's remark that if he didn't respect things enough, he would never become a great businessman. But the old man was very angry and demanded that he put his clothes away. He shouted that this was a school of magic, not business. But the boy calmly replied that his things would be taken care of and good-naturedly told Lenley that they were now classmates. The guy said he knew his name was Lin Lei and that his performance on the test was outstanding. Then he turned his eyes to his suitcases and explained that because of the inconvenience of traveling, he had only brought the most necessary things with him. Lindley asked him why he needed so many things, but he laughed and explained that it wasn't much. He opened one of the suitcases and proudly said, This is a tea set. Lindley rounded his eyes. The next suitcase was his personal wardrobe, and it was huge, as big as a real wardrobe. After this long conversation, the guy finally introduced himself as Yale, a member of the Sacred Union. He turned to the registrar and politely asked that he put him in the same room as Lenley. He will be my first classmate, Lenley thought happily. But the registrar threw the suitcase at Yale, shouting at him to take his clothes and get out of here. Yale fell and bruised himself. At that time, a strange guy approached them. Lenley looked at him with interest, and Yale tried to get up. The stranger said that Yale was a talentless idiot. He asked Yale in a high-pitched voice that he thought he would have enough magical abilities for this academy. And he added that if it wasn't for his money, he wouldn't have been able to set foot here. The stranger looked at the two boys and asked them if they were here together. Don't be so rude, Lenley said. Anyone who hangs around with garbage is like that, the stranger said and went to the registrar. Lenley asked Yale who he was. Yale nervously replied that his name was Jane. His aptitude and mental strength were very strong, and he was the strongest of the hundred newcomers. He went on to say that he was even stronger than Linley in terms of skills. The guy thought, this is where the power gathers and this is not Wushan village. Every opponent is strong. Gale was trampled. He began to justify himself to Linley, saying that Jean was right. His aptitude and mental strength were only slightly above average. So what if his father was rich? And then Bibe rushed off to the arena where the test was taking place. Yale suggested that they go and see what was happening there, too. Dellen began to feel strong elemental radiation. The boys made their way to the arena through the crowd. All the applicants were excited about someone. They saw a beautiful blonde girl and heard from the magicians that her mental power was sixty times greater than the human mind. It was the sister of a prodigy who studies here. Her name is Dice, Yale explained. The girl turned around and introduced herself to the boys. Her name was Delia. She was very beautiful, her blue eyes shone, and her hair was long and white. 
The news of Lenly's acceptance into the Magic Academy made his father Noga very happy. The whole Wuxian village rejoiced and celebrated the event. Captain Hillman watched the celebrations and found himself thinking that he couldn't wait for the day when Lenly would bring back the lost greatness of the Baruch family. Lenly packed his belongings into a single bundle, said goodbye to Uncle Hillman and his father, and ran to the Magic Academy his educational adventures had begun. He walked beside Yale and told him that Hillman was a friend of his father's, who had looked after him since childhood. Yale listened to him with interest and said that if he had come from his family, with qualities like his, he would have been very loved. To encourage him, Lenly reminded him that Yale had passed the test and his skills were not that bad. But he had something to worry about. He was sad. It was so painful to say goodbye to them. Yale explained that his family paid 10,000 gold coins to the Magic Academy every month. Lenly was shocked. For him, 10,000 gold coins were fabulous money. Yale continued his story. His aptitude and mental power are above average. If he went to an ordinary academy, he would be the best student. But this magical academy gathers the best monsters. If it wasn't for his father's connections and the 10,000 he paid every month, he wouldn't have been accepted. Lenly walked away, thinking that his father had sold the sculpture for only 500 gold coins, which would have been enough for Yale to pay for half a month. Yale whispered in Lenly's ear that Lenly would save his face if he brought the sorceress from the academy. Then he explained with a mysterious face that money meant nothing to him. He had another goal, which was said in this expression. Lenly asked him in surprise if he had really come to the academy for the girl they had seen. Yale was surprised to hear him say that, because he had heard that that impudent Jean, who was at the registration desk, liked her. That's what everyone around him was saying. To which Lenly replied that her brain power was sixty times stronger. She was smart, a good student, a great option, mentioning how stunning she looks. Yale replied that he understood because he saw Lenly's reaction. You misunderstood me, Lenly shouted at him. They came to the door, and the number 109 was written on it and the keys. This was their dormitory. Yale sadly realized that everything here was so old and small. But what can you do? We will study. Nothing can be changed. After all, he was used to living in luxury. They went inside and saw a spacious room with nice furniture and renovation. It's not so bad, Lenly exclaimed. They saw two other boys who also lived here, and one of them exclaimed happily that they had finally arrived and rushed to greet them. The boys introduced themselves. I'm Renard from the O'Brien Empire, one of them said. Oh, these are the new roommates. I forgot that the room is for four people, said Lenly. I'm Lin Lei from the Fung Lai Empire, he replied. And then the mannequin started to fall on him, and he was scared. One of the boys rushed to his aid and used his sword to push the mannequin away. Renard exclaimed that it was so cool that Lin Lei came to them. Who knew that he would come to study and have such skills in magic? Another boy with glasses explained that Renard had always wanted to go to a swordsmanship school to become a great swordsman. But when he was tested, he was found to have magical abilities. So, his family sent him here to study, he continued to explain. Renard said he set up dummies everywhere so he could practice. Now Lin Lei can be my opponent and my skills won't deteriorate, laughed Renard. Renard asked why he had two swords. Meanwhile, Yale was in charge of moving his belongings so that they would not be damaged. He shouted to the last people to start choosing their rooms. Yale pompously dismissed the service and jokingly offered to put money on a magic crystal card for him to buy equipment. Lindley went out to the balcony. He wanted to be alone and collect his thoughts. He looked at the building of the Magic Academy and wondered if he could become a seventh-level magician or maybe an eighth-level magician. He decided that if I couldn't become a dragon-blooded knight, I could become a magician so that his family could become powerful again and he made a promise to himself. The night in the dormitory passed quietly, and the morning came, and the magic courses began. After studying various elements, the boys went to different classes. Dellen showed up and asked Lenly where she should go. The boy could not understand why she was asking him. She thought about it. In the first lesson, Lenly was the only student with a double element. Wind and earth lessons were held at the same time. He decided to go to the wind lesson 
left Baby in the room and gave her a chicken leg so she wouldn't be nervous, and explained that she couldn't go with him. Dylan said with confidence, how could anyone teach the earth element better than her? She patted Bebby's head and asked her to stay in the dormitory as well. So the wind lesson began, and a separate classroom was set aside for it. It was built in such a way that the desks stood in a circle, and the teacher was in the center. Lenly stood there looking at everything, and he heard whispers behind him and thought he was so famous. But the other boys were discussing the unusual girl from the test. The teacher wasn't there yet. He was late and everyone was waiting for him. I think something good is about to happen, Lenley said to himself when he saw the test girl enter the classroom. She was looking for a place to sit, and then a miracle happened. She sat down right next to Lenley, and the whole class froze. Lenley realized that everyone was waiting for her. My name is Delia, the girl said, turning to him. And you're the one who has two elements, and that's cool, she laughed out loud. And she stretched out her hand to say hello, and the classroom fell into a deathly silence. Everyone's jaws dropped. I'm Lin Lay, the boy greeted. And I'm Yale. And his new friend's hand was extended to the girl. Linley hissed to his new friend who sat down next to him that this was no reason to overplay. But Yale said loudly that he hadn't said that Lenley was interested in her. What's the matter? And then a dark-haired young man of about twenty-five came into the classroom, a teacher, and stood in the center of the classroom on a platform that was also moving. He greeted everyone and explained that he would be their first-year teacher. Delia quietly added that in addition to being a teacher, he was also the head boy. The teacher introduced himself as Trey, a sixth-year student. And the lesson began. Trey offered to talk about the basics of wind elemental magic, and he told them that he had used a wind blade to get to class. He explained that when they became fifth-level wind mages, they would be able to use the hovering technique, but that these were very simple spells. He went on to say that legend has it that Spatial Blade is a powerful single-target spell. Yale whispered that the wind element is cooler than the earth element, he thought so. And then Lenley asked him why Yale was sitting in their class. He had gone to study the earth element. Yale told him that he was bored in the earth element class and came to them because Lenley and Delia were there. And he winked and smiled. Trey reprimanded the boys for talking and threatened to cut out their tongues with his blade. Suddenly, a blade of wind flew by Yale's face. Trey asked Yale what class he was in and his name. But the boy exploded with anger at the blade and began to yell at the teacher. Yale shouted that Trey didn't even know his name, and he would not forgive him. Yale stood up abruptly and ran out of the classroom. The teacher was shocked, and so was the class. Dellen, who was also watching the scene, thought that the elements should actually balance each other out. There are spells in wind element magic, raging destruction and spatial blade, and the earth element has holy earth destruction and holy meteor shower, Trey told the students. Dellen listened to this and exploded because this guy dared to say that the magic of the earth element was primitive. So the teacher put up a table comparing the wind element, namely the higher level spells raging destruction and spatial blade, with their performance characteristics for all the students to look at and write in their notebooks. The teacher then brought out the comparative characteristics of the earth element, namely the higher level spells, holy earth destruction, and holy meteor shower. Lindley quietly asked Dellen, what about the stone giant, what level was it? And she began to tell him that a long time ago, she had been ambushed by a fire mage, and she had used holy earth destruction to take him away with her. Lindley could not calm down, he began to prove to her that he had easily killed him last time, but Dellen reminded him that it was thanks to her. She continued that the spatial blade can cut through physical matter, and although it is destructive, it is a normal strike, unlike the Earth Guardian spell. When Lenly summoned it, it would continue to fight the enemy. Lenly asked her what would happen if the knight also had dragon blood. Dellen pretended not to hear. So you're saying that the elements of wind and earth can be used at the same time? Lenley asked her again. Of course, if the two elements are at the sixth level, they can be used to defeat the seventh level, Dellen explained to him. But the girl finally realized that Lenley was disappointed that he did not become a dragon blood knight. Then he would be a saint-level person, Dellen explained. 
Lenly remembered the promise he made to himself, that he was a member of the famous Baruch family. And for some reason, he decided to make a note of it right in class. He thought nothing would happen. Suddenly, Trey turned his gaze to him and exploded in anger. He shouted that he saw those in the class who were not concentrating and that he hated inattentive students. My wind blade will catch up with those who refuse to learn, Trey yelled and launched his blade. No, 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 Lenly screamed as he saw the flying blade, but the blade caught up with him and hit him and he fell under the table. Trey said, don't follow the example of such students. To the other students in the class who were in complete shock, Trey told them that only those who improved their abilities would be able to advance to the next course, so they would be able to graduate when they reached the sixth level. If they didn't become a sixth-level mage in sixty years, they would be kicked out of the Magic Academy. He continued that even though the Academy didn't have many rules, they still held tests every year to test your abilities. The children began to buzz around, discussing the news, some shouting that it was rare to find a sixth-level wizard, others indignant that it was impossible to learn magic in sixty years, others worried that they might be expelled from the Academy. There was a lot of noise. Children, you need to concentrate and study. Let's take a deep breath, Trey suggested to everyone. Those who use the wind element must understand how to unite with it. And everyone began to breathe frantically like locomotives. The air in the classroom began to stir. When Lenly left the classroom, he was still breathing deeply. Dellen explained to him that this is the same principle as in the earth element meditation. The boy loudly exclaimed that it was based on the power of the mind. Dylan confirmed that he had understood correctly. They continued to walk down the hall together, and then she shouted to Lenly to watch out. The boy intuitively ducked down, and flames passed over his head. A blonde guy with a ball of fire in his hand stood by the wall and said angrily that it was just a joke, but it scared Lenly good, but it doesn't have any big consequences. Another rather familiar guy added that it seems the double element privilege is not that special. Lenly finally recognized him. It was the guy from the front desk. And Jean said that he was stronger this trimester. Not Lenly. Stay away from Delia, he hissed. Everyone in the crowd whispered. And someone said that Jean really liked Delia. That's right. Yale had said that. He must be mistaken, thought Lenly. But wait a minute, Lenly exclaimed. Lenly thought he would not give in to his aggression. But he wondered aloud if he really thought using these dirty tricks would scare him. The blonde dude laughed and shouted to Jean that this guy was no threat to them, and he would deal with him himself. The blonde shouted that the academy was no place for rednecks and trash, and he said the first level fire element spelled Tongue of Flame. A layer of fire instantly appeared in his palms. He spread his arms and launched fire toward the surprised Lenly. The crowd of students gasped. The boy was terrified and Dellen asked if it was really a fire elemental spell. The fire surrounded Lenly in a circle. Everything was on fire. The fire spread into several circles. The class realized that their classmate was in trouble. I know only one spell and it can attack objects, said Lenly in a low voice. Dellen giggled softly. That was enough. Then she whispered to him that he knew magic too, and she tried to explain how an earth elemental magician could lose to a fire elemental magician. Lenly was furious, and he shouted at the top of his lungs the spell Earthquake. The earth rose and covered all the fire around him. The blonde was shocked for a second, as some unknown spell in the form of mud destroyed his fire circle. Lenly loudly shouted the next spell, Destroy fire! Dylan, watching this, shouted that Lenly should not sleep, because he had a very energetic opponent. And a battle broke out in the Academy Hall. The power of earth and fire joined together. Everything was flying and burning around. Deline became a guardian angel for the boy in this battle, constantly warning him when there was danger. Jean also joined the battle. He also had the magic of fire. His anger was completely transformed into the power of the flame. It was an unequal battle. Jean launched a huge column of fire directly at Lenly. The force of the blow was incredible. And then something inexplicable and incredible happened. Lenly managed to simply dodge the column of fire. He flew into the air and did a flip away from the flames, and he continued to spin again and again without stopping. The hall was absolutely silent. Dylan watched the boy in fright and noticed a strange glow around him. 
Then she realized everything and shouted that it was wind magic. Although the boy had not yet learned everything, she asked Lenly how he could understand how to use it. I just took a deep breath and this happened, Lenly replied. Jiyin couldn't calm down. He shouted the spell, Tongue of Flame again and produced a pillar of fire again. Lenly was not at a loss and shouted the spell Earthquake in Jean's direction. And then with the power of the two magics, the boys collided head on. Why did you hit me? Doesn't your head hurt? Jean shouted. It was you who ran into me, shouted Lenly. And then everyone noticed Trey, who frightened the two brawlers with magic and asked who allowed them to fight. Trey said to Jean that he was a teacher of wind element magic, and Jean looked like a student of fire element magic and asked him why he had come here. Jean shot back that he had come to say hello to his friend. Lenly couldn't stand it and shouted back that he was lying shamelessly. I see you're very good friends. Trey smiled slyly. Jean whispered to Lenly that if he had the strength to fight, he should come to the arena, and they could fight as long as they wanted, even to infinity. Lenly whispered back that he doubted he would be honest. Trey waved his hand, and the boys took off running. Finally, he told them not to block the passage and not to forget their promises, and the whole crowd dispersed with the participants. Everyone knew that there would be a sequel. Lenly went outside and sat down under a tree to meditate. He was extremely tired. Dellen quietly asked him if he was really going to fight the fire elemental gene in the arena. Wouldn't Lenly be asking him to cheat? This guy is crazy, but he's the best student in the class, she exclaimed. Lenly replied that he had to win the fight himself, and although his chances were not good, he had to take it seriously. After listening to the boy's answer, Dellen told him that he did have the courage, and if he needed her help in a fight that would not end in death, he could ask her. But he is training too slowly, Dellen teased the boy. She promised to teach Lenly the secret of sword fighting, which was lost to everyone 5,000 years ago. The boy looked at her in surprise. Dellen dragged the boy to some secret place, pulled out a wooden mannequin of a man, blindfolded Lenly, and handed him a sword. Lenly thought with a smile that Dellen was probably testing his sword skills, but it was good that he had trained in Wushan village. The boy picked up the sword and skillfully began to fight the dummy with his eyes closed, smashing it to pieces from all sides. He was doing very well, cutting off its legs and arms and making many holes. There were only shavings all around. When he finished smashing the mannequin, the boy exclaimed with satisfaction that he had learned very useful skills in Wushan village. Of course not, Deline shouted and hit him over the head with her staff as usual. She irritably explained that his fighting technique was mediocre and weak. But the boy proved to her that he had learned absolutely everything in Wushan village. Flat blade! This is a spell I never taught anyone when I was alive. If you can learn it and master it, you can easily become a sixth-level mage in ten years, Dellen said in a monotone and businesslike manner. Lindley replied with interest that it sounded cool. And what kind of spell was it? And Dellen rolled her eyes. She ordered Lenly to find a large stone, which would be one of the main tools, and to find other tools for carving. The boy immediately ran off somewhere. Twenty minutes later, an axe, a scythe, a saw, a flat knife, a round knife, a triangular knife, a hammer, a jade knife, an oblique knife, and a huge rock appeared on the lawn. Lenly breathlessly explained to the astonished Dellen that he had borrowed all this stuff from Yale, who had everything for all occasions. She laughed and handed him a flat knife and told him to cut on the stone, but to try not to think about what he was cutting. Just cut. It's a good thing I used to be interested in stone carving, the boy thought, and began to scrape and chisel at the stone. After a while, he fell down wet and completely exhausted, and whined that he couldn't hack with just a flat knife. It was too hard and inefficient. Unable to stand it, he shouted at Delan that she had promised to improve his earth elemental magic, not this. Actually, carving stone requires the use of all the tools you brought. It's because the stone is very hard, she replied mysteriously. Dillon walked over to the boy and silently took the flat knife from him. The magic of the earth element is connected to the earth from birth. If you feel your element well, you can control its structure, Dillon taught him. She stretched out her hand with the knife and began to concentrate. Lenly, you should try to feel it, too. And then suddenly the knife began to shine with green light. 
It was clear that the knife was beginning to gain a magical power unknown to Lenly. Delin closed her eyes. Follow the veins of the stone, she whispered, and brought the knife to the stone which began to break up into layers. Follow its veins. She continued to move the knife along the stone, which was already splitting. At one point the stone split with a bang, and a dragon sculpture of unprecedented beauty emerged. Even the hardest stone can be broken, she shouted. To say that Lenly was shocked to see this is an understatement. And she explained that if Lenly had too many tools, it would affect his perception as a magician. But out of all the tools, she can only use a flat knife. It's called the Flat Knife Flow. Lindley told her in amazement that he was shocked that Delon could turn a stone into such a sculpture with an ordinary knife. Delon reminded him that this spell was lost 5,000 years ago. And thanks to it, Lindley has a chance to become a high-level magician in 10 years. She was proud of herself at that moment. Delon was a really great mage and one of the top five. I didn't even know she was so artistic, thought Lindley. And then he started fantasizing like a child that he could sell this beautiful statue if he could move it off the moon, because he needed money. Delon was angry. She shouted that in the days when she made statues, all the rich people wanted to buy them, but she wouldn't let anyone near her house. Lenly reminded her that education is not free. Delon freaked out and yelled at him to sell his own work, not someone else's perfect work, and flew off. My works are hidden in the basement. Five thousand years have passed, and I don't remember where the basement is, lied the furious Delling. Blenley did not pay attention to his mentor's psychosis. He twirled the knife in his hands and thought about something. He closed his eyes and remembered Delling's words that the element of Earth gives you a special gift, to feel it better. Just use the knife. He extended his hand with the knife and concentrated, and the knife began to glow again. Let me try and see everything from the inside, whispered the boy as he pointed the knife at the stone. He managed to fall into deep meditation and concentration. Under his feet he felt the inexplicable viscosity of the earth, as if he were standing on a quagmire. And the guy saw a stone from the inside. There was a whole galaxy, the earth looked like a galaxy, with lights that were in some kind of liquid. It was something incredible. He whispered that he was following a stream. There is a crack here. Lenly continued to travel through the stone. Everything is working out just like Delon said. Lenly was happy. He was cutting through the stones without any effort. Honestly, you understood everything very quickly, the girl whispered in his ear. I can feel the earth element. Lenly was amazed and happy. Keep practicing. The girl ordered him again and blindfolded him and he cut and cut those stones without touching them. You are learning very fast. With such progress in three months you will become a second-level magician, said the girl. Only the second? The boy was surprised. And he worked harder. Delon looked at him and thought that the boy had learned complex movements very quickly, and it was very difficult to find someone like him. And in general, he did not yet realize that an ordinary person needs to train for a very long time to reach the second level. Lindley returned to his friends in the room and told them what had happened to Jean. Yale listened for a long time and remained silent, then asked if there was really going to be a duel with Jean over Delia. Lindley confirmed everything and began to think about his next steps. All the residents of Dormitory No. 109 were thinking. While everyone was worrying, Lenly knew for sure that he could become a second-level magician in a short period of three months. Finally, Yale let it slip that the problem was that Lenly didn't have much practice, so he probably wouldn't be able to beat Jean. What if I become a second-level magician? Lenly asked Yale. All the boys in the room turned to him and asked how he imagined that. Yale irritatedly began to shout at him that there were only three weeks left before the battle, which was very short. Lenly was shocked. For some reason, no one had ever told him this before. But in fact, he thought, it's good that he learned everything and practiced with the unsurpassed Delon. Yale exhaled and opened a huge suitcase and started taking out strange things. A ring that reduces magic damage, a helmet that blocks magic, a necklace that reduces the time it takes to read a spell. He announced the items. These things cost about a thousand gold coins. You can take any of them and you won't lose. Yale offered him. 
Lenley smiled and thanked Yale for his offer, but Yale said with a glare that he always uses these things to win, and Lenley is too cruel to him, and he began to cry like a little child. You see, I want to beat Gene alone and with my own strength, Lenley explained to him. The boy with the glasses said that according to the Academy's rule book, Part 7, Rule Number 24.461, it does not say that magic must be used. As far as I remember, you're very good with a sword, the boy with the glasses continued to say. Lenley will be able to attack with a sword, but Jean is not expecting it, so it will be hard to say who will win. Ha 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 ha, I like that idea, Delin burst out laughing. Warriors and mages differ only in their elements. There is a winner and a loser in battle. No one cares how you won, so I recommend you use the flat blade technique she said quietly. You know, you're right, then I will use this, and he showed the flat blade to Yale to all the boys. Yale laughed and told him not to embarrass himself. He had promised Lenla a sword, but not to use any knife. But out of curiosity, he asked how he was going to use it. Linley pulled out a knife and began to cut through the wall with great effort, just like he had done on the lawn when he was practicing. The boys froze in shock. He was meditating and cutting without stopping. Everyone was watching him with bated breath. None of them had ever seen anything like this. What is that sound? asked the boy with the glasses. Yale couldn't calm down and understand how you can attack with a knife like that and it works. Lindley was so excited that he cut through half the room. Everyone was horrified to see that the house began to fall apart. In an instant, the stones fell out, where a huge hole appeared. Meanwhile, in his dorm room... Trey practiced his favorite flight technique. He breathed deeply and slowly for an hour straight, not noticing anything around him. Breath in, breath out, breath in, breath out. He was snoring all over the room. His training was going perfectly. Suddenly, someone entered his room without knocking. Trey did not notice the visitor. The guest began to cough intelligently. Trey, you're such a hard worker, the red-haired man shouted and came closer. The red-haired man continued to ask questions. He asked Trey if he would be the first to leave them and go to the seventh level. Trey finally heard that someone was in the room and reluctantly came out of his meditation. Fernet, what are you doing here? He asked. Fernet happily told him that there was a very good student in the fire element class this semester. The red-haired Fernet sat down next to Trey and continued to talk. He said that he and he had been classmates for many years and now they were teaching students. Trey told him that he was worrying in vain in this situation. And then Fernet could not stand it and exploded, saying that if that was the case, then they would meet in the academic arena. He was a rather unbalanced person. Trey thought at that moment that none of his students looked special, although there was one. Meanwhile, Baby the Mouse had finally eaten her chicken leg, and she was lying in a fluffy ball under the blanket and was sad. She got out from under it and started jumping around the room. She thought it was so strange that no one was in the dormitory. Bebe ran over to the flip calendar and flipped the page over and saw that it said that today was some kind of unusual day. A crowd was gathering in the competition arena of the Magic Academy. The boys came closer to her. This is where new students can compete with each other, but only freshmen take part, one of them explained. Yale stood there and silently calculated something. The guys asked him what he was doing. He replied that he had calculated that if they sold tickets to the competition at a price of 110 gold coins, then... Then we can make a lot of money. How could you all not think of that? He shouted. Lindley was invited to the magic arena. The host told him to put his hand on a stone to automatically divide them into magic groups. At that moment, Lindley angrily remembered Jean and his firepower in the last battle. He put his hand on the stone with determination and courage, and it lit up. The host controlled the whole process. The host loudly announced that the competitor, Lenley, belonged to group number 32. And then Yale and Renard came up to Lenley and told him firmly that they would not allow him to compete alone. But the host said that they didn't have to compete yet, and everyone was looking at the magic circle of the stone. Suddenly Renard noticed that only Georg had not joined them. Yale explained that even though their elements were different, they would still fight together. Georg adjusted his glasses and replied that such fights were not his style. He was an intellectual and fought only with his mind. 
And then the crowd of spectators began to whisper that a student of the fire element was coming. Everyone parted ways. Through the crowd, Jean walked with authority and confidence with his blonde friend, who was constantly serving him. He met eyes with Lenly, hatred for each other sparking between them. Both were absolutely motivated. Jean gritted his teeth as he was surprised that Lenly had come. I thought you weren't coming. Lindley cut him off. Jean noticed with satisfaction how the crowd was looking at him and shouted, If there was no one stronger than him, why was everyone looking at him? He could warm up the audience. He walked with a wide stride, respectfully and slowly, and the crowd parted even more. And then he had a brilliant idea. He started releasing fire around him to make it look more beautiful, and the crowd recoiled in fright. Renard shouted at him why he was doing this, but Jean pompously replied that he was just warming up, because the power of the fire element was too high, and he had nothing to do with it. Yale looked at Jean's antics in amazement, and said that he did not see anything special in fire magic, and was not afraid of it. Suddenly Renard began to sniff. Something was burning. Everyone turned to Renard and saw that Yale's clothes were on fire. Yale started running and screaming in panic, waving his arms and begging everyone to put it out. Jean muttered to himself that he was an ignorant, pathetic student. And then Jean noticed a light at Lenly's feet. A thought flashed through his mind that maybe it was because of it that his magic hadn't worked on Lenly. Dublin also noticed the light at the boy's feet. And she thought that it must be the magic of the wind and earth that created the protective wall. And no one else can do this but her student. Dellen rejoiced. Jean walked up to the stone to test his strength. It lit up. He pompously shouted to the crowd that they would all be disqualified with their level of magic before they even met him. Jean's first fight will be against Lin Lei, the host announced. Jean shouted with satisfaction to get ready to leave the arena. Lin Lei snapped back and promised to defeat John even faster. Everything was going according to his plan, so let him shut his bad mouth. Jean did not calm down and promised to meet in a fight in which Lin Lei would regret everything. Delia was watching all this from a distance. She thought to herself that the fight would start soon, and she heard that Lin Lei would be participating in it. And then she heard someone calling out to her. She turned around, it was Teacher Trey. And he quickly spoke to her, saying that he would be very happy if she also took part in the competition. With her abilities, it would be quite easy and she would reach the final. Delia was embarrassed by this proposal and blushed. She didn't like increased interest in herself, even though she was very good. But Trey was dragging her to the registration. He had already decided everything for her. Delia stopped him and admitted that she was afraid to fight in public. Trey was not expecting this answer at all and was surprised to hear it. She sincerely apologized to the teacher and was upset. Trey reassured her that everything was fine. Then he asked her if she knew who else was going to be fighting today. Suddenly something hit his head. It was Baby the Mouse, and she flew over screaming hysterically that no one could stop her from seeing her Lenly fight. The competition begins. The first group of participants is Renard and Rayson, announced the host. Renard angrily muttered that he was John's sycophant, and the crowd screamed. People shouted and demanded that Renard drag Rayson out. No one liked this upstart. Renard stood on one of the arena's towers and announced that he was in the second class of the fire element, so he would attack. Rayson, an impudent blonde, claimed that Renard's appearance showed that he had never fought anyone. He was trying to mentally disrupt Renard and make him angry. And Rayson shouted a first-level spell, Tongues of Flame, and launched a furious column of fire in Renard's direction. The boy with the glasses shouted at Renard that these idiots are used to street fighting. Be careful. Everyone else froze and watched the battle. The fire began to form a huge circle around Renard's body, and he became instantly very hot. In about ten seconds, the fire engulfed him completely. He looked like a pillar of fire. The guys were looking at him with bated breath. Dellen was frozen, and the crowd of students stood in complete shock. Then a miracle began to happen. Renard stretched out his arms, and everyone around him realized that something was about to happen. Jean looked at him in amazement and shouted that Renard had some kind of magical protection. Rayson just stared and couldn't believe his eyes. 
and then Renard broke out of the fire with all his might and grabbed Rayson by the scruff of the neck and shouted that he had opened up and was ambushed by him. Is he a seasoned warrior? Renard pulled Rayson off the ground and they took to the air and quickly spun in a single combat. From the outside, they looked like one. Renard shouted a first-level spell, Blue Fire! A blue pillar of fire began to come out of his hands. He slammed it into Raisin's body, and the fire engulfed him from all sides. From the force of the blue fire, Raisin lost consciousness and began to fall rapidly from the air to the ground. The competition's host shouted that Raisin was down. Georg shouted loudly that Renard had done the job. Meanwhile, the match director, the magical judge, entered the arena and solemnly announced that Renard had won the first group. The second class of fire, exhausted, Renard stood in the arena and bowed in all directions, constantly saying thank you, thank you. His face was covered in soot, and his clothes were burnt in places. Lenly asked Dellen what she had seen and what she thought about it. The girl replied that the boys were still first-level mages, and maybe even lower, unfortunately. She explained that before a fight, mages must always put on magical protection, it is their advantage over warriors. Renard had just used it, and Rayson hadn't even noticed. Lenly was amazed to think to himself that his neighbors were not so weak, but actually very strong magicians. Jean, who was watching the fight, said that it was pretty good, but Renard had used an anti-fire spell early, so Rayson's loss was so stupid. Jean walked over to the guys standing on the sidelines and pointed out to Renard that he didn't look like an ordinary newcomer. It was the result of special training. He sarcastically invited the guys to become his new fans, but he promised that he would finish them off first. But if they wanted to become better, they had to follow him. Renard shouted to him that maybe they would let him join the dormitory 109. Jean lost his temper and shouted back at him that they really thought they were worth it. Jean laughed out loud and viciously promised that later they would see a significant difference between them. And then the host announced the next fight. It was between Lin Lei, the element of wind and earth, and Jean, the element of fire. The crowd was instantly quiet, and there was absolute silence. Delia whispered happily, Finally, these two will fight. Oh, it's this unusual student, Trey muttered. Not even a dual element, but you're just a regular fake. Jean snorted as he stood in position. He thought that Lenly had dodged the fireball last time, so he had to double it and shouted a first level spell. Fireball. Linley also began to unleash his magic. Incredible streams of wind began to spin around him. Trey looked at Lenley and felt scared. He was surprised that Lenley really knew this spell. Lenley shouted out one of his favorite first-level spells, Glide, and he was instantly in the air. Windblade! was the next spell Lenley shouted, and the wind began to glow. Jean watched with interest and began to think about his plan of action. He decided to humiliate Lenly and shouted that his wind attack was just trash compared to his fireball. Compressed wind blade, Lenly shouted again and slammed his power into Jean. He was so concentrated that he didn't listen to Jean's nonsense. When wind meets fire, all it can do is run away. Jean shouted at him and launched his fire in his direction again. Damn, a simple level one spell is so strong, Lenly thought in his mind. Dellen intervened and explained to him that although it sounded stupid, he needed to use the wind to fight, because the lower-level earth elemental magic consisted of several defense spells. Dellen quickly flew over and explained to him that if he used only magic in the battle, he would be at a disadvantage. But if Lenly used the wind element only to run away, it would be difficult to defeat Jean. At this point, Jean teased Lenla to use the wind blade if he planned to continue fighting him and he started his fire again. Lenla turned to Delon and asked him hesitantly if he could really use a flat blade to defeat Jean. Dylan slyly replied that he should think of Jean as a stone and winked at him. And open him up? The boyfriend asked sarcastically. She closed her eyes and told him that every time he would release his fireball, he should think of a crack in the stone. If you see it, your flat blade... Then she whispered that you have to take into account that it is not a stone. The enemy will move, so you have to concentrate. Lenly remembered what the stone he had split with his flat blade on the lawn during training. 
looked like, and concentrated. A pattern between the stones, he whispered, remembering the dots of fire and lines of fire he had seen in the middle of the stone. The boy concentrated, stretched his arms forward, generated the magic of a flat blade, and confidently launched it. Jean was horrified to see this. How could Lenly's wind blade pass through the firewall and attack him? He could clearly see Linlay's flat blade easily and silently cutting through his firewall. For a moment, Jean lost control of the situation, but after gathering his strength, he sent a huge pillar of fire at Linlay. This guy, Jean, is really well trained. He stopped Linlay's combo right away, whispered Deline. The fierce battle continued. Jernang growled, dumbfounded that Lenly had only hit him because he was safe, so don't let him get caught. But he fired again with even more force. Delin watched and said with satisfaction that the battle was all about timing and opportunity. Lenly was thrown high into the sky by the fire attack. Lenly shouted that he would use the flat swing again and projected the blade magic again. When you think you've won, you lose, Jean hissed with the wild smile of a madman. Jean spread his arms free and loudly ordered Len Lena not to attack him, showing that he was not going to do anything. The guys standing in the crowd of spectators were watching the fight, and one of them said that knowing Jean, he wouldn't get into a fight until he was sure of his actions, and that was very suspicious. Delon said that although Len Lee knew the spell well, he was using it again for some reason, and called him completely overconfident. But Lenly continued to move with the flat blade. Lenly began to confidently enter Jean's circle of fire, but Jean stood still. But Jean, letting the boy get as close as possible, immediately shouted the spell Fireball and let him taste it, and he fired a strong fire directly at Lenly's body. The crowd screamed in terror. Everyone screamed students, teachers, friends. Only Delon watched attentively and remained silent. Jean launched another fireball spell a first-level fire element, and struck again with fire, shouting that he would defeat him. Lenly's wounds began to bleed heavily. Delon saw everything and thought that even though he was hit by the fireball, he couldn't have lost that much blood. She had a bad feeling about it. Meanwhile, in Wushan village, Lenly Horton's younger brother came up to Nog and said that his nose was bleeding. His father was shocked. Jean shouted at Lenly that he had lost. He was 100% sure of it. But then something incredible happened. Lenly began to roar like a dragon. Blood dripped from his mouth. He screamed so loudly that it seemed as if the dragon was behind him. The crowd roared with fear. Lenly was very hot. Jean looked at him and wondered why he did not fall down but was crying. Because he had hit him with the fireball. He could not understand anything. But Lenly, bleeding like a beast, began to attack Jean again and he shouted that since he was not afraid to die, he would help him. But it was too late, Lenly began to gain momentum. Gathering the remnants of his strength, Lenly struck Jean with his magic flat blade, and the sound of the explosion was incredible. The force of the blow hit Jean's body and was so strong that it completely paralyzed him, and instantly they both fell exhausted with a thud to the ground. There was a ringing silence around them. After about five minutes when Jean came to, he whispered that it was impossible, because he had attacked with a fireball. Dylan looked at Lenly's bloody face and flew over to ask him what kind of element it was, and what happened to the mouse. The mouse was also screaming and covered in blood. Bibi seemed to have gone crazy, and she started flying over the crowd of students and banging her paws off their heads. Dylan looked at her in amazement and wondered what had happened to Bibi. Had the resonance made her like this? Holy meteor shower weakened version. Delon shouted the spell. She hit the mouse with her staff to stop its flight path. Delon thought that even the contract mouse was involved in the battle, which meant that Lenly could not fully control his power. She looked at the boy and couldn't quite figure out if it was really the dragon's power in him or if he had enough in his body. Yvonne exclaimed in amazement that Lin Lei was really very strong. Trey was of the same opinion. Suddenly, the restless John having fully regained his senses, shouted that although Lin Lei had these strange spells, his fire element magic could, and he again insidiously launched the fireball at the guy, and it covered his entire body. But miraculously, the fire did not burn the boy's body. In response, Lin Lei also launched his magic in Jean's direction. It was a high-level magic of the water element ice barrier. 
but at that moment the tournament manager ran up to them and actually stopped everything because the guys were too exhausted to continue. He said that both of them had exhausted their limits. In fact, they both surpassed the first level of skill, especially your power. It has exceeded all our expectations, but it is not the kind of magic that can be learned in the academy, said the steward of Lenly. Dulin looked at them and thought, it was good that the steward suppressed Linley's power, but I think they don't know much about dragon blood. But then, a red-haired teacher started running through the crowd toward them, shouting furiously that Linley had used abnormal magic and should be disqualified. Jean was his student and a fan, and that's why Jean is the winner in this battle, the redhead continued to shout. But the manager asked him that he was right in general. But if there is a force that cannot be defeated by magic and it does not count as a victory, then what is the point of the academy? And he continued that if a participant loses without the help of magic, will he have the courage to tell people? He was angry with the redhead and disliked him. The referee announced to the crowd that he was calling a draw in this fight and raised both hands of the exhausted opponents. The crowd roared. Everyone was shouting that Lin Lei should win. That's right. How could it be a draw if Lin Lei won? No one was happy with the judge's result. It's not fair, thought Len Lee. He was very tired and disappointed, and he closed his eyes. He felt very bad, but continued to hear only his name in the crowd. Night came. The city slept, and so did the residents of the dormitory 109. Finally, Len Lee could sleep after such a hard training and not an easy battle. Together with his mouse, they slept cuddled under a warm blanket. They both needed rest. It was clear that the boy was having nightmares. He cried out and woke up dreaming of Jean. Dalen, who was guarding him, said that he was completely safe and patted him gently on the head. Then the match, Lenly shouted, he could not calm down and was in a state of half-sleep. Dylan began to tell him that after the referee called a draw, Lenly passed out, so they took him to the dormitory to rest. Jean was also knocked out, most likely because their strength had dropped and he was also taken to the Academy's medical center. After their fight, further matches became boring, and Renard, his roommate, won, Delan explained. That's how it was, the boy vaguely replied. But Delan was not satisfied and asked Lenly quietly if he remembered that first meeting in the hall when he was tested, because some strange things happened at the match. That means he could be a dragon blood warrior, Delan finished her conversation. Judging by his aura, He's definitely at least a second-level knight. Delin was not calm. Lenly looked at his hands carefully and thought, maybe this was his true power that he knew about. After thinking for a while, the boy shook his head and replied that it was not possible. Delin looked at him pitifully. She really felt sorry for him. And she asked him why he was saying that. And Lenly explained to her that his father had once told him that he could not be a dragon-blood knight. He had told him very clearly, the boy repeated, recalling past events. He was 100% sure of his father's words, but he asked him not to say it again, and he lay down on the bed again upset. The boy explained that because he was not a dragon-blooded warrior, he had entered this academy to at least become a strong mage and revive the power of his family, and that was what motivated him to become stronger. Dylan listened to him and thought, he is only twelve and already has such a responsibility. But that is why he will be stronger than the others. He will succeed. The dormitory was full of nightlife. Yale went to collect money for bets on Lenley's fight. Everyone thought he would win, and Yale had his hands full of bags of gold coins. He was dancing with joy. Delia was sitting and writing in her diary about Lenley's fight today. It was very interesting to her, and so she decided to write down his strategy. Jane was resting in his room at the time. Grayson reassured him that it wasn't a loss, just a draw. But Jean told him that where he did not win, it meant that he lost. Meanwhile, in the village of Wushan, Nog stood in the middle of the Baruch family's shrine. He was loudly calling out to the five saints of the Baruch family and asking them to help him because he was in trouble. The man asked them to give their power to this boy. In front of him, Linley's half-conscious younger brother, Horton, lay silently in a basket. Suddenly, an unknown force lifted the little boy's body and he lit up. Horton opened his blue eyes, and the silhouette of a dragon flashed in his pupils, and his body abruptly fell right into his father's arms. 
This is exactly what Hillman saw when he entered the sanctuary. He asked Nog if the ceremony was over, but at that moment Horton began to cough loudly. He said he was having a hard time breathing. Hillman asked what was wrong with the boy's eyes. For a minute, they looked unusual. Nog explained that Horton's blood was rebelling, as if it had lost control. His blood and his son's blood had come into full resonance. And Nog exclaimed joyfully that it was dragon blood. He had finally manifested the blood of a dragon. And it worked. Hillman couldn't believe his ears, he asked again. If this is in Horton's blood, then his blood density is incredible. Nog turned to him grimly and asked Hillman to promise him something. He asked him to protect Horton and Lin Lei until they were adults, to protect them so that they could make their family great someday. He quietly handed the baby into Hillman's arms and silently left the sanctuary. Hillman ran after Nog, asking him what he was going to do. Nog stopped. His face was red, but his eyes were burning. He really looked like a dragon. He said quietly that he was going to do what he should have done a long time ago and let Hillman not even think of stopping him. One difficult year passed. Linley sat in the middle of his dorm room and practiced meditation, stones flying around him. He became much more mature. He tried to concentrate as hard as he could and succeeded. Dylan was watching him sitting on the windowsill. Baby the mouse was sleeping sweetly. Linley was already fourteen years old. He asked Dylan if his mind power was already the same as that of a third-level magician. The girl smiled and replied that, of course, thanks to her training. To increase his mind power, he learned a flat blade. The speed of increasing his mind power is faster than an ordinary person, although it's six times faster. The boy interrupted her, saying that if his father knew this, he would be happy. Dylan was offended and demanded that she was the one to thank. But he didn't hear her. He was thinking about his father. And then the boy heard through the window that someone was calling him loudly. Lenley and Bebby also looked out the window with interest. There stood Jean, who was also older and fifteen years old. In his own way, he called Linley a miserable coward, and he shouted for Lenley to come out and fight him if he didn't have the guts. Jean did not change a bit. He hysterically demanded only one fight, but he really wanted to fight again. It did not matter to him whether he won or lost. He would accept the result as it was. Jean still could not accept his defeat. After listening to him, Lenly shouted that he was here to learn magic, not to fight an idiot like Jean. Stepping away from the window, Lenly cast the second-level earth elemental spell, Broken Stone, and the window was instantly bricked up with stones. The boy learned to do incredible household things, at which Jean shouted so that Lenly would not think that some window would prevent him from hearing him. He decided not to back down this time. And at that moment, everyone in the room heard Yale shouting, that guy, and running down the hall. Yale was not shouting in his own voice that he would be Lin Lei's representative in the new battle. The whole dormitory could hear him. He ran to the kitchen and began to gather all the knives. Renard tried to calm him down, explaining that Lin Lee would not be able to defeat him with these knives. Yale finally stopped and thoughtfully said that it was true because he had heard that Jean had become much stronger this year. Even the high school students did not want to fight him. He firmly believed that only Lin Lei could beat Jean, and he began to ask Lin Lei to agree to the fight, because this Jean would go crazy. Let him go, the boy replied. He didn't care. Yale began to cry loudly like a child. He really wanted this rematch to take place because he was a true admirer of Lin Lei's magical power. Lenly was calmly pouring himself a cup of tea in the kitchen and listening to Yale's screaming, when he noticed an unusual medallion on the table with a dragon on it. He asked the boys where it came from. Henry told him that a middle-aged knight had come by this morning looking for Lenly, but he was training at the time. The knight did not want to disturb him, left the medallion and left. Lenly understood. He cast a first-level wind elemental spell, Glide, and instantly flew out the window he had bricked up, which shattered into pieces. Jean was still standing under that window, still annoyingly standing there, and when he saw Lenly, he was happy to see that the boy had finally come out to fight him. But Lenly flew silently past him with an indifferent face. Surprised, Jean began to shout after him that he had no right to run away like that, and he jumped after him, 
grumbling under his breath that if he knew the sixth-level soaring technique, he wouldn't have to jump like a fool every time. Meanwhile, Captain Hillman, the leader of the Wushan village guard, stood in the clearing in the forest, waiting patiently for someone for hours, and it was the mysterious dragon medallion that Lenly had found that drew him to the clearing, like a magnet. Lenly landed and ran up to Captain Hillman, and they hugged each other joyfully. Hillman looked at the boy in awe and said that he had grown up a lot and looked like a grown man. The boy blushed. He was very fond of his uncle, who was his second father, and asked how their family was doing and if anything had happened to them. Hillman happily told him that his younger brother, Horton, had successfully passed the dragon blood test. Lenly was amazed and very happy and asked if it was really dragon blood. Yes, little Horton has dragon blood, Hillman confirmed. He added that because of this, his father decided to send him to O'Brien Academy, to which the boy joyfully exclaimed that it was the best place to train because it was a school for nobles. Lenly remembered Yale telling him that studying at O'Brien Academy was very expensive, but also very prestigious, and it was the best academy in its field. Hillman, sensing questions, continued to tell him that because of the cost of Horton's education, they were forced to sell some of their belongings. On his father's orders, Hillman sold the stone dragon heads that hung on the front door, but they did not fetch a very high price, but still managed to save up at least some money for Horton's education. Seeing the worry in Lenley's eyes, Hillman asked him not to worry, because there is always a way out. At the same time, he thought that he still could not tell the boy about his father, because he was on the road right now but in his heart he hoped that everything was going well with Nog. But then Yale appeared out of nowhere, and he heard the whole conversation. He started talking and said that in addition to tuition fees, he also needed money for household expenses and bills, and that he would need a sword and equipment for Horton's training. Hillman's eyes rounded. He hadn't even thought about it, and he blurted out that he would probably go to work for the O'Brien Empire to earn some money and solve this problem. Lenly listened and watched them both, and suggested that Hillman stay for a few days to rest. He already had something in mind. Saying that he had something to do, he ran off in an unknown direction. Well then, I'll see you tomorrow, said the puzzled Hillman. Yale ran after the guy, and when he caught up with him, he asked if he needed any money. He offered to lend him some. Lenly refused and thanked him sincerely. He really had a reliable and good friend. Yale looked at Lenly's face and everything became clear to him. He had made a decision. The guy asked Yale to help him make a deal with John to have the fight that John wanted, and demanded so much. It began to get dark, and the academy building and the dormitories around it were beautifully illuminated with lights. It was a quiet and warm summer evening. Meanwhile, in the woods not far from the academy, Lenly and Jean stood on a clearing. It was clear that they had already agreed on something. Gene said with satisfaction that he thought Lenly would never come, because he would be afraid. But only 10,000 gold coins, although it was a lot of money, did not mean that he could not afford it. Lenly listened to him calmly, but asked him not to forget about the battle. John slyly asked him if he really thought he could beat him. Two people were running through the forest, a girl and a boy. The girl asked the boy if he had heard that Jean and Lenly would have a second fight. He replied that of course he had and that he would not miss it for anything. It was on this night that the second match, the rematch of the year, was scheduled. All of Lenly's friends were already standing in the bushes, eagerly awaiting the fight. There were two people in the academic arena, Lenly and Jean. The fight was about to begin. Gene hissed to Lenly in his own style that the last time he surprised me with his stupid spells, and he shouted the spell, Fire, fairy, answer my call. And fire began to flow out of his body in a continuous stream. Gene looked at Lenly and noticed that he was extremely calm, and thought that he would probably use that strange spell again, like the last time. Gene completely surrounded himself with fire. It rose and fell in the air, and looked like a huge fireball but he kept a close eye on Lenly. In his heart he recognized that the boy had great strength. Henry noticed that he had never seen Jean so cautious, to which Renard replied that he looked like a scared cat in the fire. Everyone giggled, 
And then a woman's voice said that Jean was still afraid of Len Lay's strange power. It was Delia, and she greeted them sweetly. The boys were dumbfounded. And an intriguing spectacle was beginning in the arena. Jean rose into the air and released continuous streams of fire from his two hands. He shouted that in order to defeat Lenly, he could actually use ranged attacks. Lenly calmly listened to him and watched. He was silent and poised. Even in the air, Jean could see that he was already planning something. And his calmness and self-confidence flew away in a moment. He began to get insanely nervous because he knew how strong his opponent was. Lenly began his wind elemental magic. He shouted the familiar spell, Flat Blade. Dylan was also watching and smiling with satisfaction. Because Lenly was once again using her favorite wind blade to cut the stones to make them look like meteors. And this guy had a knack for it. It flashed through Jean's mind that Lenly had thought of combining two elemental spells into one. And he immediately put up a fire shield in front of him. But he was no longer sure that it would withstand this double force. But the force of the blade's impact was so strong, and Jean was hit so hard that he spun several circles in the air. Burn you, you devil! Jean shouted, throwing a new portion of spared fire. But Lenly had already cast the wind elemental spell slip, and managed to slip between Jean's flames. Delia looked at him with admiration, and she said that Lenly's sliding was getting better and better every time. Even the flames could not keep up with him. Lenly didn't let Jean gather his thoughts and launched the next spell, broken stones and wind blade, and launched a pile of stones towards Jean. Such was his cunning plan. But at the same time, Jean still thought what would that pile of rocks do to him. They wouldn't break through his super wall. But he shouted at Lenly that he could only fly in circles like a fly, and was afraid to come closer. At this point, Renard, who had been watching the battle closely, said that Jean's fire was strong, but it was suppressed by Lenly's stones. Gale began to shout that Jean was playing a shameless game, his flames not keeping up with Lenly's slide. That's why he is luring him to fight in close combat. But Jean provoked Lenly by saying that people with the wind element can only run away. This was also part of Jean's plan. Lenly suddenly flew up to Jean's face for a second and looked into his eyes as if into his soul. And he cheerfully exclaimed that if Jean wanted to fight in close combat, he would keep his distance closer. Jean, looking him in the eye, managed to scream out that this was the price Lenly had to pay for his arrogance. He was already angry enough, and he immediately fired a fireball right into Lenly's face. But Lenly didn't flinch and shouted out that he had to use the power of the earth to fight his fucking fire. So he threw all his small stones right into the fire. He laughed out loud that his flames had already passed this pile of stones. What a surprise. But Lenly said... Then to fight he will bring hundreds of thousands of stones. And the stones instantly became many times larger. A thousand stones. Ten thousand stones. The power of the earth element. If you want to fight in close combat, go ahead. And he threw all these stones right at Jean. Jean shouted back at him that if he was using the power of the mind to increase the number of stones, then he would just add some fireballs and destroy them. And he started to launch thousands of fireballs, which flew like balloons. There were incredibly many of them. Delia asked the boys if Lenly had really agreed to fight in close combat. The boys did not hear her. It's against the principles of combat, Renard shouted at her. Yale began to yell at Lenly. He began to play by the enemy's rules. The boys and Delia did not understand what was happening. Lenly's plan remained a complete mystery to them. Dulin watched and thought about it, and it turned out that a duel between the elements of earth and fire was very interesting. But Lenly summoning stones from one position, this is a disadvantage. And then Bebe the mouse suddenly appeared. She screamed hysterically. Who dared to attack her favorite boss? Dellen tried to stop her, but she rushed into the arena to help. In the end, Yale caught her by the tail and told her that her master was having a completely fair fight so she shouldn't run out there and interfere with him. Bebby finally calmed down after hearing this. She told Yale that he shouldn't think that he was so good that he could take her by the tail and stuck out her tongue. She also began to watch the battle patiently. Jean was throwing his fireballs like a fool and even managed to shout that Lenly had lost all his stones and his earth magic was low potential. 
He was provoking the boy as much as he could, getting excited. But he kept teasing him that he had used up all his magic and now he couldn't dodge. Linley cheerfully told him that he was wrong. And here was his counter-strike. He threw a terrible number of stones in Jean's direction. There were so many of them. They came in a continuous stream. No one had ever seen anything like it. The crowd in the bushes gasped. Lindley managed to throw Jean that he had been holding back his magic until now to see how much damage he could do to him. Now it was his turn to attack for real. But Jean wasn't one to be intimidated, and he asked him sarcastically if Lindley had the power to do it. A storm of rubble, rotational lift! Lindley suddenly shouted the spell. Millions of small, sharp pebbles hit Jean's body with all their might, breaking through his super defense. At that moment, Jean fell helplessly on the gravel. His cap flew off to who knows where he lay there and did not move. The crowd cheered. Jean could not get up, but he could speak. He asked Lin Lei if he still had any strength left. Lin Lei replied that he had to expend a lot of energy to break through his fire. The defeated Zhang continued to lie there silently and powerlessly, looking at the sky, which was all he could do at that moment. He was not wearing any clothes. Everything was torn to rags. His body was covered with soot and scratches. But at least he was alive. And then Jean shouted to Lenly, Catch! And he threw him his crystal personalized card. The gold I promised you is all on this magical crystal card. You can go and get it yourself. I lost. He smiled. Lenly deftly caught the card and looked at it happily. He had never seen so much money. And he had managed to earn it for Little Horton. His dream had come true. But in a moment he became serious and told John that he was a great opponent. He had learned a lot from him in this fight. But if John wanted to consider this match a training match, he would not take the money. After listening to him, Gene shouted that Lenley could not cancel the deal and that he shouldn't forget that he still hates him. John finally stood up through the strength and pain, taking off the rest of his rags, and continued to tell Lenley to keep the 10,000, because when he became stronger, he would find him and they would fight again. And he limped back to the dormitory. Delin came at the boy with a hiss. She muttered that first ranked attacks, then melee, then allow an attack. The guy was testing himself, wasn't he? But she chirped contentedly that Lenly knew how to combine the elements of earth and wind, and he had perfect control of the blade, so he had no opponents in his year of training. Lenly told her that, Thank goodness no one had been looking at him for a while when he wasn't working at his best. Dellen burst out laughing. Because then all the snotty spectators of the whole academy started coming out of the bushes, shouting at him that it was great, and he was so naive. They asked him to teach them the art of fighting and magic. Baby the Mouse ran happily to his boss and Yale collected money for the betting on the fight. Jean hobbled to the top of a small hill and stood looking at the horizon and the starry sky. Everything finally calmed down inside him. He thought that so little time had passed, and Lenly had only used magic to surpass him. He didn't even have to come up with a strategy. He was infinitely upset about this, because he was no longer the best. Lenly sat on the steps of the house and looked at the crystal card with interest, because those ten thousand warmed his heart. Just then, Bibi started to take the card away from him. She decided that she would buy thousands of chicken legs and eat to her heart's content. But Lenly took the card out of her hands. The guy thought, Ten thousand is a lot of money, but how will it help his family? But it was not enough to solve all the issues, the guy summarized. What am I supposed to do with it? Lenly said out loud. Yale, who was drinking coffee nearby, replied that he, for example, really liked sculptures. Then you need to think of other ways to make money, Lenley replied. Yale replied that this year Lenley had practiced the flat blade spell and had to make a lot of sculptures. Yale thought about it and offered to take them away and sell them at a very good price. He even knew how to do it, but Lenley stormed out and flatly refused. He explained that his skill was not very good. Dellen listened to their conversation and thought that with his level of skill, he should be ashamed of himself. Even if the sculpture is bought for a few gold pieces, it will not be enough. If a sculpture doesn't cost hundreds of thousands, it means it's not worthy, Lenley explained gloomily. Then I didn't offer anything, Yale reassured him. But Lenley's mood was extremely nasty. 
The boys went outside and saw Captain Hillman walking toward them. Yale realized that they would have a conversation for two, so he greeted him and said goodbye. Hillman said that he had to go home to take care of a lot of things, so he came to say goodbye to Lenley. Lindley pulled out a crystal card from his pocket and smilingly handed it to him, asking him to take it. Hillman did not understand what was happening. Looking at it, he saw that there were 10,000 gold pieces. His eyes rounded. Lenley explained that it wasn't much, but he would find ways to make money. Captain Hillman exclaimed that the boy was a real magician. He was incredibly happy with the card. But he admitted that he had never held so much money in his hands in his entire life and asked where the boy had gotten it. Lenley explained that he had earned it in a fair fight and there was nothing to worry about. But he was embarrassed because he was not used to being praised so much. I'm Hillman. I will not let young Master Lanley down, the captain exclaimed, putting his hands on his shoulders. Master Nog, Lin Lay has really matured, thought Hillman as he addressed Nog in his mind. Captain Hillman turned around and left. All his life he had had the opportunity to watch Lin Lay grow up, and no one knew when their next meeting would be. Earning this will be a big problem. I won't be able to earn through fighting every day all the time, the guy thought. And then Yale, who was standing around the corner as if hearing his thoughts, asked him what he was thinking. Have you been eavesdropping on me again? Lenley burst out. Yale began to calm him down, apologizing and explained that he was there to help Lenley like a true friend. Meanwhile, Hillman walked through the forest and thought that he probably wouldn't tell Lin Lei the whole truth about his father for now. Joel whispered something in Lin Lei's ear, and they went to the wind classroom. When they entered the classroom, they saw Teacher Trey and their classmates. Lenley turned to the teacher and said that he wanted to train on the Magic Beast mountain range. Trey was furious. You're only in your third year, he shouted. He couldn't calm down and stop yelling at Lenley, and the rest of the class froze in horror. Because Lenley is reckless, one of the students shouted. He's only a third-year student and he wants to go so far, others shouted. Training on the Magic Beast Mountain Range is only allowed for fifth-year students before the final exams, explained Trey, who was strongly against it. But it's Lin Lei himself, one of the students exclaimed again. Everyone at the academy loved Linley for his kind heart and extraordinary abilities. No wonder he thinks he's so experienced that he can reach the spine of the magical beasts, someone else said. And then two unknown men entered the classroom. One of them looked at Lenley and asked if he was the one who had defeated the strong Jean in the last battle. But Trey could not calm down. He shouted that the purpose of the academy was to train future mages of the kingdom, not dead men. Linley tried to calm everyone down by assuring them that he would not die there and would definitely come back alive. Meanwhile, Trey calmed down a bit and asked him if he knew exactly what this place was. The mountain range of magical beasts? He looked at Lenley with a scorching gaze, and he began to tell the whole class that even the most advanced magician sometimes cannot return from this place. These mountains are inhabited by magical beasts that fight each other. Cruel monsters destroy the weak to become stronger. Many people died there. In some places, you can find monsters of the 8th and ninth level. Sometimes even monsters of the saint level live there. But he gritted his teeth, saying that in short, Lenley could not even hope to get permission from him to go on this trip, because he was too young and inexperienced. So Lenley decided to convince him by showing him something. He shouted the water element spell, Icicle and the air temperature in the classroom instantly turned sub-zero. Suddenly, a professor came into the classroom and saw a winter landscape with icicles and snow, frost on all the walls and students. He asked Trey, Who is that guy? Pointing to Lenley. Lenley was standing on his desk, and icicles had grown all over the classroom, and the walls were covered in ice, the temperature dropping quite rapidly. Trey stammered and tried to explain to the professor that Lenley wanted something that was beyond his capabilities as a third-year student, and he refused him. The professor told him that he hadn't done anything wrong, but he had been told something. The professor looked at the guy and exclaimed that it must be Lin Lei. He remembered him from last year's match. He went on to explain that he had been following him, but had accidentally overheard their conversation, and he unfolded the academic newspaper with the headline, Genius defeated genius on the front page. 
It's the latest breaking news, and in addition to the headlines, every page has a detailed analysis of the fight. The professor told everyone in the paper. Even the senior-level viewer watched it. After Dixie, Lenley is one of the most talented people, he continued. Dellen mockingly asked Lenley if he was really still lagging behind Dixie, but Lenley was embarrassed and explained that he didn't even know that everyone knew. Lenley timidly explained to the professor that he had just used the icicle to check something out, but the professor attacked Trey, accusing him of being less prepared than his students. He announced to everyone that Lenley was definitely an extraordinary third-level wizard. And if he is in such a hurry to go to the mountain range of magical beasts, he must have some serious reasons for it. The boy hesitated, and Dellen whispered with a giggle that there are many magical beasts living there, whose skins are worth hundreds of thousands of coins. It was me who suggested you go there to work, and you can also practice there. But you can't answer them like that, can you? She laughed at the boy. Duleen mumbled that there are beasts that cost hundreds of gold, and there are those that cost thousands. But they are not very smart. He can handle them, and she can be there to help him. Something happened in my family, the boy finally answered the professor. But I'm strong enough to survive on the mountain range of magical beasts. The professor asked him again and warned him not to be too confident. Boy, if something happens, no one will be able to help you. Do you still want to go there? Yes, Lenley answered firmly, and the professor agreed. He turned to the class and announced that he accepted Lenley's request and allowed him to go to the Magic Beast Mountain Range. The Magical Beast Mountain Range was a series of mountains with sharp peaks and impregnable foothills, and it was not easy to enter. The mountains were young and tall, covered with dense forest. No one knew for sure the number of animal and plant species that inhabited them, their levels and ranks. Those who returned from there were considered real heroes. As the day came to an end and the night fell, in the courtyard of dormitory, number 109 stood several beautiful tall sculptures that Lenley had made over the course of a year with a flat blade. Suddenly, several silhouettes of strangers jumped over the railing of the dormitory balcony, and it was impossible to see their faces in the darkness. They were running through the bedroom where Georg was sleeping sweetly. Near the stairs to the second floor, they all froze and pressed against the wall, because they heard the rustling of tree leaves. Then they slipped past Renard, who was sleeping dreamily. Then they saw Lenly in his room, sleeping soundly, hugging Bebe the mouse. On the table in Lenly's room was a sculpture of a dragon's head that he had been working on for the last few weeks, and it was wonderful and very similar to the real thing. The strangers put it quietly into a bag. One of the strangers whispered in a very familiar voice that he had finally found it. The other stranger asked him that this was actually his dormitory, and when would he stop partying here? The mask was off. It was Yale. What's wrong with setting a relay race? I'm bored, Yale replied. He ordered everyone to quickly pick up the other sculptures and get out of here before the rest of them woke up. Yale slyly whispered that it was because Lenley had not allowed him to sell these amazing sculptures during the day. They quietly and unobtrusively loaded all the sculptures onto the cart. One of them asked if we could take them to the Prowl Gallery tomorrow. Yes, this gallery specializes in auctions, Yale answered. Early in the morning, the strangers were all ready with the cart in the part of town where the Prowl Gallery was located. There were two men standing in the gallery. One of them greeted the Count and told him that there would be a lot of work today. The old Count looked at the exhibit and said that it was a very beautiful work, but he did not see the soul in it. The man began to convince him, saying that this was not true, that every detail in this work was worked out to the smallest detail, and asked him not to criticize it. Meanwhile, Yale and his boys were bringing in a large wooden box, afraid of accidentally smashing it against something. The man aggressively started shouting at Yale, demanding that he watch his language, and asked if he even knew who he was in front of. But Yale did not care. He was never afraid of anyone. Yale looked at him calmly and asked him if he was not just a count. The man who accompanied the count started to shout, but the count waved his hand to silence him, and then the count finally got the dragon head sculpture out of the box, and he was completely delighted to see it. The count began to examine every detail of it. He was a great connoisseur of art. 
and knew his way around. His wealth allowed him to buy worthy pieces for his own collection. It was his life's work. When he finished the inspection, he told Yale that it was not enough. The guy started shouting that you know what you are trying to do. The Count put his hand on his shoulder and calmly said that the fact that he could express his emotions in his product was very good. Looking at Yale's violent reaction, he continued to examine the dragon's head in detail and asked why the dragon's scales were so dense. A round knife is usually used for this purpose, and a flat knife for the top layer. Even if you are careful, it is still impossible to achieve such softness, said the Count, moving his hand over the sculpture. Finally, the Count asked how much Yale wanted for it. The boy, hearing this, began to think quickly. If he told him two hundred gold coins, would he be interested in letting go or not? Instead, the Count wondered how the boy could have used only one carving tool. But it's impossible. The curves of the stone and their rises. How is it possible with just one round knife? This was the first time he had ever seen anything like this in his life, and by such a young artist. After a little thought and calculation, the Count offered Yale two thousand gold pieces, if only he would not go to the auction. These words brought tears to Yale's eyes. He expected to sell the sculpture for ten times less. The Count looked at him silently and thought that perhaps two thousand was not enough. That's why the boy was crying. But he blurted out that he was willing to pay three thousand, and that was a reasonable price for this work. Wild delight, surprise, and happiness gripped Yale, and he quickly handed the statue to its new owner before he changed his mind. He couldn't stand it and burst into tears, explaining that every time a young master finds a way to make money, he cries with happiness. Although our Lin Lei is little known now, he will become a great master someday, and then you will sell his sculpture for a lot of money, ten times more expensive, he exclaimed. The Count calmly replied that although this sculpture is interesting, the path to greatness is not so easy, boy. But he was shocked that Lin Lei was only fourteen years old and had the skills of an old master of venerable age. Meanwhile, at the Magic Academy, several unidentified men came unannounced to Trey's classroom. They apologized for distracting him from his training and said that their boss wanted to see Lenly. Trey was shocked by their visit, but he said that the boy was not here. The strangers began to shout that they had an emergency. And then the professor appeared, and the men rushed to him, asking him to take them to Lin Lei. They had a very urgent matter. But the professor explained that Lin Lei was most likely on the mountain range of magical beasts and was not really at the Magic Academy. Meanwhile, Linley had reached the mountain range, and it was a very difficult journey. He had been walking there for two days. Looking at the ridge, he exclaimed in satisfaction that the third-ranked dual-element mage Lin Lei was starting his training at the Magic Beast Mountain Range. And then it suddenly started to rain. Lin Lei and Bibi decided to use magic to protect themselves from the rain. Neither of them wanted to get wet and get sick. The boy cheerfully said the wind element spell windshield, and they both found themselves under a magical green protective dome. But then Delon appeared and began to scold him, saying that it turns out you can use magic for all sorts of things, and it's so convenient. Lenly asked her guiltily, Isn't she afraid of the rain or something? Delene kept going and said that when Lenly climbed the mountain range of magical beasts, he would become the lowest link in the food chain. Therefore, he should actually use his powers very wisely and not play around. The boy sincerely apologized to her for his prank and continued to walk quickly. But suddenly he noticed that everything around him looked strange and depressing. The forest was dark, it was cold and damp, and there was a smoke in the air. Delon did not stop talking and monotonously lectured the boy that instead of training and earning money, he should think about how to stay alive because his magical power and even his breath could save his life. She could not calm down, because she sincerely loved the boy like a little brother. Baby's mouse started flying forward, and Lenly warned her that she would only be able to see thirty meters ahead at most, so she shouldn't run too far. But Baby started running very fast. The boy started chasing after her and could not catch up. He started shouting at her to stop her, but she was already picking up speed. It became clear to everyone that something was happening up ahead. 
Linley suddenly realized that she had really found something. Kneeling down and touching the ground with his hand, he began to summon the wind. He quickly recited a wind detection spell. Detecting wind. Green wind find the magical aura. Dylan flew over to him and said that this wind spell looks quite useful. What did he detect? And then Lenly saw a level one magical beast. It was a bubble rabbit, about 60 meters away from them. Dylan whispered that Lenly had used the right spell and that he should always be aware of his surroundings because there were other magical creatures here, so he had to be vigilant. Lenly looked closely, and a little further away he saw another magical beast, a second-level earth scorpion. The boy asked Delling how he could defeat these two beasts. Deling was also looking at the magic beasts carefully, and she whispered that something was wrong. Suddenly she shouted out to Lin Lei to watch very carefully, because this is earth detection magic and she told him to feel the earth giving him information about the enemy. And Lin Lei concentrated and felt with his whole body the battle that was taking place in the southwest direction. The girl continued that now Lin Lei would not be able to use the detection spell as easily as breathing, because his rank would not be enough, so he had to focus on survival. Let's go see the battle. And they quickly left. Finally, when they got closer... They saw three unfamiliar warriors fighting with swords in the air. All three of them were fighting a fifth-level crystal foot-and-mouth disease magical beast. They were two fourth-level warriors, Marte and Cover, and a fifth-level warrior, Dashta. Together, they unanimously cast a fifth-level spell, Windshield, to protect the team. And after it worked, all three of them skillfully jumped on the back of the foot-and-mouth disease and put their weapons into it and together they managed to kill it, and the beast fell dead to the ground with a roar. The warriors shouted furiously about their victory and were very pleased. Having skillfully cut the body of the foot-and-mouth disease, they took out one magic crystal. Dylan quickly told Lenly not to interfere in the affairs of the people of the mountain range. If it did not concern them, he should just leave quietly. The girl explained to him that it was a fifth-level mage and two warriors and it was clear that they made a great team, because they managed to kill a fifth-level beast. Then one of the warriors suddenly called Lenly's name. The boy looked around and was very surprised and asked Delin how he knew him. She explained that he was just very close to them, and now he was caught by the enemy's revealing wind. The stranger called out his name again and waved to him. Lenly looked at him in surprise and did not know what to say. It's me, Dashed, from the wind element we studied together. The stranger suddenly exclaimed. And Lenly finally remembered his thesis class and how classes two, three, four, and five always sat together, and Dasht was indeed sitting behind him. Dasht cheerfully exclaimed that his partners were there, and they were getting the crystal out of the magical beast's body, and pointed to his companions. Finally, Lenly was able to squeeze something out of himself, which is not surprising since Dasht is wearing the cloak of the Magic Academy. These two are Cover and Marte. They're my training buddies, introduced Dashte's friends. And this is a friend of mine from the Academy. He recently became famous there. And now he's at the same level as Dixie, introduced him to Dashte's friends. The guy said that he was on the same level as Dixie. That's very, very cool. Dashte exclaimed that if Lenly joined them, they would become many times stronger and together they would be able to kill magical beasts without any problems. And if they were lucky enough to kill a seventh-level beast, they could definitely get several tens of thousands of gold coins, which was a huge amount of money. He urged Lin Lei to join them all. Lin Lei couldn't believe his ears and kept asking him if it was really possible to find a seventh-level magic beast. Suddenly, an arrow whistled in the air. Dashti's body instantly tensed, his eyes turned glassy and the arrow instantly passed through his chest. Blood poured out of his mouth and he tried to say something. It's an ambush, be careful. Dashte whispered his last words. Lenly was terrified, holding Dashte's bloody body in his arms with an arrow sticking out of it. He was bleeding to death. Dashte was silent, his face was pale, his eyes were wide open and his body was limp. Only the wind played with his hair. The boys instantly became alarmed at the horrific scene they saw and shouted, Who did this? Marty shouted with all his might that the murderer should show himself to him immediately. He challenged him to a fight. It all happened in an instant. 
Lenly was out of his mind and furious with anger. Deline tried to calm him down somehow. What the hell? The boy shouted to the whole clearing. Meanwhile, Delin began to carefully examine the arrow, and after examining it, she said that it was 100% spelled with speed and accuracy, which means that the mage who shot it was definitely a fifth-level mage, and his advantage is precisely in surprise and location, so Lenly won't be able to beat him now. According to my calculations, the next attack will be whispered Delin. Just then, Marty began to attack the bush, shouting for the stranger to come out now. And at that moment, the next arrow silently hit Marty's body. Delin started shouting for Lenly to get out of there right now. This person has sixth-level skills. You can't fight him, she shouted. Suddenly, someone in the bushes said with a bow, there are two more left. The one with the red scarf is a good target. Lenly had a red scarf tied around his neck, and at that moment he finally realized that it was getting really dangerous. And then several arrows hit the trees that grew on the sides where Lenly was standing. Finally, a stranger came out of the bushes wearing a mask, and disgustedly began to search the corpses of the boys, looking for trophies. But he was indignant out loud that the two still managed to escape. He found a bag of magic crystals on Dashti's body, but there were very few of them. Suddenly the bushes near the stranger stirred, and he broke away from his search and became alert. The silhouette of a strange man suddenly appeared in front of him. It was Dixie. He was already fifteen years old. He was considered the most talented, hardy, and outstanding student of the Magical Academy. The boy was dressed in expensive armor decorated with gold. His staff was of unprecedented beauty. You attacked those who had just climbed the mountain range. How brave and shameless, Dixie said. The stranger shouted two more spells in a rage. Speed! Accuracy! This trash doesn't need to know my name, Dixie shouted back at him. And in return, Dixie shouted the spell Thunderstorm. The stranger thought in confusion. Is this magic intended not only to stop arrows, but also to attack? The spell struck the stranger's body with such force that he was thrown hundreds of meters into the forest. Dixie calmly looked at the result of his magic without even blinking an eye. He was absolutely confident in his strength and abilities. Lindley and Bibi, who were standing on the sidelines, watched the battle with delight. Dixie asked if the archer chasing him was really Lin Lei. He took out a note from his pocket and read it again. It said that my classmate Lin Lei, who will be at the Magic Beast Mountain Range at the same time as you, if you meet him, be sure to help him. It was signed by Delia, who was Dixie's own sister. Dixie couldn't understand why his little sister was so worried about this guy. He had never heard her make such requests, but he was surprised by her behavior. Delia's brother was looking into the thick of the forest and thinking that with such power, he was not worthy to be like me. But his decision was not so bad. Knowing that he could not defeat me, he ran away. It was smart. Still have to see what this dual element mage is going to do on the mountain range of magical beasts. Dixie thought. Lindley was making his way through the dense forest when he heard a rustling sound and a pile of stones flew at him, hitting his body painfully. Earth scorpions, Lindley exclaimed, surprised. Huge earth scorpions appeared on the lawn in front of them. Dellen quickly caught up to him and explained that the earth scorpions are very weak and the appearance of Lindley makes them run away. They really scattered when they saw the boy and Lindley noticed the corpse of a man. Magic Beast Mountain Range, what kind of a scary place is this? whispered the shocked boy. Delon flew over and examined the body as well, and explained to him that the wound on the dead man's body was small, and it looked like he had been stabbed right in the heart. He was a strong warrior, a killer. This is a mountain range of magical beasts. Here you either kill beasts for a long time and a lot, or you kill one person and earn a lot of easy money. What do you choose? she asked Lenly. But then she exploded and started screaming that Lenly was a big idiot after all, and that coolness was not his style. You finally need to realize that this is not a place where you can trust people. Even if a person looks friendly, they might be hiding something, the girl said. Lenly irritably cut her off not to worry, and he would finish his training. After all, he is Linley Baruch. On this ridge of magical beasts, the boy faced the brutal murder of his classmate, 
he finally realized that if he wanted to survive, he had to become stronger. Now, he is more careful than ever. Linley shouted the magic spell, Wind of Detection, loudly again. And suddenly it revealed a level three magical beast. A boar. This boar will be good practice for me, he thought. But then he was surprised to see that the boar was chasing someone. It was the silhouette of a girl, running away from him with all her might. Looking closely, he noticed that the girl was wearing a red scarf and her clothes were torn. Suddenly, the girl tripped over a stone and fell to the ground screaming in pain. Lenly rushed to her aid as fast as he could. But the boar had already caught up with her and was about to attack. With all his strength, the boy kicked the boar's body. But their strengths were unequal. Still, he managed to knock the boar down and knock it over for a while. Then the boar found the strength to strike back at the boy, but Lenly managed to dodge it. The girl quickly recovered from her fright and ran toward Lenly. The boy asked her if she was okay and how she felt. She hid behind his back and trembled all over. The wild boar stood in front of them, its red eyes filled with rage growling loudly. Lenly did not hesitate and shouted out the wind elemental spell. Glide. Grabbing the girl's hand, Lenly began to glide along the wind stream with her to fly away from the boar as far and high as possible. This beast is of the earth element, so I'll pay it back with earth spells. The boy quickly thought of an idea. And Lenly shouted the earth elemental spell Earthquake, and stones flew at the boar's body. The boar began to scream furiously throughout the forest. Then Lenly shouted the wind elemental support spell Tornado, and the boar was quickly spun around in the wind. The third spell that Lenly shouted was the Pursuit. At that moment, even Bebe the mouse rushed to his aid. Unable to withstand the power of all the spells, the boar's body fell to the ground with a thud, and Bebe began to kick it with all her might like a ball, bouncing all over its body. Not bad. Your opponent was a level three beast, Delon summarized, having watched this fight the whole time. You're so strong, the stranger shouted and rushed to hug him. Lenly pulled away from her in fright, because he wasn't used to talking to girls. It was just a third-level boar, he answered the girl proudly. The girl was completely delighted with him, and explained that her partners had met this boar. But unfortunately, he killed them all, and then Lenly appeared and quickly and easily defeated him. Only I survived, but I got lost in this forest, she explained. That's the reason, thought Lenly. But I can survive here alone, please, let me... She continued. To come with you, the girl exclaimed loudly. Lenly calmly replied that she could do as she pleased. Thank you, the girl cried out and threw her arms around him again. Dylan was watching this conversation from the sidelines. All the emotions were visible on her face. She was clicking her tongue and rolling her eyes. It was clear that she did not quite like the stranger. Hey, don't you think she's suspicious? Why would a girl like that go to such a dangerous place? She asked the boy nervously. You're getting paranoid, Delon. Lenly laughed. Even though this is a mountain range of magical beasts, not all people can be cold-blooded. Today I helped someone. And tomorrow someone will help me, he explained to Delon. Dylan thought that he had swapped her for some stranger, but he was right. But for some reason she felt very bad about it. But anyway, be careful, boy, she said. Hmm, Delon doesn't like that, the boy noticed, looking at Delon's unusual behavior. And then the stranger girl offered to cook some food. She wanted to thank everyone. And she was very hungry. Everyone agreed. So Lenly made a fire and cut the boar into pieces of meat. And after a while, the fragrant meat was roasting, the aroma of which spread throughout the forest. I love roast pork, squeaked Bebe the mouse happily. She was very hungry because she had not eaten all this time. The stranger girl also ate the meat with great appetite. She was also very hungry. Are you hungry? Lenly asked her again. Yes, when my boys died protecting me, I ran for a long time and I didn't eat anything during that time. She answered. You are safe now. I will protect you, Lenly promised her. And then she noticed a small crystal in the piece of meat she was eating, and it began to glow. The guy looked at the crystal carefully and said that he thought it was a third-level crystal so it probably wouldn't be very expensive, and he should continue hunting animals. He went on to say that he had heard that level seven and eight beasts could not be found on the outskirts of this forest, but he thought that was a complete lie. As long as they don't meet them, everything will be fine.
Lenly reassured the frightened girl. How wonderful, she replied with delight, looking at the boy with joyful eyes. Night came, everyone went to bed, and the girl sat down next to Lenly and hugged him. She was very cold. The boy thought she was really helpless, but he could not understand Delen, who thought she was suspicious. The night passed calmly and without incident, and finally dawn came. Everyone was still sleeping very soundly, but no one felt that terrible magical beasts were quietly creeping up on the sleeping Lenly. The girl woke up and opened her eyes and for a moment was numb from what she saw. Linlay wolves, wolves, she began to scream with all her might. The wolves surrounded her from all sides near the tree where she was sleeping, and suddenly someone grabbed her clothes and pulled her up the tree. It was Lenly because he and Bebby had spotted the wolves earlier. Stay in this tree and don't come down, he ordered the girl. The boy began to say a spell of earth element magic, and a glow instantly appeared in his hands. Then he shouted a fifth-level spell, Earth Armor, and struck at the wolves, B.B. fearlessly following him. The power of a fifth-level spell should have been enough to defeat these air wolves. How can you use a fifth-level spell when you're only a third leveler? B.B. asked him, surprised. Dylan flew up to them and said that Yale had just influenced the boy's strength. Did you notice that, Dylan? Lenly asked her in amazement. And Lenly remembered that once in the dormitory, Yale had explained that they all had limited powers, but there were stronger spells they could use, showing them a book with magic spells. But this can't be true, the whole class shouted at him. It doesn't work like in business if you can't do wholesale, then do small wholesale, Yale explained to everyone. He meant that you can simplify a high-level spell by turning it into a low-level spell. For example, if it is supposed to cover the whole body, you can make it cover only a part of it. If the spell had a large radius of damage, then now the radius will be smaller, Yale continued to explain. I managed to get the senior students' notebooks after I study them all. I will be able to use simplified magic. Each book will cost a hundred gold pieces, Yale announced. The class began to resent him. Yale laughed and said that he would give Lin Lei a free book on the earth element because he was the face of their business. And thus, Lin Lei was able to learn simplified spells of a higher level of magic. Although it was not of very high quality, it was still strong enough. Delin listened to him carefully and said that Lin Lei's armor was supposed to look like a stone suit, but in fact, only a few parts of his body had stone protection. And thank God it was only airwolves and not someone stronger. And I thought you were still mad and not talking to me, the boy replied to her. Snotty! Delen yelled back at him. She jumped in the air and loudly announced to everyone that it was too early for them to relax. But the boy suddenly heard something unusual and said that something was affecting his wind observation. Was it the wind wolves again? After thinking about it, he came to the conclusion that these wind wolves can use the vortex through their claws, almost without standing on the ground. That is why they were not noticed by the observation. I am no longer the same Lenly from Wushan Village, watch Delin, as I will teach these wind wolves a lesson, the boy shouted. Bib the mouse started shouting that she saw a whole pack of wind wolves, and then Lenly shouted the spell Earthquake and commanded everyone to go forward quickly. A pack of terrifying wind wolves was coming at them, each of them several times bigger than an ordinary person. They were red in color, had terrible fangs, and were very aggressive. Wind blade, Lenly shouted a spell, channeling magic into the bodies of the wind wolves. An incredible stream of magic immediately rose into the air and began to spin everything around. Lenly also rose into the air and began to spin in a somersault, increasing his magical power. When confronting ordinary wind wolves, the best defense is to climb a tree, he thought. But if you are attacked by a flat blade of a wind wolf, then trees are cut like paper, he concluded. Dylan exclaimed in amazement that he could not dodge the wind wolf's blade with a slip, only if he was really going to die. You can try with your last strength. The boy instantly concentrated on his mind power and shouted the spell Earth Armor full power, and his body was completely covered with a stone suit. This strong spell finally released its fierce power, and Lenly, wearing an unusual stone suit, flew high into the sky. Delen shouted at the top of her voice to the boy that he was in mortal danger and that he must have released all his spell power. 
She was amazed to see Lenly kick the Wind Wolf high into the sky with one kick. It was definitely a level five spell. At this time, Lenly decided to end the Wind Wolves before the spell lost its power. He was more interested in testing it and comparing the results, and the Wind Wolves did not have time to attack him. Suddenly, Bebe the mouse flew past him with a squeal and crashed loudly into the stones behind him, and Lenly was frightened to realize that she had accidentally fallen under the spell. And then the Wind Wolves began to run away in an unknown direction, howling and whining. Lenly could not understand why they were afraid. The air was pierced by the hysterical scream of a strange girl, and Lenly was frightened to remember that she was still sitting in the tree where he had left her. Turning to her, he saw that she had climbed high up on a tree branch and was screaming for help with all her might, and all the wolves who had fled from him were gathered at the tree's branches. They were growling and scratching, trying to get to her somehow. Lenly ran as fast as he could to her, shouting to her not to be afraid. He realized that in another moment she would fall right into their laps, for the wolves had already begun to gnaw at the tree trunk and shake it with their strong paws. The girl was happy to see Lenly rushing to save her. The boy shouted at her not to move. He was going to save her. Dellen watched in irritation and muttered that he was trying to save her even in danger. She did not like it very much. And the moment the boy approached the wolves, the worst thing happened. His stone armor began to crumble into small stones right in front of everyone. And the wolves certainly noticed it. Lenly only had time to think. Why the hell did this happen at that moment? Dellen was terrified. Her heart sank inside her, and she thought that it was really dissipating, probably because of the damage caused by the wind blades. The wolves were only half a meter away, and they opened their mouths and prepared to tear Lenly to pieces. Lenly was screaming and flying straight at them with absolutely no defense. Suddenly an idea flashed through his mind to use the spell Gravity Field, which would make all the attackers feel a sense of insane pressure on their bodies, and he quickly shouted it. Dylan shouted to him that he had remembered and used the gravitational field in time. It was a great job. And instantly, all the wind wolves around them fell to the ground and began to whine loudly, as if they were being pressed to the ground by something invisible. They couldn't even move. Lenly quickly got to his feet and thought that in another moment he would probably be dead. Dylan told him at that moment that using such spells in an emergency was the best method, but using the gravity field was very exhausting, and therefore Lenly could not hold on to the power of these spells for long. They had to be finished eventually. Lenly heard everything she said and shouted that while they were on the ground, he had to kill them quickly. Raising his hands in the middle of his body, he shouted a new powerful spell, Area Attack. A pink glow appeared in his hands and he concentrated all his strength and struck at the wolves lying down. A terrifying explosion of pink fire immediately followed. A moment later, when the smoke cleared, Dellen and Lenly saw the bodies of the dead wind wolves all around them. Dellen happily exclaimed to the battle-impressed boy that this was a great job and that Lenly was most likely an expert. She was very pleased with her student. The boy listened to her in silence. He was very exhausted. His face had cuts, his clothes were torn and dirty. He wanted only one thing to rest for a little while, just a minute. It was the first time in his life that he had fought so many magical beasts at once, but despite his fatigue, he was pleased with himself. And then he heard a familiar voice again. It was the still screaming stranger girl who continued to hang from the tree with her last strength. Lenly finally calmly took her down from the damn tree. The girl happily began to admire him for being able to defeat so many treacherous wolves and save her. And then she added that he could get one magic crystal from each wolf's body, and he would finally become rich. But the boy had a modest nature, and he answered her hesitantly that he was not that strong, and this battle had taken a lot of his strength. He was tired. With a sigh, Lenly bowed his head. His thoughts began to spin, and he felt that he was going to faint. Dellen, frightened for her student, began to fly to his aid. Suddenly a knife blade flashed in the air. Dellen rushed to Lenly, screaming. Everything happened in a split second. The boy was looking at the glint of his metal like a mesmerized man. And in that moment the blade plunged right into Lenly's chest. 
It was held by a strange girl, whose eyes glittered with anger and predation. Her recent smile changed to a savage snarl, her face spattered with the boy's blood. She hissed to him that she would like to play with him longer, but her powers scared her, and all she could say to him was, I'm sorry. A fountain of red blood instantly spurted from Lenly's chest, and he began to faint desperately. The little murderer burst out laughing. At that moment, the words that this girl had said, that she had lost all her partners, and asked him to stay with them because she could not survive alone, ran through his mind. And Lenly, looking at her animal face and the bloody knife, whispered, Did she really kill her friends? The little animal replied that it was true, and he finally realized it. But he would not get a prize for this guess. And she started laughing all over the clearing. The boy was lying on the ground with his eyes wide open, and Dellen rushed to him, trying to do something to save him. But at that moment, something incredible began to happen. Lenly's body glowed with a purple glow, and he began to rise from the ground into the air. The boy came to his senses and began to think that he was dying right now. He could not believe himself. The little murderer looked at him furiously. Shouting what an asshole he was, she rushed to him with a knife to finish him off. And then Bibi the mouse appeared in the air in front of her. Her eyes were burning with a red glow, and the same purple glow shone around her body. The mouse screamed frantically and rushed at the girl. But she could only think, why is it so small and so strong? Suddenly the silhouette of a certain mercenary appeared in the air. He deflected the mouse's attack, and it flew tumbling toward Lenly's body. The killer girl knew him. She screamed at him, Who the hell are you to take my prey? It's all mine. And the stranger shouted at her that she was number 13 and now owed him. Dellen could only exclaim with the impression that they were from the same group. Dellen rushed to Lenly, who had fallen back to the ground in a heap of blood and begged him to use his magic. She reminded him of their first time guiding the boy and using magic and promised to use her magic to stop his bleeding. Dellen was crying out loud. Holding his head up, Dellen tried to bring him back to consciousness, repeating that she would help him but that he had to deal with his enemies on his own, and they were right in front of him. At this time, the killer girl promised number four thirty percent of the loot, if he would just finish Lenly. Dellen kept screaming and lifting the boy's body. Bibi the mouse, who had regained consciousness, also tried to bring him back to life. It was all hell on the lawn. And then a stranger pulled out a dagger and ran up to Lenly and began to cut his shirt and skin off his chest. From the terrible pain, the guy instantly regained consciousness. Lenly grabbed his hand, which was holding the bloody dagger. The boy stood up in pain and shouted to Dellen that he was fine and not to worry about him. Dellen almost cried with happiness. Meanwhile, the little murderer saw Lenly's resurrection and shouted to Number Four to kill him as soon as possible. Number Four, with a beastly face, provoked Lenly by shouting at him to show him a magic trick, then threatened him by saying that Lenly had no idea how many people like him he had killed on the Magic Beast mountain range. He used all the arguments he knew. Lenly looked at him silently, standing firmly on his feet. As he looked at the stranger, he thought that by all indications he was a hundred percent warrior and this meant that the fight would not be easy. Gathering the remnants of his strength together and enduring the pain of his wound, he concentrated and launched a gravity field spell at number four, and magic began to pour out of his hands with a pink glow. It completely knocked the bewildered stranger off his feet. He hadn't expected Lenly to have any strength left. His legs began to become soft and sink to the ground. The stranger did not understand what was happening. With his whole clumsy body, he felt an unreasonable weight, as if some invisible rock was pushing him to the ground. At one point, he broke down and fell, sprawled out on the ground like a crushed spider. Number four stubbornly tried to get up. It was clear that he was unfamiliar with this type of magic. He could not understand what was happening to his body and legs. The intense pressure made it hard for him to breathe. He muttered that he did not understand why this spell was so strong, but still, he stubbornly tried to get up, and using all his strength, he began to get to his feet. And then the stranger decided that he had to solve the situation with cunning. Looking at Lenly, 
He hissed that this magic was stupid, and even under its weight he would still be able to attack Lenly. But Lenly instantly noticed this plan, and rushed with Bebe, the belligerent mouse, to the enemy to prevent him from using anything against them. They were preemptively defeated. They realized that he was not a novice magician who could be trifled with like that. But Lin Lei Baruch, the guy began to attack the stranger with all his might. These mysterious people were members of the same group, and it was because of them that Lin Lei almost died. But at the right moment, using earth element magic healing, Lin Lei and Bebe counterattacked the stranger. The mouse bit into number four's arm like a real angry beast, shouting squirtle. It growled with glowing eyes as it dug its teeth deeper and deeper. The stranger shouted in a voice that was not his own, and after a minute of struggling with the mouse, he jumped away from it, covered in blood. And everyone saw that B.B. the mouse was no longer so adorable, because she was holding the stranger's hand in her teeth. She shouted to Lenly that she had torn it off in one bite, so he should start praising her. Lenly replied with amazement that she had done a great job thinking to himself that the mouse had become a real beast. The stranger was lying on the ground nearby, going crazy with pain. The killer girl, shouting retreat, ran to number four and began to pick him up to escape. She finally realized that the enemy was a very powerful magician. At the same time, she feared for her own life. She finally lifted him up and dragged him into the forest. Lindley became dizzy and fell to the ground exhausted, completely unconscious unresponsive to the sounds and events around him. Lying face down on the ground, he whispered to Delin, because he believed a strange girl. He almost died. Maybe he really deserved to die. Delin flew over to him and sat down. She stroked the boy's head and told him that having such a difficult experience was the best training, and he had dealt with these events on his own, and that it made him much stronger. Gibby Lenley was lying down and couldn't even turn over on his back. He tried to move, but the pain pierced his entire body. The wound was deep and serious. Delon looked at his agony and said that most healing spells use the water element. Earth magic can only compress the magic, and once its power is weakened, the pain will become three times as strong. Meanwhile, in the dormitory number 109 of the Magic Academy, Adelia was sitting on a mortar. The girl was upset about something. She was thinking of her older brother who had gone to the magical Beast Mountain range a month later, and had not been heard from since. She knew nothing about the tragedy that had happened there, but she was waiting for him. Next to her in the room were the residents of the dormitory room. Yale and the guys were discussing Lenly with each other, because it was the first time they had not seen him for so long since they met him. Everyone was overwhelmed by an inexplicable sadness. Yale was also in a bad mood. He told the boys that since he stole Lenly's sculptures and sold them at the Prule Gallery, people from the gallery were always following him around, and it was really pissing him off. So he was also looking forward to his friend's return to continue his successful new business. But it was clear from the look on the guys' faces that they didn't share Yale's views, that he had stolen someone else's work. He snapped at them, saying that they didn't know anything about it, and that making money was also the job of a real magician. The boys began to convince him that Lenly had gone to the mountain ridge to make money because he didn't want to sell the sculpture. One of them shouted out to him that he knew Yale was being crooked and did not do it just to solve his friend's problems. The boy with glasses was surprised that Yale had sold someone else's thing and still had the money and Lenly did not know anything about it. Yale snapped that he was keeping the money for Lenly, and that was it. Delia listened to them with half an ear to the ground, thinking about Lenly and the fact that he was in a dangerous place, worried about him because she liked him. She remembered the request she had given to her brother and was sad again. Meanwhile, on the mountain ridge, a strange sound attracted Lenly's attention, and with the last of his strength he raised his head and saw that a magical boar had come to the river to drink. He and Baby the Mouse looked at each other in silence. Both concentrating their remaining magical powers, Lenly quietly said a wind element spell, and magic began to appear in his hands. Next, he whispered, Earth thorns. And in an instant, sharp spikes grew in front of the magical boar, and they dug into its hooves and all over its body, 
sharp as sharpened iron, painfully digging into its blood. With a frantic scream, the magic boar escaped from the trap and began to run away. Baby the mouse screamed and asked Lenly to let her go to deal with the intruder. But Lenly stopped her, explaining that it was his training and testing his remaining strength and body. At some point, Lenly felt relieved of the pain and jumped to his feet and shouted the spell, Wind Element. Making an enchanting flip in the air, he launched magic from his river. It caught up with the magical boar and hit the animal painfully. The boar reeled as if it had been cut alive. Its body floated in the air and spun in a flip. In an instant, Lenly flew to the boar and stabbed it in the face with his dagger. And immediately everyone saw a colorful stone fall out of it. Dweb the mouse began to squeal with delight. Squeal. Lenly picked up the bag of stones that stranger number four had lost and began to count all the stones, which were now all his. Suddenly, the mouse started spitting out different stones as well. And the boy remembered that it had also defeated the assassin and now had its own collection of stones. And since the mouse was his, so were the stones. Looking at his furry friend, Lenly finally realized that Beb's strength had grown after the fight with guy number four. And that's why her skills had become impressive, and she had even grown in size. Deline, who was nearby, explained to the boy that when he was seriously injured and unconscious, and his wound had not yet healed, other assassins dressed in black came and attacked them. But the mouse managed to grow up and killed them easily. It was really amazing. Beb happily held the bag with her own stones in her mouth, and Lenly bent down to her and said that, now you can't say that Beb the mouse is a simple animal, or you can get into big trouble. And he laughed out loud. And they all began to count Bibi's treasures and Lenly's wealth together. There were only seven magic crystals in the bag, six of them middle class and one of the highest class. Then they began to count the crystals that had been obtained from the bodies of the magical beasts and counted five six-level crystals, twenty-six fifth-level crystals, and seventy-one fourth-level crystals a total of 102 crystals. Everyone was overjoyed, but Bibi the mouse was the most excited, squealing the loudest. Suddenly something grabbed her tail and started pulling. It was Delon secretly holding it to calm it down. Immediately the mouse started screaming to Lenly to save her because an invisible force was pulling her tail. Dylan laughed and told her that she had just become a better mouse, but not to get too excited. Everyone around her started laughing too. But the mouse was too scared to hear them, so she threw herself on Lenly's shoulders and screamed that she must have been attacked by a ghost and needed to be rescued immediately. Lenly could not say anything to her because he could not stop laughing. When everyone had calmed down a bit, Delon told the boy that he had collected a lot of magic crystals, and if they exchanged them for money, they would get about 30,000 gold coins, which should be enough for him. Then she looked at him carefully and asked him if he missed his classmates since he had left the academy almost a month ago. Lenly replied that he did, but he turned to the mountain range and continued that he had heard from the boys that it had a heart, and since he had come so far, he had to go to it and see what this mysterious place was. Lenly stood with the mouse on his shoulder and looked thoughtfully at the mountain range, which looked like a stone dragon from a distance. For some reason, it reminded him of the dragon Velo Chi, who had destroyed the village of Wushan. At this moment, Bebe the mouse had an incredible idea that she should probably train as well, because she wanted to fight high-level beasts, because the fifth and sixth levels were too easy for her. The boy looked at her in surprise, silently, and then took off together in a leap. The two of them raced through the air, their wind magic synchronized and perfect. Linley stood on his feet in flight and began to glide through the air as if on skates, and only the rustling of his feet could be heard as if on ice. After a while, he and Bebe stopped at the bottom of a ridge. Not far from them stood a familiar man, who looked at them in surprise. Lenly could not believe his eyes. It was the same man who had been there before the fight with Dashed. Before he could even say anything, the man interrupted him and introduced himself. It was indeed Marte, Dashed his partner. Mouse BB quietly asked Lenly if he was the same warrior who had run away. Delon, who was already there, said that running away in that situation was a wise decision, and that this man here proved that he was quite resilient. 
Marte was very happy to see familiar faces and said that Lenly was indeed a high-level magician. But none of them noticed Marty's stunned look as he stared at the heavy bag of crystals that was tied to Lenly's belt. The man began to speak quickly, without attracting attention, saying that since they hadn't seen each other for so long and were still alive and well, they should celebrate. Waving his hand into the bushes, he said that he had recently killed a wild boar, so Lenly should definitely check out his cooking skills. And he skillfully pulled out his dagger in front of everyone, and began to cut the carcass, easily cutting off piece by piece. Mouse Baby professionally remarked that his technique looked very advanced, and probably not worse than Lenly's. Marte made a fire, and after a while the clearing was filled with the delicious smell of roasting meat. He took the best piece of meat and offered it to Lenly. The boy's stomach turned with hunger, but he remembered that his little friend was hungry too, and gave it to Bebe. The mouse looked at the roasted boar leg with delight. She was incredibly hungry, and at one point shoved it all into her mouth, spitting out only the bone. Marte's jaw dropped at the sight. He had never seen anything like it. Bibi noticed Marte's shocked look and asked him what was wrong. Had he never seen a mouse eat? Marte could not say a word. A minute later, he turned to Lenly and asked him what his plan was, and which way they were going to go with him. Lenly calmly and confidently replied that he was the only one training on this mountain range and that's why they were leaving. For some reason, the guy did not want to continue his journey with his new friend. Marte, not holding back his surprise and anger, began to shout at him that this was a mountain range of magical beasts, and it was very dangerous. If they all stayed together, it would be safer. Lenly looked at him in surprise as he yelled at him. Marte, noticing this, continued a little calmer, saying that lately he couldn't even sleep well because he was so scared. But if Lenly was a magician, he would be his assistant, and so the boy would feel safer. V the mouse looked at Marty with a suspicious look, and thought that this guy was some kind of trash, because for some reason he thought he was too cool to accompany her boss. But to everyone's surprise, Lenly told Martha that he was happy to continue his journey with him. BB almost burst into tears at this point. The mouse rushed to Lenly shouting that she was not so cool and good for him. At that moment, Dellen's hand caught her again, unnoticed by her tail. Marte was overjoyed at Lenly's words, jumping up and down and praising him, and what a good person he was and that he would finally be able to sleep well at night. Dellen stood aside, holding the mouse by the tail and listened to their conversation. She was not happy about it all and thought, What is Lenly doing? Does one death of his classmate make him think that he is now responsible for Mart? But Lenly silently turned around and walked toward the mountain range, and everyone followed him. And again, no one noticed Marte's evil and cunning look, which was staring at the boy's back. Everyone had been walking for over an hour, and then Marte shouted to Lenly, asking if he was thinking of going back. Bebe, the mouse sitting on the boy's shoulder, glared at him jealously guarding her favorite boss, and Marte was making her very nervous. We've been here long enough, Marty continued to say to Lenly. The guy continued to walk silently. Mart's face was angry at this silence, and he thought that Lin Lei was always on the alert. He had no chance. Bibi flashed him an unkind look again. She had been looking at him suspiciously the whole way. That damn mouse is always following me, Marty continued to think. Suddenly, Lenly stopped and said something was wrong with the wind element. Lenly shouted loudly that something was wrong somewhere over there, pointing his staff in an unknown direction. Mouse Babe took off and flew in that direction, and Lenly shouted after her to be careful because there might be an ambush. The boy did not feel at that moment that behind him Marte had pulled out his dagger and a long metal chain. The man looked at him angrily and thought that the boy had finally weakened his defense and let go of the shadow mouse. The gods were finally on his side, screaming, not to be blamed, for there is only survivor and earner on the mountain ridge. Marte rushed at Lenly, attacking with dagger and chain. But Lenly seemed to be expecting this attack and turned his whole body toward Marte, grabbing the handle of Marte's dagger with his hand. The boy shouted at him that finally this fox had given himself away. He punched the man in the face, twisting his dagger with his other hand. Marte lost his balance in surprise. For some reason, Lenly remembered his training at the Magic Academy. 
where he had learned to develop and control the power of the earth element, and he remembered training with Deline on the mountain range, where they had developed his wind elemental power. With full concentration, he entered the battle with Marte. Using his two powers of earth and wind, he began to attack the man, landing accurate blows to his face and body. Marte seemed to have no chance to respond to these attacks. His developed face began to bleed. He tried to avoid Lenly's accurate blows, but nothing but screams came out of him. Attacking him again and again, Lenly shouted at him. Why did he want to hurt him? For a moment, both men stopped, and Marte replied that didn't the young magician realize how many valuables he was carrying with him? But taking advantage of this pause, Marte shouted that he was good at close combat and launched an iron chain with a metal spiked ball at the end of it at the lance. Luckily, the cannonball flew a couple of centimeters away from Lenly's head, and he was able to duck in time. At this point, Marte got as close to the guy as possible and was about to attack again, believing that the advantage in this battle had gone to his side. But Lenly skillfully dodged his upcoming blow with the words, Let me show you a real fighting technique, and hit Marty in the face with all his might, knocking him down. The man did not expect such a skillful attack. The boy thought that it was time to use an earth elemental spell and shouted the spell earth shaking. And in an instant, the ground under his feet trembled as if an earthquake had broken out and all the stones lying nearby were thrown into the air. Marta began to sway. He did not understand what was happening. The man exclaimed, what the hell is this magician's skill so strong? He was really impressed and did not expect such a turn of events. Lenly lifted all the stones into the air, stood firmly on his feet and shouted, All because he is Lin Lei Baruch of the Dragon Blood Warrior family. His words echoed throughout the mountain range. Meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain range, a boy stood on a hill that looked quite peaceful. It was Dixie, the most famous and talented magician at the Magic Academy. He was standing there looking absolutely peaceful as if he were meditating. Suddenly, Dixie turned around and shouted to someone, How long are you going to hide from me? Instantly, the mountains shook and stones began to fall, and unknown men in black cloaks began to fly up the hill. Dixie rolled his eyes and said, Idiots. Not a single muscle in his face moved in fear. One of them growled that Dixie knew this area was a haven for dark killers, but he still dared to come here, so today was their lucky day and they began to roar towards the boy. And then the incredible thing happened. Dixie began to cast a sixth-level lightning elemental spell. He shouted, Thunder Rising! And everything went dark, thunder roared, and lightning began to sparkle. The lightning struck all the black assassins, and they instantly fell to the ground. Dixie thought that he had managed to clear some of the obstacles, and that should help Lin Lei. All the assassins were lying motionless on the ground and the air was electrifying over their bodies. Some of them barely uttered that Dixie was a real bastard because only one spell had defeated them. Suddenly, the leader of the Dark Assassins began to rise from the crowd, kneeling down and asking Dixie menacingly, Is his mind power at the seventh level? Dixie calmly answered him that when he entered the Magic Academy, his mind power was already thirty-six times greater than that of an ordinary person. So if the assassin evaluated his abilities by such ordinary standards, he might suddenly become suicidal. The black leader hissed angrily at him that it was true that he had underestimated the boy. You made a big mistake when you didn't kill me right away. The black leader shouted and suddenly rose into the air. It became clear to Dixie that his strength was many times greater than that of the other black warriors. And with a wild laugh and fire, he flew even higher into the air. Dixie was honestly amazed at his strength. Hanging in the flames of fire, the black leader shouted that even though he would die, he would take Dixie with him. Suddenly, the boy heard a frantic, unknown roar, and looking closely, he saw a huge, unknown monster that was also engulfed in fire. The boy was seriously frightened. The thought flashed through his mind that he was too safe. He was surrounded by scary, giant, magical beasts on all sides. Roaring at the top of their lungs, Dixie looked at them and thought, There are too many of them and they are all above level five. He won't be able to escape, but he can increase his energy level and prepare a big electric beam. Maybe that will scare them all and they will run away. 
He concentrated and a huge electric ball appeared in his hands. He raised it as high as possible above him, so that all the magical animals around him could see it, and a miracle happened. The frightened animals began to run away quickly. Dixie thought with satisfaction that even the animals could correctly assess the situation. Their escape was the best decision for them, and now he could save his magic powers. Meanwhile, at the other end of the mountain range, Lenly stood in a clearing with the dead Marty and his chain lying at his feet. Lenly angrily told the corpse that if it weren't for his craving for money and the attack, they could both have come back alive. Dylan flew over to him and began to look at the dead Mart and said that in this place either you kill or they will kill you. Lenly, you are good. Lenly answered her that he was very careful in Marte and did not attack him when there was no suitable chance. So I gave him this chance. And Dylan exclaimed that now she understood why Lenly had sent Bibi in front of the mouse. The boy continued in frustration that before he came to the mountain ridge, he did not know how cruel the human heart could be. He was very depressed. His thoughts were interrupted by Bebe's mouse flying past them and hitting a tree with all its might. Lenly and Dellen were numb from what they saw. Suddenly everyone heard the trees crack and saw the fire start. After a moment of silence, everyone was amazed to see a huge fire dragon. It was the Velo She dragon. It had come from the direction Dixie had been. Velo She dragons were one of the high-level magic beasts. When Baby the Mouse was trying to expose Marte's treacherous intentions by pretending to go on a scouting trip, she came across this Veloci dragon in the forest. Dylan stared at the dragon in awe and managed to shout to Lenly that it was a seventh-level beast, and even though it had grown stronger, he still couldn't defeat it. But Lenly didn't hear her. He had a new plan in his head. At the other end of the mountain range, Dixie stood looking at the pile of dead black assassins. He said out loud that thank goodness it was only a bunch of Veloci dragons. He would have been very unlucky if a level 9 beast had appeared here. And he remembered with joy that the black assassins must have had very valuable items. He searched the bodies of the black assassins and found a whole bunch of magic crystals. Looking at them, he thought that the mountain range was a dubious place, and it was abnormal and illogical for thieves to gather here he would probably have to find out the reason behind it. At that moment, a thought dawned on him. Hadn't all the magical beasts flown towards Lenly? Would he be able to escape from them in time? Meanwhile, Lenly remembered the events in Wushan Village, where the mysterious magician rode a similar dragon called Velo Ki. Those events and the destruction they caused left a great wound in Lin Lei's heart. He heard Dalen's words and understood what she was saying. But he said to himself, Although her words were true, he did not want to cowardly run away. He wanted to finally avenge his village of Wushan. Suddenly, Bibi's legs began to stretch out and turn into claws. She screamed out in a frightened voice for the first time to Lenly Boss, showing him her hands. Lenly was amazed to hear her shout out, Can she really talk with her voice? At that moment, the mouse's tail also began to stretch. She was screaming with fright. The boy rushed to her and shouted, What's happening to her? Bibi began to grow in size. Her ears stretched out like a rabbit's. Her legs and body grew before our eyes. Nothing reminded him that he was once a little ball of wool. Mao shouted to him that she could feel the power overwhelming her. She had become as big as Lenly. She shouted the spell, Fire Breath, at the top of her lungs. Dilin watched and said that the mouse had evolved. They should have realized that this was possible, even before they hired her. At that moment, Bebe began to fearlessly attack the Velo Chi dragon. She flew up high into the sky to match him and slammed her body into his head. Everyone heard this fierce, fearless attack. Surprised by the attack, the dragon saw who was attacking him and started to turn around to hit the mouse with its tail. Lenly just managed to shout to her to watch out for his tail. Bib masterfully avoided the blow, because she was still much smaller than him and shouted to Lenly that she seemed to be faster than his tail, and she bit him desperately, tearing out a piece of his body, and the dragon began to chase her and try to catch it with his paws. Mao shouted that the dragon's skin was hard and thick, and her attack barely scratched it. Lenly exclaimed to her that he never thought Bebe was such a strong and fearless animal, but he realized that she could not cope with the dragon, who was already angry, and exclaimed that he would help her.
Dylan tried to stop him, explaining that the dragon did not see him as a real rival, because there was a reason for that. She really knew a lot in this life. Because this battle was only between animals, and she believed that Lenly could not participate in it. Baby continued to attack the dragon, and the dragon tried to catch her. Lenly was amazed to see that the dragon's entire body was bitten by the evolved Bibi, and blood was flowing through the broken scales of the dragon's skin. Bibi continued to chase and bite him persistently. Suddenly, Baby didn't notice how the dragon managed to turn its tail around and hit her with all its strength. She lost consciousness and her body began to fall down. Linley saw the mouse falling and ran over and caught her body right in his arms. She was unconscious. He began to shake her to bring her back to memory, but she was lying still. Finally, Baby opened her eyes and squeaked out that she was fine, but that she saw many small spinning stars around her. Lenly noticed that her body had begun to shrink back to its normal size. Dellen explained that she had reverted to her previous state and that after the attack, she simply could not fight anymore. Lenly's anger knew no bounds. He looked at the dragon furiously and realized that it was he who had done this to her pet, and he shouted that since Bebe had regained consciousness, he was not stupid enough to fight. Dellen looked at him and thought that Lenly was going to fight the Veloci dragon but she didn't believe he could do it after Bebe's injury. But the boy didn't think so. He really went to fight the dragon. She looked at the boy and thought, what an amazing transformation, Bebe. The mouse is no ordinary beast. She hadn't seen Lenly happier since she came here. But she was wrong about the boy not being able to beat him. After the fight, Lenly and Bebe the mouse lay on the lawn and rested. She told him that the dragon's tail was very hard, it hurt a lot, and if it didn't shrink again, she would have crushed it all by herself. Lenly reassured her that the tail would have killed him for sure. Lenly cheerfully asked the mouse how she felt after fighting the seventh level beast. And does it still want to fight beasts of the eighth and ninth levels? She replied that he shouldn't laugh at her like that, because this time she used her speed to fight, and if they had fought a higher level before, the dragon would not have been such a difficult opponent. Lenly reassured her that one day she would be the strongest. And then Lenly heard Dellen calling out loudly to him. She was flying towards him quickly. He exploded and started shouting that he was right there. Unable to stand it, he took off into the sky and raced to meet her using his glide. They flew to a cliff. Dillin hovered above him. Lenly finally reached a small hill, and behind it was a huge canyon. He stopped at the edge of it and stared at it with Bebe the mouse. Linley asked Dellen what it was. She replied that she didn't know, but it was very interesting because she could feel the wind blowing from there. The boy looked into the depths of the canyon and said that thank God the Veloci dragon hadn't followed him to this place. Otherwise, it would have been difficult to escape. Dellen interrupted him and shouted that it didn't matter. Look at the bottom of the canyon. By the way, she said businesslike. This reminded her of the time when Lenly was chased by a low-level beast and almost died when he fell off a cliff. Lenly told her irritably that he was too weak then. B the mouse was furious again. She hadn't seen Dellen in person, but only felt her presence, so she wondered why she heard someone talking to her beloved boss. But she didn't see anyone. She scolded Lin Lei that he had become so strong or met her. Dellen sharply told her to stop being so impudent. Bebe heard these words and jumped into Lin Lei's arms, screaming that this invisible person was bullying her again. And then Dellen lost her patience and exclaimed that since the mouse had become Lin Lei's contact animal, she would show herself in full form. In Dellen materialized, her body clearly visible. She loudly shouted that she was daring coward, Lin Lei's master. And poking the mouse in the face with her finger, she added that she had better remember that. Lin Lei laughed and Bebe sat there with square eyes from what she saw. She loudly said, Daring Kovskvirlart. For some reason, she called her that. None of them paid attention to Bebe's emotions anymore, and Lenly thoughtfully said that there was definitely something in this canyon. To which Dellen replied that she could not go down to the bottom, because the ring he was wearing did not allow her to move far away. He decided to use the wind detector to try to see what was at the bottom of the hole. He concentrated and launched the magic of the detecting wind. Closing his eyes, he tried to see the unknown. 
but the signal he sent was swallowed up by the abyss. He felt nothing. Lenly loudly told Delon that it seems that this fog is blocking his magic detection, but with his abilities, he would be able to pass through it with ease. Delon was going to fly with him. Delon said to him that now he should definitely go down and see what was so interesting, and it was definitely there. So let's go down and see. Lenly began to doubt that he might not be able to make it down. It was not very easy. But Delon had already tugged on his arm, and he was off, kicking and screaming down the hill. They were both flying at breakneck speed and screaming as if they were being cut, their voices echoing off the canyon walls. The mouse was also screaming loudly. Suddenly Lenly had the idea to use the element of wind, and started shouting spells to stop his rapid fall. He thought that it would be dangerous for him, because he had never been good at these spells. But he had to do something, so he shouted out, the hovering technique. A green magical glow appeared around him, and his body began to pause and balance slightly. Dylan smiled and flew over to him, poking her finger into his shoulder and asking if it was really a spell. Lindley screamed for her not to touch him, because he couldn't fully control his balance anyway. He was screaming like a little child, and Dylan started laughing. He barely caught his balance and started to hover in the air, exhaling. He explained that he had never been good at this spell, so he was using a simplified version of it that Yale had taught him. All he could do now was fly up or down. Delon started to praise him that it was a simplified version of the spell, but Lenly was a great guy because he had learned a lot of spells. She was even a little jealous of him. The boy shouted another spell, Soar! And he began to float confidently in the air. Delon still tried to control him so that he wouldn't fall. The frightened mouse hung silently on his pants. They all went down the canyon together, and Lenly was surprised to say that this canyon was deep. The deeper they went, the wider it got for some reason. He asked Delon if she had ever been here before. She told him that she had never been here before, but she thought that this place was probably dangerous and that we should be on the lookout. At that moment, Lenly heard a strange sound. It's some kind of animal, he whispered in surprise. Delon also listened and said that this sound was not a low-level sound. Even Velo Key Dragons are weak compared to this sound. She became alert and began to peer into the darkness. The guy who was coming down and recalling what low-level and high-level beasts looked like also recalled the face of a Velo Key Dragon. Delon asked him to be quiet so as not to disturb the beasts. Lenly told her that with his level, a collision with any beast would most likely be very dangerous. And then he noticed an unusual blue light coming from somewhere at the bottom of the canyon. Deline said it was because of this light that she wanted to come down here because she had seen it before. Suddenly, Lenly saw some grass flashing before his eyes, glowing with this blue light. He reached out to touch it in amazement. Everyone stared at him in awe. Lenly joyfully exclaimed that it was the blue heart herb. He remembered learning it in his medicine class at the academy but he did not know what exactly it was and how this herb would change his fate in the future. It was the first time Delon had seen it and asked Lenly what it was used for. He replied that he did not know. Delon thought about it, remembered something, and let it slip that as far as she knew it was a rare herb, something like a good ingredient for medicine. So she suggested that the boy pick more of it, just in case. Lindley plucked the first bush with its roots, then began to examine it closely. He noticed that the herb was very cold, and remembered that it was indeed described in a medical book. But he continued to pick it wherever he saw it, carefully putting it in a bag. Suddenly, Bebe the mouse began to sniff. She smelled a strange odor, and shouted for everyone to beware of the beast. Animals have always had a much stronger sense of smell than humans. At that moment... Lenly reached out for another bush of grass and immediately a huge snake's mouth opened in front of him. The damn bush was growing right in front of it. The snake began to crawl out quickly and everyone realized that its head alone was three times bigger than Lenly's. It was aiming to swallow the boy whole. Lenly quickly realized and shouted the world sword spell. A huge magic sword appeared in his hand. The guy was already completely in the snake's mouth. He made the first stroke of the sword against the snake's teeth and realized that this would be the only effective method in this situation. 
Being completely in the snake's mouth, Lenly kept chopping and chopping with his sword, realizing that it was about to swallow him. The snake wriggled in pain and could not understand what was happening and why it could not close its mouth. But unfortunately, the cuts that the boy made with his sword did not cause much damage to the snake. It was not enough for it to have a chance to escape. He was too small an opponent. Lenly realized this, but he kept hacking because there was no other way out. And finally, after about ten minutes, he was able to get out of the snake's mouth and jump away. Baby the mouse rushed to him, shouting with joy that she thought it was over and her boss was eaten. Deline happily exclaimed that it was a good and dangerous job, but the guy really scared her, and it was good that he reacted so quickly. Then she explained that this snake is a level seven beast, and on its hard scales, these cuts are just unfortunate scratches. This snake preys on magicians who come to collect medicinal herbs, but it is a little wounded right now. So it will first assess Lenly's capabilities before attacking, so it is best to stay away. Lenly listened carefully to the girl. Suddenly everyone heard a loud hiss. Turning around, they saw up to a dozen snakes like them, which had already spotted their prey and were crawling to attack. Delin shouted to the boy to run as fast as he could. Otherwise, it would be too late, because the snakes had already spotted him. And Lenly began to fly as fast as he could down the canyon. But the snakes were fast, too, and they chased him and almost caught up with him. Lenly shouted a wind elemental spell to maximize his strength. Lenly ran as fast as he could. The spell really accelerated his speed, but the snakes unfortunately did not lag behind. And then he saw some giant black birds circling over his head. He recognized them. They were dragon hawks. Beasts of the dragon family, his teacher had once mentioned them. They were the weakest creatures of the dragon species, but stronger than ordinary beasts. Delin, who was flying behind him, shouted that they were just like dragon beasts and moved in groups, so even a seventh level warrior would not have an advantage in front. The dragon hawks were flying toward Lenly. Their appearance was terrifying. They had the body of a dragon and the head of a huge hawk. They flew past Lenly without touching him, and then flew toward the snakes. A couple of seconds passed, and Lenly, along with Bebby and Delin, flew out of the canyon screaming. They landed on their feet on a nearby meadow, and finally caught their breath. Delin aptly remarked that they had made a good escape from both the snakes and the dragon hawks. Lenly told her that he was very tired, but they had found the blue heart herb, and it was just cool. Instantly, a dragon hawk flew out from behind him. Baby the mouse shouted that they had caught up with them after all. Lenly turned back to the monster and thought that the wind element magic was not fast enough, and he started to launch a new magic. Delin screamed. What was he going to do? The guy shouted the spell Yellow Earth Giant loudly, and there was a huge roar. The ground started to move. A huge Yellow Earth Giant. Ten times bigger than Lenly, rose out of the ground. It began to roar toward the dragon hawk. The dragon hawk rushed right at him and rammed his beak into the monster. Lenly shouted the next spell, blocking grip. Delin shouted that this monster would not last long, and Bebe the mouse shouted that she would not stand aside. And only Lenly realized that he only had one chance. Bebe the mouse and Lenly looked at each other and in unison, concentrating, they rushed straight into the dragon hawk's spine. After all, the mouse was a level 5 beast, and Lenly was a level 5 dual elemental mage and a level 4 warrior. They had the perfect tandem and it should work. Flying up to the dragon hawk, they hit it with all their might, and the dragon hawk roared in pain so that everyone's ears were plugged. With a single blow, Baby and Lenly managed to cut the dragon hawk's backbone in half, and it fell to the ground with a thud. The boy and the mouse shouted in unison with joy. They had done something incredible by defeating such a monster. Bibi the mouse looked merrily into Lenly's eyes and said menacingly that the monster was dead. Lenly told her back that it was a good job. They laughed again. Delin looked at the battle and its outcome with delight and said that one man and one beast, not a bad match. She was incredibly pleased with her apprentice and her contract beast. Lenly looked at the girl tiredly and told her not to laugh at him. And since the danger was over, he wanted to rest for a while. He didn't think there would be so many high-level monsters in the canyon. 
It took too much strength for such a small boy. Meanwhile, Baby the Mouse was jumping and squealing with happiness, and after about five minutes she returned to her previous form, becoming a small and fluffy mouse. But it was today that she realized that she really liked wrestling. She wanted to do it again and again. Meanwhile, Dellen told Lenly that until he became a seventh-level mage, he would be able to use the Jade Earth armor and would no longer be afraid of the monsters. She knew how to give advice in time when it was already over. To which Lenly replied that this option would be true for being here on the mountain range, but for his family. For his family, he continued, he needed to get at least level eight or nine. He looked up at the girl and asked if he could achieve that. She remained silent. Delin was also silent. The boy thought that there were not many eighth-level mages in Yulan, and his family had only five fourth-level mages. Finally, Delin told him that after what she had seen on this trip, she thought Lenly would do well, and smiled. She knew what a capable and brave boy he was, and she was proud of him again. She looked at him and continued to think that Lenly had come to this mountain range as a third level. After all these battles, he was a fifth level, so he would now be able to use spells more skillfully than other fifth-level mages, and he had also found the blue heart herb and accumulated many magic crystals. It wasn't so bad, she thought, as she looked at her student. So, throughout his journey on the Magic Beast Mountain range, Lenly had met many magic beasts of different levels, namely a level three boar that is found outside the ring zone of the mountain range a level four wind wolf that usually lives near the ring zone and is not very active at night, a level seven green tattooed python that is a high-level beast that lives in the depths of the canyon, and a level six dragon hawk that can move in groups and is good at attacking from the air. On his way back, Lenly met many magical stars, but they were already weaker and weaker. When he flew with everyone else to the outer ring zone, the beasts he encountered on his way were not a threat at all. They all flew quickly through the mountainous abundance. Stopping on one of the hills, he looked down and saw that four strangers were fighting a huge boar, and the battle was not entirely victorious. Lenly and BB the mouse quietly climbed up to the top of the tree, something telling him that he should keep a close eye on this particular fight. He looked closely at the boar and wondered if it was the same bloodthirsty boar he had seen before but there were four strangers, so it shouldn't be a problem to defeat it. Indeed, it was a bloodthirsty boar of the fifth level, which aggressively attacked all four warriors. One of Kalan's warriors recognized Lenly. Another red-haired warrior named Tony shouted at him that, how could a fifth-level monster live in the outer ring area, where there could be fourth- and third-level beasts? Kalan, a tall, statuesque warrior in metal armor, snapped at Tony saying that he didn't know and that he should concentrate on the fight and stop whining. He attacked the boar again. The third warrior was a blonde girl named Alice, who wore a beautiful pink girl's dress and a pink hat with a wide brim. Kaylin shouted at her to hurry up and get ready. The wind blew and her hat came off, revealing her unusually pretty face, big blue eyes, and blonde long curls. She shouted out to Kalan that it wouldn't work. Lenly continued to stare at the warriors from the hill in amazement. Realizing that the battle could end badly and the boar would tear the beauty apart, Lenly decided to help and shouted an earth elemental magic spell. Earth spikes, the boy added, and instantly huge spikes grew between the girl and the boar, which also grew under its belly. Alice fell down in surprise and looked at this trash with wide eyes. The boar howled in pain, the spikes ruthlessly digging into his body. Lenly did not stop. The next spell he cast was Flat Blade, and a familiar blade materialized out of thin air. Meanwhile, the boar fell dead from its injuries, and Lenly deftly jumped on its head and began to cut with the flat blade. The warriors stared at the scene in surprise. Lenly skillfully wielded the blade, cutting piece by piece from the boar's body. He was stubbornly looking for the magic crystal, but he could not find it. But he knew for sure that it was somewhere and he would not go anywhere without it, even if he had to chop the boar into small pieces. And finally he found it. The crystal of the bloodthirsty boar. It was big enough and orange in color. Lenly was happy because he was beginning to think that the boar was defective. He proudly put it in the bag on his belt. He was very pleased with the result of his work. 
He looked up and saw all the warriors standing there, staring at him in silence. It was obvious that they were really deeply impressed. None of them could say a word. Linley turned without a word and walked cheerfully to his men. Suddenly, Kalin came to his senses and shouted at him to stop for a second. The boy stopped and turned around, and Kalin ran up to him and introduced himself, explaining that if it wasn't for Lenley's help, Alice would have died, and thanked him sincerely. Alice was still sitting on the ground, shocked. It seemed that she had become even more beautiful. In a moment, she also came to her senses and stood up. She looked even more beautiful than before the battle. She also began to sincerely thank Lenley for saving her, and introduced herself. Her name was Alice Staff, an earth elemental mage. Lenley looked at her silently and listened. He calmly explained to everyone that he was just passing by and noticed their fight and decided to help. Just then, Delon flew up and jealously told him that now she understood why he had saved them and looked angrily at Alice. She really disliked all the girls who were close to her favorite. Alice, who could not see her, thought the boy was strange because he was talking to someone. Kalen continued to say that he couldn't believe that, on their first day on the mountain range, they had encountered a level five beast. It was just bad luck. He hadn't thought that the off-kilter zone of the mountain range would be so dangerous. All three of them were really surprised by this. Lenley explained to them in a businesslike manner that the dangers of the mountain abundance zone could not only come from magical high-level beasts, there were also bandits. The warriors were terrified, and each of them thought to themselves how lucky they were not to have met them. Kellen explained to the boy that they had decided to come here on their own, but apparently it was still very thoughtful. He asked Lenley to help him get out of the ridge, because he doubted the safety of going out on his own. And all three of them took turns asking Lenley to get them out of there. They were really scared by the recent events. Lenley exhaled and promised to help them. For some reason, Delon and Bibi the Mouse were not happy about this. They definitely did not like the warriors. The Mouse jumped up to Lenley and whispered angrily in his ear, How could he? Delon mumbled that it would not be that difficult. The warriors thanked Lenley and turned back to the road leading home. Now there was a whole troop of them. They were all returning home happily and were glad that everyone was safe and sound. As Lenley walked along, he thought that perhaps because of his strong aura, the low-level beasts would not attack them. Their journey to the Magic Star Mountain Range was over. After some time, they all reached the capital of the Fung Lai Kingdom, a city also called Fung Lai. When they reached the luxurious mansion of the Colin family, they saw a gray-haired man greeting them and he exclaimed joyfully, It's good that everyone is back safe and sound. It was Kalen's father. His son rushed to him joyfully and explained that they had met the wizard Lenly on their way, and that it was only because of him that they were now alive and well. The father was also amazed by this story. Lenly listened to their conversation calmly, and Alice quietly approached him, and explained that Kalen came from a family famous for its warriors, but Lenly did not need them. He told her so. Kalan's father called a servant and took the pouch from his hands and addressed Lenly, asking him to accept one hundred gold coins from him as a sign of gratitude for saving his son and his friends. The boy silently took the pouch of money, turned around and left. Everyone looked at him in surprise. Kalan called out to him, but Lenly did not even turn around. Kalan and his father entered the palace of their family, whose nickname was Debs. His father menacingly ordered him to kneel down. Putting his sword on his son's shoulders, he said that Kalen was almost grown up and almost the leader of the Debs family. But didn't he know that the mountainous abundance of magical beasts was a dangerous place? He continued that he had made a big mistake. If he acted without thinking, he would destroy the whole family in the future after he took over the leadership of the family. The boy was really upset by his actions. Finally. The story returns to the Magic Academy, where all of Lenly's friends from Dormitory 109 were standing around. They stood there talking about everything, and suddenly one of them saw a familiar silhouette and shouted, Lin Lei, what are you doing? The silhouette came closer, and everyone saw a smiling boy with a mouse on his shoulder. Lin Lee joyfully shouted that it was really him, and he had finally returned. The boys were overjoyed and rushed over to Lenly 
shouting with joy that he was finally back alive. They hugged him and jumped on his back. Everyone loved Lenly and really missed him. Yale started shouting that they needed to celebrate this event right now. Lenly laughed and offered to pay for everything. The boys loudly supported this idea. Some of them were surprised to hear that Lenly was going to treat everyone. They couldn't understand where he got the money. Lenly cheerfully told them that he had received many things from the mountain range of abundance, and the boys began to shout with pleasure that there was going to be a party. Because even in his absence, he was earning money here at the academy. Yale proudly announced to him that he had sold all his sculptures for a great price, and now the Prue Gallery had sent him an invitation letter. This is a high honor for him. Lenly was overwhelmed and could not say a word. He asked if it was really an invitation from the gallery. Maybe Yale was confused, but he laughed and promised to give it to him later. And after a while, a real student party began in Dormitory 109, in honor of the return of the famous Lenly, with the party shouted from every window of the dormitory. In the middle of the dormitory, gorgeous tables were set up, and there was a lot of food. Fruits, vegetables, lots of meat and drinks. Everything was gorgeous and adult. And then, when everyone was full and drunk, they decided it was time for fireworks in honor of their friend. And they decided to use fire magic to create a fireworks effect. It was really a magical party. After some time of partying, when everyone went to bed, Yale sat with Lenly on the balcony. Ivan proudly handed him an invitation to the Prule Gallery. Lenly snatched it up and asked him again if it was really an invitation to the Prule Gallery. He couldn't believe his eyes and thought that Yale was joking. Yale began to tell him in detail that the Prule Gallery had recognized Yale's sculpture-making skills. This invitation asked him to present his work in the gallery's exhibition hall. Since the people from the Prule Gallery came to the Academy, the news of his invitation spread to all corners. Lenly was now more famous than ever. This can't be true, whispered Lenly. He could not believe his ears. Now it's time for bed, good night, said Yale, and immediately fell to the floor and snored loudly. Lenly turned to Dellen and asked her if she was ever scared of the world. It's dangerous on the mountain range, but in Feng Lai, the levels are used to differentiate themselves from each other, and life here is more difficult than on the mountain range. Society is some kind of strange version of the mountain range. Dellen could not understand what he was talking about. She asked him if he was afraid of competition. Lenly calmly told her that he was not afraid of them, because if you don't try hard, you will be eliminated. The next day, when everyone was finally getting up, Lenly and Yale went to the pro gallery. They were greeted with joy. The experts praised Lenly and said that he was a super talent for them. Yale stopped the flow of flattery and told a man named Austin to stop wasting his time. Austin laughed and turned to Lenly and handed him a card and explained that it was a magical crystal card that was produced especially for them by the gold banks of the Four Kingdoms, handing it over. He explained that it now meant that Lenly was an expert in sculptures. Lenly looked at the map with interest. Austin continued that he needed to use Lenly's fingerprint to identify him, and then he could use it. The boy asked if he was really an expert on sculptures now. Everyone around him laughed out loud. Yale told him that he was going back to the Magic Academy. Would Lenly also go with him? The boy refused. At that moment, he decided to go home to Wushan Village. He quickly took to the sky and set off on a journey with Bebe the mouse using wind magic. As Lenly was flying, he suddenly asked the mouse if he was happy to be back in Wushan Village. And why was he then in the ruins of their ancestral hall? The mouse answered him that she only remembered a voice telling her to go there. From birth she could only eat stones, but Lenly gave her a chicken leg, of all people in this world. He was the only one who was so kind to her. An hour later they were both standing on the doorstep of Lenly's house. The boy called out loudly to his father, but the house was unusually quiet, and they both went room by room to look for Nog. They passed room after room calling out loudly for Nog. Suddenly, a familiar voice called Lenly's name. It was Captain Hillman. Lenly happily asked him where his father was. Hillman broke out in a cold sweat and thought that he could not tell the little boy why his father had left Wushan. So he replied that his father had gone to work. 
Lenly happily exclaimed to him that now he could earn money himself, and to tell Hillman to tell his father that he didn't have to work anymore. Suddenly someone began to bang loudly on the door of the house, and all three of them rushed to open it. When they opened the door, they were all surprised to see a bloody nog barely standing on his feet and falling to his knees coughing. The boys rushed to him screaming. Nog's body was covered in wounds. Hillman did not understand what had happened or why he had returned. They dragged Nog into the house and sat him on a chair. He was completely unconscious. Blood was running down his arms and staining all his clothes. Lindley rushed to bring him to life, constantly calling out to him. Hillman's hands were shaking. Nog finally regained consciousness and said, Lenly, listen to me carefully. It was obvious how hard he was struggling to say every word. Everyone froze. The father continued his story with difficulty, saying that he had left Wushan village to finally find out who the real killers of his mother and wife Lina were. Lenly's eyes grew bigger and bigger. At that moment, Lenly vaguely recalled the image of his mother in the portrait. His father continued that this time he had learned something. She really was murdered. Nog finally admitted that he had lied to his son, saying that his mother had died in childbirth. Now I know for sure that the killer has a spider mark on his arm and he is our enemy. Nog exhaled with his last breath. Tears stood in Lenly's eyes. He repeated the words, the enemy who killed his mother. He didn't remember his mother. He had only seen her portrait all his life and listened to his father's stories about her. But he loved her with all his heart and missed her incredibly. Hillman regained consciousness and asked Nog if he had finally found him, and why was he covered in wounds. Nog laughed softly at his words. Hillman exploded that what he had learned was no reason to laugh. If you go too far, you can definitely die. Nog quietly replied that he had not been afraid of death for a long time. Lindley felt dizzy. With a thirst for revenge, he turned around and ran for the exit of the house. All his life he had believed that his poor mother was dead but now the thought of her murder was tearing him apart. Nog, who had seen his son, quickly ordered Captain Hillman to keep an eye on Lenly. His heart felt something was wrong. But your wounds, Nog! Hillman exclaimed, rushing to him. They don't matter because all that matters now is the lives of my children, Horton and Lenly! Nog exclaimed menacingly. And he asked Hillman again, not to let his son get bogged down in the thirst for revenge for him. Lenly is not strong enough to defeat the enemy, but his main goal is to find the ancient relic of the Dragon Blood family, the Killer Blade. The whereabouts of the blade are currently unknown, they couldn't even protect it. He really hoped that Lenly would be able to find and return the blade. Hillman had promised him that he would. Nog sat in the chair covered in blood. The floor beside him was also covered in blood. He whispered that as long as he was alive, Hillman had to tell Lenly. There are still some things that need to be explored and he needs to dig deeper. In the meantime, Lenly was flying as fast as he could, with only anger and revenge for his mother's murder in his mind. He didn't notice a large stone in his path and stumbled into the water of a nearby lake. The cold water immediately brought him to his senses, and the boy came up to think why this happened. He did not want to see his father like this. Dellen, who had barely caught up with him, calmed him down, saying, doesn't he know what to do in this situation? You need to become stronger and understand your enemy. Right now, you probably won't be able to defeat a level six warrior. How are you going to take revenge? Dellen asked him. The boy silently plunged into the water, saying that he understood everything. Suddenly, he heard familiar voices calling out to him from the shore. When Lenly emerged from the water, he saw familiar faces. It was the boys from Wushan Village with whom he had grown up since childhood. Carter, Garen, and others were all calling out to him. Some of them asked if he remembered them. Lindley climbed out of the water to his friends, and they all rushed to hug him. And a million questions came pouring in. Had he seen more dragons than Velo Chi? Will he be able to defeat them now? How is his training at the academy going? Lindley was a real star in his village, where everyone sincerely loved him and rejoiced at his success. The boy laughed, hugged, and was silent. Then he silently stepped away from the crowd and cast a spell of earth magic, and immediately the earth was enveloped in a green glow. The crowd was quiet and frozen, and then he began to wrestle with a guy in a tiger skin, whom he laid down on his shoulder blades. 
The crowd roared with delight. Captain Hillman, who had come over, saw the fight and was shocked. He then yelled at the children and ordered them to give Lenly time to rest and to return to their daily training. He rushed over to the boy, thinking he was a bit out of it, but Lenly assured him that he was fine. Lenly looked at Captain Hillman's frightened face and reassured him that he was calm and perfectly fine. Hillman looked at him in awe and said that the boy had really grown up and become much more mature. Then he mentioned Nog's request and continued that now that Lenly knew about the Baruch family's problems, his father had asked him to tell him that he really hoped Lenly would be able to find the Baruch family relic. Lenly repeated the word killer blade in surprise and tried to imagine what it might look like. Hillman began to explain that the killer blade had been passed down from generation to generation in the Baruch family for 500 years. It represents the family's pride, and with it, the dragon blood's abilities become much better. Lenly listened carefully and promised to help his father and find him, and asked Hillman to keep an eye on Nog as he intended to return to the academy. Lenly turned around and took to the air, a plan already in his head. Meanwhile, back at the Wellen Academy, which was located in Fung Lai Village, and wasn't as cool as the Magic Academy, but it was also famous. The beautiful Alice was sitting in her room, reading her cards. Lenly was very much in her heart, and for some reason she had a feeling of anxiety for him. She laid the cards out again and again, but they kept coming up with terrible bad luck waiting for Lenly. Throwing the deck of cards on the floor, Alice stared at one point in despair. She was upset. She turned her attention to the cards and kept thinking why this person kept falling out, and what could he be hiding. For the first time, she did not understand anything about cards. Suddenly a voice came from behind her. It was Kaylin, and he asked if she was thinking about that guy Lenly again. The girl jumped in surprise. Turning around, she took a breath and told him that she was just thinking about Lenly, who had saved her, and that she hadn't thanked him properly for saving her. Kaleen looked at her suspiciously, and it was clear that he did not like her thoughts. He abruptly walked over and took Alice by the shoulders and told her that, according to the schedule, their vacation with Lenly would be at different times, so the chance of their meeting was very small, and he demanded that Alice pay more attention to him because he would become stronger than Lenley. It was obvious that he was very annoyed. Alice defiantly asked him who he was to try to control everything from her. She did not like Kalan's behavior. Meanwhile, Lenley continued his journey to the Magic Academy. Looking up, he saw a signpost and thought he must have arrived, but it said, Fung Lai City. But for some reason, his thoughts were filled with the image of a beautiful girl. Alice, her face constantly popping up in his memory. He couldn't understand why he kept thinking of her when he was supposed to be looking for the killer's blade. Suddenly he remembered that Alice had said that her home was near the gates of Fung Lai, and he decided that since he was here, he might as well check it out. Lenly looked carefully toward the city gates in search of a house and saw that there was indeed one. He approached the door and knocked. The door opened and a man came out. Lenly asked if this was where Alice lived and the man replied that it was, but that she had gone to study at the academy. Lenly turned around and left a little disappointed. Baby the mouse kept asking him why he was upset, and why he was silent and ignoring her. But Lenly continued to be silent. Suddenly he heard a familiar voice behind him, and everything turned inside him. It was the silhouette of a girl running toward him and calling out. It was Alice, and it seemed that she had become even prettier since they hadn't seen each other. The girl could not hide how happy she was to see Lenly. She couldn't believe her eyes that it was really Lenly and asked him if it was true that he was looking for her. Lenly was also shocked to see her again, and replied that there were no classes at Wellen Academy today. Alice honestly admitted to him that she was skipping classes because she was constantly thinking about meeting him, who knew that she would actually see him. It was such a stroke of luck. And she laughed. Lenly stood there looking at her in awe, thinking how beautiful and sweet she was. What could he say? He began to stammer and mumble that he had something important to say to her. Something like, but then Alice interrupted him and asked if he believed in fate. To which the dumbfounded Lenly blurted out that God himself had prepared this meeting for them. 
This behavior was atypical for him. Alice laughed loudly and resonantly and took him by the hand and pulled him somewhere. She wanted to show him something. After flying away, she asked Lenly if he knew that this was the place where the magic of the earth element was superimposed, which can create space. And she pointed at the ground with her finger. It means that he can create his own space by drawing a circle of symbols on the ground. And if there are two identical symbols, only two people can enter it. I think it's a vow ring, Lenly muttered. That's right, let's draw it, suggested Alice cheerfully. Our magic symbol? Lenly asked her again. He was so surprised to see her and to hear her suggestion. She went on to explain that when two people create a vow ring, they must both have a high level of synchronicity with each other to complete what they have started. The higher the level, the harder it will be to break the spell. And they began to draw symbols on the ground. When they finished drawing, Alice loudly exclaimed that this was now Alice and Lenly's territory, and their bodies were enveloped in a ring of magic that turned into a dome. We are completely synchronized, Aaliyah shouted joyfully. Lenly could not say a word. They held hands and watched this miraculous performance in silence. Killen was watching from a distance, shocked by what he saw, and whispered that he would not let this go. He was really angry. Lindley and Alice said goodbye and the boy returned to the Magic Academy. The first day of his studies began. Outside, the air elemental teacher began training. All the students in the new school year moved to the next class, where they studied magic from the third to the fifth level. The teacher announced that everyone should try to fly above the ground, using their mental power of the air, element, and a magic symbol. First of all, they must purify their hearts, and if they learn this once, they will be able to follow the wind. All the students began to puff and try to rise into the air. The teacher's attention was drawn to Lenly, who skillfully hung in the air and took out a book and began to read with Bebe the mouse. The teacher looked at him in amazement and thought that this Lenly, his technique of using hovering was close to the sixth level, and maybe even higher. He was extremely surprised. Meanwhile, Lenly was carefully reading the encyclopedia of plants that he had borrowed from the library of the academy. He read that he could use the blue heart herb to become a dragon blood warrior. At the same time, he thought that it was not surprising that it was very rare and that the herb he had collected would not be enough. The boy thought about it. Delon, who was watching him, said that of course if he wanted to become a dragon blood warrior, he would need at least seven bundles. Lenly listened to her and replied that this meant that it was time for him to go back to the mountains. Suddenly Delia flew up to the boy and said that Lenly was very good at hovering. Lenly was a little frightened by her sudden appearance and asked Delia, What did she say? And the girl replied that she was very eager to know what had happened in the mountains. Lenly began to tell her sadly. Lenly told her everything he had encountered in the mountains, about all the animals and the battles he had fought with them, and how he had met Alice and her friends. The girl listened attentively without interrupting him. The boy closed his book and finished his story, but Delia's face showed that something was wrong. He asked her again what was wrong. She looked at him with her beautiful eyes and replied that she was trying to imagine what this Alice looked like. Delia was upset about something. Lenly quickly recalled the image of the beautiful Alice and promised Delia to introduce them next time, saying that he thought she was very nice. At that moment, the magic of floating disappeared from both of them, and they fell painfully to the ground. Vibi and Delon watched them from afar. The mouse rolled her eyes and said that she thought her boss had been acting very strange lately, and that this girl was a little strange too. Delon smiled mysteriously and told her that she was experiencing a complicated love triangle and really hoped that it wouldn't affect Lenly's training. She didn't like this at all, and it wasn't part of the plan. Lenly stood in his dorm room and put on his armor. His second trip to the Magic Beast Mountain Range was about to begin. Mouse was also going to go to fight with a businesslike look. The boys in Yale wished him good luck and promised that they would keep an eye out for information about the whereabouts of the killer's blade. Lenly thanked them sincerely, and Bebe the mouse stuffed the chicken legs one by one, thinking that he should have taken more. As the journey began, Lenly was flying and remembered Delon's words. 
telling him that his mental power had already reached the seventh level of magic, but his magical power was still at the sixth level. He also recalled that the beasts from the canyon were in packs, and although the chance of victory was not great, it was still greater than the last time. So, who is a knight of dragon blood? There are two ways to use dragon blood to become a dragon blood warrior. The first is to determine the amount of dragon blood in one's body, and the second is to drink the blood of a living dragon to activate the knight's blood. The blood of a live dragon is very strong. Even getting it on the skin can be harmful not to mention drinking it. But there is a solution to this problem and it was the blue heart herb. It had to be mixed with the dragon's blood. But one bush is not enough. The more blood you needed to drink, the more herb you needed. The test showed that Lenly's dragon blood was not enough to become a dragon blood warrior. So he needed the blue heart herb to train and become a dragon blood knight. Lenly firmly decided before his journey that he would try something to become a full-fledged dragon blood knight. After a short period of time, they all landed on a mountainous abundance of magical beasts near the familiar misty canyon where he had found the grass last time. Dylan summarized that usually people don't return to the misty canyon a second time, but her Lenly came back for another adventure. Lenly blurted out that he would do it for his family and abruptly jumped into the canyon. While Lenly was flying, he decided to prepare himself some improved armor and cast the seventh level jade level earth armor spell. And the spirit of the guy's elemental aura began to take the form of a water drop, which meant that Lenly was beginning to become a seventh level mage. Dylan watched him and said that his armor looked much better this time, not like the last time when it was just a pile of rocks. Suddenly, Baby the mouse noticed the flock of dragon hawks from last time. But on this trip, the dragon hawks could not do anything to Lenly. His jade armor completely protected him from the birds. The mouse flew on Lenly's shoulder with delight and demanded the same armor for himself, because he saw how useful it was. The boy laughed at this little warrior. After flying some distance, they both noticed a blue heart grass growing ahead. B. the mouse took a closer look and said that the grass was growing in a clearing, right next to where a dragon was sleeping. Delin flew over and advised him not to use his magic for the time being, because if he fought an eighth-level beast, his jade armor would not help, but rather disturb the beast. Suddenly, B.B. exclaimed that she was taking over. Lenly could not understand what she was talking about. The mouse magically transformed into a beast mouse and crawled on the dragon's belly to collect the magic blue heart herb. She did it as quietly as possible, and the dragon continued to sleep. Suddenly, a twig cracked under her paws, and the dragon woke up. Baby cuddled into the grass with a whole pile of grass in her paws. Delin and Lenly whispered to her not to hurry. And at that moment, she thought of pretending to be dead. She lay there and didn't move, pretending to be rotten, thinking that she was just a shadow mouse running by and hoping not to be eaten. The dragon looked at her in surprise. But her plan was to concentrate and gather all her strength and with the strong paws of a beast mouse, she jumped high to the frightened Lenly and Delon and succeeded. Lenly rushed to hug her and praise her for being so smart. Mouse replied in a business-like manner that the dragon was a complete idiot and that as long as she was in the business, all problems were solved very easily. The guy was looking at the pile of grass and was really happy to have such a prey. And then, he told everyone that there were mysterious killers in this mountainous abundance an unreasonable weakness of elemental magic. This mysterious canyon became more and more interesting to them. And with the words, let's check it out, Lenly rushed to the bottom of the canyon. As he flew, he wondered what else was in the depths of this mysterious canyon. After a while, he landed flat on a rock, which meant that he had finally mastered the hovering technique. Suddenly, Baby the Mouse froze as he saw something in the dark depths of the canyon again. It was a Velochi underground dragon, a level 8 beast that lives only in the depths of the canyon. These dragons are larger than ordinary Velochi dragons, and although it is an 8th level beast, its mind is not that weak compared to a human. Dealing swore that it was a Velochi underground dragon 100%. Lenly exclaimed to her that he now realized that more and more dragons were hiding at the bottom, so it was no wonder she hadn't seen them before. Lenly told the girl that if they were earth dragons, 
he could maneuver them out of the way. He shouted the wind elemental spell flight and displacement. He followed it up with wind detection. To help him see better ahead, Delin noticed that his wind magic had attracted another dragon. It was an eighth-level metal-winged dragon, a blue-colored beast. Bebby the Mouse screamed in panic that the dragons were attacking from all sides, and they were more frightening and stronger than before. Linley noticed that his speed was no longer enough, and turned to Delin and asked what other spells could help him escape. Let me think, Delin exclaimed to him, excited. You're being chased by three eighth-level beasts, and you're a seventh-level mage. Linley realized that he had to do something right now and cast the Earth Armor spell, Jade Level, and instantly he was back in his suit. Suddenly the metal-winged dragon struck him on the armor, but despite the force of the blow, his Earth Armor did not allow the blow to be fatal. Suddenly Delin saw a light up ahead and realized that it must have been a cave and ordered everyone to hide there. Seeing the metal-winged dragon continue to chase after Lenly, she loudly warned him that his armor was damaged by the previous attack and might not be able to withstand the next one. Lenly flew with all his might, thinking that he would definitely survive if he got out through her. As Delon flew closer, she noticed that the entrance to the cave was sealed with magic, probably to keep the dragons out, she thought. Meanwhile, Lenly was running for his life, chased by a metal-winged dragon. But the dragon managed to hit Lenly before he entered, and the boy fell bitterly on the stones. Raising his head, he asked if Bibi was okay. The mouse had gotten stuck between the stones and was begging to be pulled out. Lenly looked at the entrance to the cave and asked where it led and why it was sealed. Suddenly, they both heard strange sounds. Someone laughed and shouted, Sarchus! It was a level nine beast, the purple tattooed bear. Three hundred years ago, the metal-winged dragon had scratched out his eyes and made him blind, and now the bear was threatening to kill him at last. Dalin listened to the bear and did not believe that it could speak. Suddenly it started to cry out, Oh no! And Lenly saw Delin quickly hide in the ring hanging around his neck. He wondered what she was doing. Delin sat frightened in the ring with her feet together, shrunken a thousand times. She explained to Lenly that it was a saint-level beast that could talk and fly. Its magical abilities were so strong that it would definitely notice her, so she was hiding in the ring for her safety. While they were talking, Baby the Mouse was sneaking up on the bear to bite him in the ear. Deline stopped this fearless individual. Lenly looked at the bear and thought that saint-level animals should look different. Meanwhile, the bear was saying that after all these years, he would finally take revenge. Who would have thought you were locked here in a place filled with power? Linley couldn't understand who he was talking to, but he looked more closely into the darkness. Suddenly, a level nine armored serpent dragon flew out of the darkness. He shouted at the bear that he was a cursed animal, and how dare he laugh at him. His size amazed everyone. Suddenly, his eyes stopped on Lenley, and he noticed him hiding behind a pile of rocks. But for some reason, he did nothing. Lenley thought that the dragon had ignored him, perhaps because of the enemy standing in front of him. At that moment, the bear stood on its hind legs, making it seem even bigger and scarier, with growths on its paws like a dragon. The dragon looked at him and exclaimed, Sarsius, you used to be so proud, but that was a long time ago. And he too stood on his hind legs. The bear replied that he had now overtaken him and had finally reached the saintly level. And then, in front of Lenly's eyes, the purple tattooed bear rushed at the armored snake. The force with which they rushed at each other began to shake everything around them. With a roar and a crash, they joined together and began to roll across the stone plateau. Lenly covered his ears because he was deafened by the sound. The two beasts stood on their hind legs and roared at each other. Both of them were just enormous. You have no more strength to fight back. Give up now, one of them shouted. In this tangle, it was impossible to make out which of them was shouting. And then the bear grabbed the dragon by the tail and it jerked, and a good piece of it came off. The dragon screamed in pain. This is your weak spot, the bear growled, and indeed the dragon's tail was the most vulnerable part of it. From the bite and tugging, the dragon instantly dropped a part of its tail like a lizard. It seemed that this was his defensive reaction. The bear triumphantly lifted it over his head. But knowledgeable people said that dragons usually do not use this tail maneuver, 
until the very last moment. They do it only when they want to kill the enemy with them. When the dragon's tail was dropped, dragon scales rose on its back. This meant that something was wrong. The bear looked and thought for a moment. It was indeed armor made of blades. This armored dragon crest could cut through everything around it with absolute ease. The dragon turned its back on the bear and flew past it as close as possible, slicing through the bear's body with its blades. Lenly stared at the two monsters in amazement and now listened to the bear's scream of pain. The decisive moment was coming. One maneuver, and that was it. Who would win? But both monsters instantly fell with a thud, and there was no winner. Only a huge mountain of bloody bodies now lay silent. There was a deafening silence. They were lying right at the boy's feet. Suddenly, Delin shouted to Lenly that this was a chance to find out if he could become a dragon blood warrior. This opportunity must not be missed. Next to the bodies was a mangled dragon's tail. When he finally woke up from his stupor and heard her words about dragon blood, he finally realized that he had gathered enough blue heart herb and this was his chance to become a dragon blood warrior right now. He quickly flew up to the dragon's head, but it turned out that the dragon was still alive and instantly opened its mouth when it saw the boy. Delin screamed at him to be careful. Dylan was just a disembodied soul with very limited energy, but she flew up to the dragon's head and used her powers to restrain it a little bit. Babe the mouse shouted for Lenly to put on the jade armor immediately. But Lenly shouted loudly that it was too late and he would not have time to do it. Babe the mouse immediately transformed into a beast and shouted, Boss, I'm coming to your rescue, and rushed to her beloved master. She fearlessly and with all her might hit the dragon's head with her whole body and he started screaming out of surprise and pain. But of course their strength was not equal, and the dragon threw Bibi away with one paw. Even with such wounds as his, he was still strong. Bibi lay unconscious on the stones. Lenly, who was not far away, felt a wild pain in his head, all because he was bound to the mouse by a contract. He also screamed in pain. And in that moment of pain, Lenly stopped feeling Bibi's mouse. The boy's eyes instantly became bloodshot. There was a lump in his throat and his temples were pounding. He loved his little friend, his assistant, with all his heart. So in a rage he shouted at the dragon, drawing attention to himself. Lenly wanted revenge right now. Lenly ran as fast as he could toward the dragon. Delin flew behind him and shouted that he was crazy. It was a level 9 armored dragon, and even when wounded it was very strong. Lenly would not be able to resist it, but the guy could not hear her. He was out for revenge. The boy took to the air and started circling the dragon, confusing it as it tried to follow him. Everyone saw that Lenly was preparing to cast one of his spells. He was fully concentrated, and the stones at his feet began to rise into the air. Lenly shouted, Flat Blade! And the spell began to work, illuminating everything around him with a pink light. He flew up to the dragon and began to slash at everything he could with all his anger, gritting his teeth. Lenly skillfully and coldly cut the dragon's body, making large and small cuts with his flat blade. Delin looked at him with horror in her eyes. The dragon was screaming like a mongrel lizard. The guy shouted, Let Bay Bay go, and began to attack mercilessly again, no longer feeling anything around him but his anger. He immediately shouted the following spell, Earth Spikes. Sharp stone spikes began to grow out of the ground, piercing the dragon's entire body, and he began to scream in pain. Suddenly, Lenly managed to fly very close to the dragon's mount and, using all his fencing and magic powers, slashed a flat blade across its throat. The blood hit the guy right in the face, and he choked on some of it, but he didn't even notice. He kept on cutting. The boy, shouting that he wanted to take revenge for Bebe, rushed at the dragon with all his anger. But the dragon noticed him and turned around with his whole body and grabbed his body in its claws. It brought him too close to its snout, and the boy's whole life flashed before his eyes. And Lenly thought that it was probably the end, but the boy heroically looked into the eyes of his enemy. It seemed that he was made of anger and revenge, and then the dragon roared, and he fell dead. Lenly fell out of his claws, and a terrible roar and his last breath were heard all around. Lenly's face was covered with the dragon's blood, and he could not understand what had happened to the dragon.
Dylan shouted that Lenly had defeated the dragon. Even though he was injured, we shouldn't forget that it was still a level nine beast. Lenly sat there and could not get up. He was in terrible pain inside. He could not breathe normally. He started coughing and choking. And suddenly, Dylan had an idea and shouted to him that he was sick because he had drunk the dragon's blood, and now he had to eat the blue heart herbs. Lenly took the herbs out of the bag with the last of his strength and began to chew them. There was no other option. Suddenly he felt that he was getting worse. All the blood in his body began to boil. He could not understand what was wrong with him and why it was not working. Dellen explained to him that after he drank the dragon's blood, his own blood began to boil, which is why he was in so much pain. The boy started screaming in agony. The girl also could not understand what the reason was. Either the herb did not work, or the dragon's blood was too strong. Something happened that was not clear, and suddenly, in front of everyone's eyes, a dragon's tail began to grow on Lenly's body. His skin began to be covered with dragon scales, and horns began to grow on his head, like a real dragon. The boy began the process of dragonization. He fell to his knees in pain screaming an animalistic cry, blood flowing from his mouth. Dylan quickly put her hands on Lenly's hot head and shouted that he must hold on because she was using magic to keep the dragon's blood out. And then suddenly, she heard Lenly mumbling something, and she was frightened, thinking that the boy had gone mad. But in fact, Lenly was reading the Dragon Blood Secret Manual, to be more precise. He was reading the hidden part of the manual that mentioned how to activate the power of dragon blood. Suddenly, Lenly began to scream as if he was being cut, and Dellen was very frightened and flew to the side. The boy was lying on the lawn, screaming in a voice that was not his own, his body twisting in different directions. This scream woke up Bebe the mouse. She started calling out to her boss, but she could not understand what was happening. She flew to Lenly and began to shake him, saying that she was fine now and asking him to regain consciousness. But Lenly did not respond. Suddenly his body began to be covered with scales and spikes again, and he sat up, regaining consciousness. Mouse told him in surprise that he smelled like a dragon. Lenly's head was covered with spikes like a crest right in front of the surprised BB, his eyes glowing with fire like a dragon's. Finally the mouse realized that its boss was transforming into a dragon and had already passed the first and second stages. And now the third stage had come. Lenly got back to his feet. His skin turned blue and covered with scales, his height doubled and his clothes were bursting at the seams, and dragon spikes grew all over his body. Finally, Lenly looked at his blue scaled hands and saw that he now had the body of a dragon. He could not believe his eyes. Delin looked at him with the mouse and said that this was really the power of a dragon. She had no idea that members of the Baruch family had the power to transform into dragons. She was very surprised and saw it live for the first time in her life. Meanwhile, Lenly tried to fly up into the air, but his strength left him, and he fell back to the ground. Meanwhile, Baby the Mouse also began to transform into the form of a beast. She flew up to her beloved boss, and Lenly opened his eyes and whispered happily that it was so good that she was alive. She honestly admitted to him that for a moment she thought she was going to die and told him that the passage to the cave was open and began to load Lenly on her back to pull him out. Dellen watched in amazement as this mouse flew up with Lenly and carried him and thought that this mouse had recently survived the attack of a level 9 armored serpent and was able to survive. It was strange and impossible. The girl began to put her thoughts together and thought that maybe this shadow mouse was related to the man from the dark forest in the northern region of Yulan. Maybe she was his creation. Then Delling thought that Lenly's transformation was a definite success. It seemed that Lenly's ancestors were much stronger than her. Seeing a dragon blood descendant and a mutated shadow mouse in front of her, Delling couldn't put it all together. She looked at the two of them and thought that as long as they were together, Something else would probably happen in the future. It seemed to her that the Yulan continent would definitely be turbulent for sure. Meanwhile, Alice stood in the yard of the house. She was in a great mood, looking as charming as ever and singing songs. Suddenly she heard their butler calling her. She turned around and saw him running scared to her. 
He was shouting that something was wrong with her father and that she should go see him as soon as possible. The girl rushed to the house and when she ran in, she saw her old father sitting in a chair with a strange man hovering over him, shouting at him that he was in debt and if he didn't pay it off, he would become his slave. At once the stranger looked around and saw the beautiful Alice. He smiled lustfully and blurted out that he did not know the old man had such a beautiful daughter and they would probably take her with them as collateral. Help! Alice's mind flashed. The girl realized what was happening to her and quickly ran to the riverbank. She sat there crying and mentally calling out to Lenly, asking him to help her. Because she needed him so much right now, she asked him to come back as soon as possible. Why is it that when I need you so much you are not even around? Alice cried bitterly. A familiar voice sounded behind her. She turned around and saw a familiar hand holding out a bag of gold. The familiar voice said, Take this gold as a token of my attention. The Debs family will cover all your debts. It was Kalen, standing in front of the sun in all his glory, confident and handsome. He came closer to the surprised Alice and told her that no matter what trouble she got into, he would always be there for her. At that moment, Alice remembered her card readings and thought that maybe the cards showed her betrothed not to be Lenly, but Kalen. Meanwhile, the events are transferred back to Lenly. At the bottom of a mysterious foggy canyon, in a cave under a boulder, there was something truly magical. Dylan flew around and looked closely, and she came to the conclusion that there seemed to be a very strong, magical seal. In the center was a sword of unprecedented beauty, glowing with a purple glow. Delin looked at it and made her guesses. Who put this sword there? Who put the seal on it? Maybe it was to hold a level nine dragon? She was silent, and after a minute, she let out that this magic seal was very complicated. Even a level nine armored serpent didn't need such a strong seal. Suddenly, a beast mouse landed beside her, bringing Lenly, who had already regained consciousness, on it. Delin joyfully rushed over to him and asked him if he had seen this amazing sword and magic seal. She told him in a businesslike manner that she did not know why this powerful seal was there, but that this sword was very valuable. Lenly looked at the sword and replied that most likely someone very powerful had put this seal. Dylan could not stand it and nervously shouted that this was why she had to take it away. And did Lenly realize how high the price was? It doesn't have an owner anyway. But Lenly reminded her that he was looking for the blade of the Baruch family's killer. Dylan didn't want to hear anything. She argued with him that this particular sword must have cost several thousand gold coins to create and that it was priceless. The aura of this long sword was very unusual and it was most likely one of the four blades of the higher realms from the Hell Continuum. She was very determined. Lenly listened to her tantrum in shock and replied that he knew nothing about the four realms or the Continuum. Dylan rolled her eyes and clicked her tongue. After taking in more air, she began to explain that on the Yulan continent, Lenly is one of the strongest in his nation, so it was time to teach him something else about existence. There are four higher realms of being. The Continuum of Life, the Divine Continuum, the Lower Continuum, and the Continuum of Hell. After the saintly level is God, and after the divine level are the rulers, and above the rulers are the four super deities. Whether we are talking about a shining overlord or a shadow cult overlord, they are just overlords, although they have advantages, but they still need the strength of faith of their followers. Super deities are different. They don't need followers. Lenle listened to her and pretended to understand everything. The boy interrupted Delon by saying that he wanted to try to use the power of transformation into a dragon, namely, dragonization. He was very curious about what he had become. Lenly approached the mysterious sword and took it by the hilt and began to pull it. He noticed that a strange, strong aura was emanating from the sword, and finally the sword was in Lenly's hands. The boy happily showed Delon that he had gotten it, and thought that after he touched it, the sword seemed to come to life. And then he recognized the sword. It was the flexible blade. It was the one his teacher had told him about at the academy. Delon was extremely happy that the boy had gotten the sword. It was a really great treasure. She boastfully called herself the lucky star of Lin Lee. 
The boy reminded her that he almost died with such luck. The girl abruptly ordered everyone to fly out of the cave. She thought the passage might close again. And everyone flew to the exit of the cave. After the magic stopped supporting the seal, the rocks of the cave entrance really closed. When everything was quiet, suddenly an unusual guy appeared from under the ruins. He had blue hair tied in a ponytail, a beautiful face and a golden robe, and he was holding three puppies. The stranger said, I'm finally free. He looked around carefully and asked himself if this was really the continent of Yulan, and he exclaimed joyfully that it was all just amazing. The puppies were also looking at everything with curiosity. Suddenly they told him, Daddy, we are hungry. The stranger pulled them down and said that there must be many small dragons around, which should be enough to feed them. And immediately, the little puppies grew into six-eyed lions with wings, and a transformation took place. They pounced on the dragon's body and began to eat it. The stranger looked at them with satisfaction and exclaimed joyfully, Eat, my children. We still have a lot of work to do. I believe that this time we will be more lucky than 5,000 years ago. Meanwhile, in the heart of the Yulan continent, a magnificent castle with towers rose up. In the room by the window, a well-dressed man stood. When another stranger came up to him and reported that their people from the Mountain Fortune had sent a letter saying that someone had entered the forbidden zone of the Misty Canyon and killed a level 9 armored serpent. The head of the Fung Lai Kingdom, Clyde, was standing by the window. Without turning around, he asked who had done it. This means that the magic seal has been broken. The speaker answered, frightened that no one knew anything. The chairman attacked him, shouting why he was still standing there, taking him by the scruff of the neck and saying, Go check on those who have recently entered the room. He threw him out of the room. The head of the kingdom was very angry, which meant that the creature that was hidden there was now free and it was urgent to find it. It was the 1st of January, which meant that the Yulan Festival, the biggest holiday on the entire continent, was beginning. There would be a festive ceremony at the Shining Church on that day. People came from different places to take part in the celebration near the Shining Hall in the west of Feng Lai. Lenli was among the crowd, along with Bebe the mouse who was dreaming of eating fried chicken legs today. Lenly noticed that the busy city was completely different from life in the mountainous abundance. The boy wandered among the people looking at everything around him. It was his first time at this festival, and everything was really beautiful and colorful. Delon flew alongside him and kept chattering about how there would be many noble families here today, most likely to participate, and they all needed grant protection. Lenly would even be able to see the kings of the Holy Alliance. Suddenly a crowd of people shouted, pointing toward the boy. Ghost! Bebe also started screaming that something had touched her face, and it was definitely some kind of ghost in broad daylight. Lindley whispered to Dellen that she had flown into the flag fabric and everyone thought they were seeing a ghost, but she had already flown into the ring and was sitting quietly. Lindley was making fun of her. Deline got out of it and told him that she wasn't scared, but that there were saint-level fighters in the crowd and they could sense her, so she would stay in the ring for a while to avoid getting caught. Lenly thought about her words. The guy stopped. The knights defending the Shining Church passed him. She could afford it. And Lenly was already thinking that he needed to get stronger as soon as possible, because now his abilities were not enough. And then the crowd gasped. Everyone saw a living bishop. The bishop, dressed in white robes, was riding in a gorgeous white chariot accompanied by knights also dressed in white. Lenly looked at him and asked himself, This must be the leader of the Shining Church. Why did he get goosebumps? Suddenly, Bebe the mouse started to screech in his ear. She saw Alice in the crowd. Lenly looked closely, and it was indeed her. Dressed as always beautifully, Alice was standing and watching the procession as well. He approached her and called out to her. The girl could not believe her eyes and asked him if he had returned from the mountainous abundance. But Lenly was silent, because for some reason he saw Kalan behind her. The boy was very surprised. Kalan asked him angrily that he might be a follower of the Shining Church, and had come to take part in the ceremony. Lenly did not answer. The boy calmly told Kalan that he was not an ordinary follower, and actually wanted to talk to Alice alone, 
and asked him to leave them. Keelan started to get angry and rude, telling Lenly that he was talking to him alone, a low-class boy. Lindley asked him again what he said. The boy gritted his teeth in anger. He pushed Kalen in the chest. He started yelling how dare he start a fight during the festival. Alice rushed to break them up. She looked at Lenley with sad eyes and said she would talk to him. Taking the boy by the arm, they left. But Baby the Mouse showed her tongue to the clansman, and Kalen shouted at her to get out of here and called her a rat. But Kalen started to chase her again, calling her a rat but it was hard to catch up with the mouse and she called him an idiot and offered to run after her. Alice and Lenley came out to the clearing and it was hard for both of them to start this conversation. The girl started first, stammering and telling him that at first she really liked Lenley. But now that she had been with him, she realized that a lot of their relationship was incompatible. She continued that in her heart. Lenley was a real hero who had come down from heaven but she realized that this would not be enough. Kaelin, for example, could easily solve her father's gambling debts at the expense of her family and future, Alice said. Lenley asked her if this was the only reason she thought Kaelin was a better match for her. Alice burst into tears and said yes. Lindley sadly replied that he understood her well. He silently turned and walked away from her. Alice shouted after him, asking if they could still be friends. Lenley was cold with nervousness, but he nodded his head silently. Alice stood there and cried her eyes out, feeling sorry for herself and Lenley. After saying goodbye, Lenley returned to the Magic Academy, to dormitory number 109. All the boys in the dorm were watching their conversation, and they were crying too. Yale told them all that he had just found out Lenley's heart was broken, but he thought the guy was calm. Lenley sat by a stone and meditated for a very long time. Suddenly, he took out his flat blade and began to carve something with it. The boys gasped. Is he making sculptures? exclaimed Yale. Lenley continued to carve something, moving the knife easily. His thoughts were all about Alice. The guy was really hurt by their last conversation. He was in love with her. After twenty minutes, a sculpture was already visible from the huge boulder. Lenley carved five images of the girl, showing her in different emotions. The boys were amazed by her beauty. Yale said that it was obvious that he was feeling very sick. The nerd was amazed at her appearance and the time spent, and the third guy shouted that it was supernatural skill. Meanwhile, Lenley was finishing his sculpture thinking that this year was just like a dream, and now he was finally starting to wake up from it. He looked at his creation and decided to call it Waking Up From A Dream. He felt lousy at heart. The sculpture was completed. Delin flew around it in awe and looked at it carefully, and Bebe the mouse was also shocked. Delin flew up to him and told him that he had reached the level of master in working with stone. She realized that the story with Alice had hurt him, but she reminded him that he shouldn't forget that they had many important tasks to accomplish, and Lee looked at her with tear-dry eyes as if he had really woken up. He exclaimed that indeed, he must become the pride of the Baruch family and avenge his mother. He turned around and walked to the dormitory. His friends who had been following him scattered to avoid him. Lenley walked into the room and saw that all three of his friends were sitting at the table, each of them doing something. It looked rather strange. The boy kept thinking about something, and he said out loud the words of the poem, Ask the world what love is. He is very sick. Yale continued to read the poem after him and said, Moonlight in front of the bed, relationships are like dreams. Lenley looked at his friend in silence. He thought that his friends were still worried about him. He had to think of something to get out of this situation. So he pulled out a flexible blade and hit the table. It split into pieces, hitting Yale in the head. Lenley cheerfully exclaimed that his ability to read poetry was amazing, so he wanted to fight him and he showed everyone his cool sword. Yale laughed and said he was ready to help Lenley with this pain, and was even willing to take the blows. The nerd exclaimed that it was so rare for the four of them to get together, but it was so cool. Instantly, Lenley became gloomy and told them that he wanted to tell everyone something, and the boy blurted out that he was going to apply for early graduation and leave the Magical Academy. The room was silent, and all the guys were stunned, unable to say a word. After a while, all the students and teachers gathered in the magic arena of the academy 
to test Lenly's abilities and consider his application. Lenly stood in the middle of the arena, and the examiner asked him if he was using this reason to graduate so early and take the seventh level mage test. Lenly answered yes, he was confident in his abilities. The crowd of students began to whisper, all saying that it was impossible for him to reach the seventh level in two years. No one believed that he could graduate early, and only Lenly was confident. The teacher looked at him carefully and told him to show him a seventh level spell for evaluation. Lenly used a seventh level flight technique and quietly and smoothly flew into the sky. The boy performed a perfect aerial coup. His flying technique was much more advanced than when he was on the mountainous abundance of magical beasts. He had reached the point where he could safely move in the air. The wind elemental teacher was watching him fly, and he was amazed that Lenly's technique was better than his. The examiner asked him to show him something else from the seventh level. Lenly quickly flipped over in the air and flew over to him and tore off his hat, and the examiner came to his senses without him. He said that everything was fine. If he was able to take away even his hat without being noticed, it proved that his abilities had reached the seventh level of a magician. The examiner went to the middle of the arena and loudly told everyone that according to the rules of the academy, Lenly had passed the exam and qualified as a dual element mage and officially graduated from the academy. The crowd roared with joy. It was unheard of. Lenly stood there, feeling very proud of himself. He had worked hard to become a seventh-level mage in such a short time. His friends rushed to congratulate him. And only Jean stood there, thinking that from the first day of training, he knew that this guy was no ordinary guy. In fact, he was one of the fastest students to reach the seventh level before us. Jean was not very happy about these events because he was Lenly's eternal competitor. He kept thinking that Lenly had gotten better too quickly, and even if he tried to catch up, it would be difficult because his ability was only level six. Delia stood next to him, and Jean told her that he thought there was nothing left to learn at the academy, so he would probably prepare for graduation as well and return to his family. All the students moved to celebrate at the large and luxurious hotel of Yale Dawson's family. That night, everyone was saying goodbye to him. He was graduating, which meant that he would be separated from everyone. Yale set up gorgeous tables that were bursting with the best food and drinks and told him that although he was leaving the academy, he asked him not to forget about the Dawson conglomerate's invitation. Lenly thanked him sincerely for everything he had done for him. Beeb the mouse was sitting and eating chicken legs, and Yale put a whole plate in front of her. Delin sat not far from her, and she was sincerely jealous that she could eat unlike her. Meanwhile, Yale hugged Lenly and exclaimed that Lenly had finally become better than him, and now he had a live commercial. The boy laughed back because he was always thinking about money. Suddenly, a servant came into the room and handed him a letter addressed to Lenly. The boy opened the envelope and was horrified to see what he read. The letter said that his father, Nog, continued to search for his wife's killer. The evidence he found became clearer and clearer. And then... A group with a spider's mark started hunting him down, and he was unable to escape. Master Nog was dead, read a shocked Lenly, his pupils dilating. This letter was from Captain Hillman, where he also wrote that while they were searching for the killer, they were constantly surrounded by some mysterious people. He was lucky to come back alive, but he was badly injured. All he could do was write this letter about Nog's father. Gale asked him in shock what he was going to do now. Suddenly the servant came back in and reported that special guests had arrived. They were the defenders of the Shining Church, and they brought a group of knights to the hotel. By the way, the leader of the cardinals was higher in rank than even the king. Yale looked out the window and saw the knights and asked Lenly why the cardinals came to see them. The servant replied that they were looking for Lenly. The boy turned to Lenly and explained that the leader of the cardinals had come to see them. But Yale was the young head of the Dawson conglomerate, and he could not intervene in his position. Lenly understood and went downstairs to see them. In the hotel lobby, knights stood in two rows, and in the center on the couch sat a cardinal in gorgeous white clothes. The boys came down and Yale said helpfully, Welcome, leader of the cardinals. Lenly remained silent and looked at him. The cardinal looked at them carefully and said that the boys could call him Guillermo. The knights who were here came from the temple. 
Stellan had managed to hide in the ring and whispered to Lenly that the cardinal and the bishop were the leaders of the cardinals, and to become a leader, one must not only be famous, but must have the power of a mage of at least the ninth level. But the knights of the seventh level accompanying him were not weak either. The cardinal continued to speak. He had heard that a student had graduated from the Magic Academy and had become a dual elemental mage at the age of seventeen, and he was curious about what he looked like, but now he saw that Lenly was unsurpassed. Lenly, since you are a resident of the Holy Alliance lands and a citizen of these lands with excellent results in magic, I, as the head of the Cardinals, am proud of you. So I'm asking you, would you like to join the Holy Alliance? Guillermo said loudly. Lenly asked himself in surprise, was he really being invited to join the Union? He could not believe his own ears. Gail quietly told Lenly that this was an unexpected but pleasant offer, because even eighth-level mages might not receive such an honor in their entire lives. What does Lenly think about this? The boy thought to himself, if he joined the Holy Alliance now, then all his actions would be restricted by the cardinals, and how would he be able to investigate the murder of his parents? He looked into the cardinal's eyes and asked if he could wait a few years for an answer because he felt that his courage was not great enough to bear such responsibility. The cardinal could not believe what he was hearing. Had Lenly really rejected his offer? This had never happened before. Yale was shocked by what he heard and was even squealing with amazement. The cardinal thought that if they did not keep such a talented young man, and if he ever opposed the church, it would be a huge problem. And he said, If you join us, then... We will allow you to join any of the kingdoms under the Holy Alliance and grant you the title of Duke. His voice was already too loud. Gale could not understand how Lenly could refuse such wonderful conditions. Lenly calmly asked for some time to make this important decision. The knights and the cardinal gasped aloud. He's turned it down again. The cardinal began to lose his temper and hissed that it was not easy for him to show such leniency in this case to which Lenly calmly replied that he promised not to join any of the Four Empires or the Dark Alliance until he had made a decision and reported it. The Cardinal was surprised and laughed. This was the kind of conversation he liked. He asked Lenly to remember his words, for he would be waiting for news from him, and all the knights left with him. Yale, who was holding on with the last of his strength, fell to the floor. He was almost unconscious. He was scared to death. Lindley's friends who overheard the whole conversation said that it seemed to be very important for the Cardinal to get Lenley to join the Holy Union. Lenley listened to them and thought about it. Then he explained to the boys that the most important thing for him today was to find someone who had a spider tattoo and nothing else. The guy was very determined. He is the enemy of my family and there is nothing more important to me than revenge, exclaimed an excited Lenley. Although Len Li had graduated from the academy, he still had some business to take care of at the academy before returning to Wushan village. In addition to his affairs, he trained hard, realizing that it was a necessity for him. He was standing on his head in the middle of dorm room 109, with a golden glow on the floor. It was gravity field training. Standing on his hands made him stronger. Yale suddenly burst into his room shouting that he had some news. Suddenly he fell down, he tried to get up, but nothing worked. He exclaimed that Lenly had strengthened the gravitational field. His magic had become even stronger, and his heart was about to stop. Lenly turned off the gravitational field and Yale finally stood up, and he began to quickly tell him that he had just found out that the assassin's blade was in the hands of one of the Fung Lai kingdoms, namely the Lucas family. Lenly could not believe what he was hearing. The guy shouted at him that if he wanted to take the blade, he would get in trouble. Yale replied that it would be difficult, but, but I've prepared a carriage for you. There's no point in sitting around thinking. And he showed a beautiful carriage with Baby the Mouse already riding on it. Lenly quickly got into it without hesitation. While they were riding, Yale told him the details that the Lucas family is quite old and has thousands of years of history. In the kingdom of Fung Lai, they are not the richest but they have a very strong influence on the nobility. He also heard that the head of the Lucas family is a stubborn old man who collects weapons. The boys continued to ride talking through the forest. So far, 
their journey had been uneventful. Suddenly, their carriage stopped. The horses could not take a step. Yale began to get nervous and told Lenly that he would fix the situation. A tall, middle-aged woman with red hair and a scar on her face stepped out to meet the carriage. Her clothes were different from those worn on the Yulin mainland, and she had two men with her. Is this a normal way to invite someone? If you want to see Lenly, ask me. Yale yelled at her. The woman laughed out loud at his audacity and replied that if that was the case, she had no choice but to move Yale. So the two men pushed Yale to the ground and twisted his arms. But Lenly could not allow this to happen and pulled out his flexible sword. Noticing that these men had a dark power, he shouted the spell, Purple Blood. And the battle began. Lenly bravely threw himself into the uneven carnage and began to attack, but the men were not weak either. The woman watched them silently. She stood with her foot on Yale's back and said what a strange weapon Lenly had, although she was about to make her move. Her mission was to capture the boy. Meanwhile, a frightened Delon caught up with Lenly and whispered that if he fought, he would not win. There will be no winner. The fight is not equal. And there's Yale under the sword of that mimic, so don't rush, she finished. Lenly stopped for a drink and asked the woman if she would let his friend go if he went with her. Yale shouted that he should not go with her. She told him that of course they don't touch Lenly's friends, and she removed her foot from Yale. Lenly silently left with this trio. Yale was desperate, so he unharnessed his horse and decided that it would be faster without the carriage. Jumping on his horse, he went to get reinforcements to save Lenly. Meanwhile, the three strangers silently led Lenly through the oppressive forest. Delon, whom they did not see, flew alongside the boy and made guesses. She thought that these strangers came from the Dark Alliance. Lenly listened to her in amazement. Lenly remembered yesterday's arrival of the Holy Alliance. Today, the Dark Alliance came, but they were opponents. Delon, meanwhile, tracked the road and said that they would be in the Mountain Abundance after a while, and then when they passed the south of the Mountain Abundance, they would enter the Alliance territory. Suddenly, the strangers stopped and the woman shouted out to someone to stop hiding and come out to meet her. A group of hermits came out to meet them, and the leader of the group calmly told her that Lenly had joined the Holy Alliance. So why did the Dark Alliance dare to kidnap him? The Alliance seems to be showing a lot of disrespect for the Shining Church. Lenly listened in astonishment to his words, which were not true. Delon said that there was some unexplained drama. The woman replied in disappointment that, who knew that the Radiant Church would get here so quickly? It seems that Lenly is really important to this bunch of hermits. The leader of the Shining Church deserters calmly begged them to let Lenly go, as they would have no chance of winning. There were indeed many more of them. Dylan used the fact that she could not be seen or heard to hiss in the woman's ear that she had achieved her goals. The old man had unknown skills, and those four were level seven and above. She advised her to fight and giggled. The woman soberly assessed the situation and asked the old man if they let Lenly go. Could they leave in one piece? He nodded silently, and she and her gang took to the sky and shouted to Lenly that if he wanted to join the Dark Alliance at any time, their doors would always be open to him, and she quickly ran away. Beeb the Mouse also laughed at the strangers for calling Lenly strangely while running away. The leader asked him if he was okay. The mouse saw a mouse on his shoulder but it didn't look like him. Lenly looked at the leader and thought that he had kind eyes and did not have the same pressure as the cardinals. The leader invited him to go with them to the capital. At that moment, Bebe whispered to him, weren't they going to visit the Lucas family? If they went home, what would happen to the blade? And at that moment, everyone heard the sound of horses and turned around to see Yale with a whole crowd of people. He had ridden with the entire Dawson family army because he loved and protected his friend so much. But he saw that he was too late. The leader told Lenly that he hoped the boy understood that the Shining Church would always be his shield and said goodbye. Lenly thanked him sincerely. Yale exhaled and exclaimed that he now understood that help had come from the church and suggested that everyone rest. But Lenly refused. And they continued their journey. After a while, Everyone saw the house of the Lucas family. They were immediately met by a servant, who greeted them and invited them to follow him and led them into the house. Lenly was now the youngest seventh-level magician of the Yulan continent, 
and Yale was the young head of the Dawson family, and so they were not stopped when they wanted to meet with Patriarch Jabs. Upon entering the luxurious room, they saw an elderly man who welcomed them to his home. He introduced himself as Jebs, the patriarch of the Lucas family, and invited them to sit down. Bib the mouse angrily offered to scratch the patriarch's face, but Lenly stopped her. He told the patriarch that they had a favor to ask of him. The patriarch listened attentively and said, You want to get the killer's blade. He seemed to know everything. Lenly exclaimed that that was right. The Baruch family has a 5,000-year history, and their trophy killer's blade was lost. Their whole family was trying to find it. So could you. The patriarch stopped him again. He explained that collecting weapons is his hobby, and the assassin's blade is one of his favorite items in his collection, and he was even offered a large sum of money, but he did not sell it. Lenly exclaimed that he was ready to buy it for a good price. The patriarch took a sip of tea and said, Six hundred thousand. The boys almost lost their minds from what they heard. Lenly mentally repeated this crazy figure, and Dellen said that it was still quite cheap for such a thing. The guy sharply replied that even if he sold all his crystals, he could earn a few thousand, but he didn't have that kind of money. Yale thought that if he offered such a sum, Lenly would not take it. He knew his friend's temper. And then an idea came to Lenly's mind, and he shouted to Lenly that he had a sculpture that could be sold. He couldn't believe his ears. Are you talking about the same one? Yale asked him, surprised. Yes, the one I created in memory of my feelings for Alice, and I decided to sell it. Yale Lenly answered decisively. Yale, like a fool, asked him again if he was sure he wanted to sell it. Meanwhile, Dellen said that it would be really better. After all, she would not remind you of that pain every time your eyes look at her, and at the same time everyone would see the flat blade technique. Lindley turned to Jebs and said loudly that he had found a way to pay the full amount, and he would hand over the money as soon as possible. Aid Lindley asked not to sell the blade to anyone during this time. Jebs nobly assured him that even if he was offered two million gold coins, he would not sell it. Lindley thanked him profusely. He ran with Yale and asked him on the way if he could help him contact the curator of the Prue Gallery. Yale contacted the gallery curator, who was overjoyed that Lenly had agreed to sell one of his sculptures. He exclaimed that as soon as he looked at it, he felt deep feelings because it conveyed so many emotions. It will be sold for a great price. Yale looked at him and thought that his feelings were just thoughts of money. The curator told Lenly that for such a sculpture, the gallery would not even charge him to participate in the auction that was about to begin for it, and he even came up with a place where it would stand. Meanwhile, in the garden, Debs, Alice, and Kalen spent time together sitting by the pool and kicking the water. Kalan said he proposed to celebrate their wedding next year right at the Yulon Festival. He continued to persuade her by telling her that next year would be the 10,000th year of the Yulon calendar, and it was perfect for a wedding celebration and she cheerfully agreed. Callan added that he had recently heard about a famous sculptor and suggested that they go to an auction together. They started to get ready to go to the Pruhl Gallery, the most famous sculpture gallery in Yulin. Alice put on a beautiful long pink dress and styled her hair, and Callan put on a weekend suit. When he arrived at the gallery, he was surprised by the large number of people. Suddenly, Alice's eyes were drawn to the familiar silhouettes in a sculpture standing nearby. She began to look closely. As she got closer, she was horrified to see a sculpture depicting herself in five emotions. The sculpture was called Awakening from a Dream, and the author was Lenly. Strange men stood next to her, and one of them told her that the author of this sculpture was named Lenly. He was a graduate of the Magic Academy. He was only 17 years old. But the guy was already a seventh-level magician and a genius of the entire Yulin continent and maybe the greatest in its history. The girl could not make a sound from the impression. She remembered Lenly and realized that this was their last story and burst into tears. Kilan, who came up later, saw the sculpture and turned blue with anger, and began to send curses in Lenly's direction. Suddenly, his father approached them and said that he had heard that a beautiful sculpture was exhibited in this gallery, and the whole family had come to admire it, but he had not thought that Alice would be there. Gilan came over and whispered about the situation. 
The boy emotionally exclaimed that this sculpture would make a mockery of their family and asked his father to destroy it. The father assured him that he knew what to do. He ordered his son to bring men with blades to disfigure it, and the boy brought such thugs in ten minutes. The father ordered them to destroy the sculpture by pointing to Lenly's creation. And in front of everyone's eyes, a crowd of unknown men rushed to the sculpture to destroy it. All the spectators raised their eyes and screamed, and the sculpture was surrounded by masked men with blades. But then someone from the crowd cast a stopping magic that hit the bodies of the men and threw them all away from the sculpture. It was the king of the kingdom, he shouted. How dare they do this outrage on the territory of his kingdom? Call the guards and seize them, he ordered. Galen looked on in horror and realized that now the blame would fall on their family. Meanwhile, the king ordered the auction of the sculpture to begin. His father reassured him that he would support Kalen at the auction. The boy thanked him, but believed that it would be no problem for their family to get it, and then they would destroy it. A large crowd gathered in the lobby of the Pruls Gallery, where a beautiful large sculpture of Lenly stood in the center. Everyone stood and admired it until it became someone's property. The king went up to the VIP area, where he was greeted by Maya the curator of the gallery, and thanked him for keeping this beautiful sculpture intact. He asked the curator which of these people was Lenly, but Maya replied that Lenly was in the VIP room, and he would call him in a moment, but the king demanded to see the famous guy in person. Maya took the king to the room and called Lenly to greet the king. Lenly was very sad. He didn't like to sell his sculptures, in which he put his emotions and soul, and this time the sculpture meant his first feelings. He went out and bowed and greeted the king. The king looked at him in surprise and asked him if he was the youngest seventh-level dual elemental magician. You are so young and promising. Do you want to join Feng Lai's royal army? The king asked Lenly. But again, Lenly declined the invitation because he wanted to think about it before answering. Bibi the mouse thought that her boss was crazy. He had rejected the king's offer. The king coughed in surprise and explained in surprise that no one had ever turned down his personal invitations. To fill the awkward pause, he turned to Yale and asked how his father was doing. Yale bowed and thanked him for his interest, and said that thanks to the king his father was doing well. Suddenly the front door opened and Cardinal Guillermo himself came in, dressed in gorgeous white clothes. The Mayan curator greeted him and thanked him for coming on time, showing him that the king was already here. Cardinal Guillermo looked at the crowd and said with satisfaction that he had brought a lot of nobility to the auction today, so the awakening from sleep would go for a good price. Everyone was in a good mood. The curator gave both of them the auction plates and told them that the auction would start soon and invited them to the VIP boxes. The crowd of visitors buzzed with delight as they looked at the sculpture, some saying it was a work of art, others that it was beautiful. The king and the cardinal were standing on the balcony, talking. In the middle of the crowd stood an angry Kalen, who, seeing such distinguished guests, was furious that Lenly was so highly praised. His father kept calming him down and saying that he would support him. He took him to the room to prepare for the auction. The auctioneer stood at the podium and announced the opening of the auction. He also announced a bid for the sculpture, Awakening from Sleep, in the amount of one million gold. Each bid step was at least 100,000. He banged a wooden hammer and shouted, The auction has begun. The initial bid of a million was too high for most of the guests, and everyone whispered among themselves. Alice continued to cry the whole time, and Kalen calmed her down and promised not to let her and his family be embarrassed. Kalen made the first bid, and it was one and a half million. Kalen was bursting with anger. The host named their family and announced his bet. Yale snuck in and reported to Lenly that he had seen Alice in the room with Kalen. He was a sneaky spy. The bets began to rise. They announced one million seven hundred, then two million gold. Lenly watched the auction from the VIP balcony. Some chubby ladies shouted out two and a half million, and the room began to buzz loudly. The king, who was sitting next to Lenly, yawned and said that everything was very boring. Then he said quietly, let me make the auction interesting, and ordered the auctioneer to hold up a sign and shouted, Five million! The whole room turned to the square-eyed man and gasped. Everyone realized that the auction would be unusual. 
The king turned to Lenly again. This time he offered him to be his right or left hand. The boy apologized again and asked for time to think. The king no longer knew how to convince him. The host of the rally began to speak. Five million times, five million times two, and was about to knock a third time, but... And then Kalan shouted eight million. It seemed that he was going to burst. The king looked at the guy who had interrupted his great bet. The crowd began to make noise and shout. For many of those who were there, it was a lot of money. Kalan was wickedly happy, because now he could end the competition with Lenly once and for all. His father called it out loud as a sacrifice they had to make. Lenly noticed Kalen's bet. BB next to him shouted that with eight million she could buy a lot of chicken legs and would eat chicken every day. Kalen was sure that no one could beat his bet, so he shouted for everyone to go home. Yale, like a sneaky snake, suggested that Lenly hang up the bet to outbid Kalen and make him mad. But Lenly forbade him. He wanted to sell the sculpture for more money. The host announced Kalen's bid and started the countdown. He declared that eight million was an unprecedented price and asked for the sake of argument if there were any other bids. The crowd remained silent, and he began his countdown. Eight million once, eight million twice. Suddenly someone in the crowd shouted out ten million. The host almost had a heart attack. A woman's voice loudly repeated ten million. It was Delia. She had also come to the auction and announced her bid with determination. All the auction participants turned around and looked at her in surprise, whispering. Someone asked if a young girl could bid. Someone asked what family she was from. Kalen screamed in surprise, and Elisa, who was next to him, also gasped. They were very surprised by her. He shouted hysterically, Eleven million! But his father stopped him and explained that their family could not afford more than that. Alice stared at Delia's figure and could not understand who she was. Who could bet as much as ten million? Soon as Delia placed the bet, everyone knew who she was. Her manager noticed and asked her to go back into the room. Blenley stared at her figure, and it seemed painfully familiar. Suddenly a black-haired young man with a 99 sign appeared in the crowd and exclaimed that the sculpture was incredible, and he was betting eleven million. The cardinal almost fell off the balcony in surprise he recognized the stranger. The king noticed the cardinal's reaction and began to peer into the crowd looking for the one who had surprised him so much. And when he saw the young man, he also whispered in surprise, Why is he here? The boy stood on his heels in the middle of the crowd and showed his sign as a sign of confirmation of the bet. He was wearing a fox coat and a long, beautiful coat. He was young and handsome. The cardinal and the king exclaimed with one voice, The lunatic, he is here. Surprise mixed with fear on their faces. The boy said out loud with satisfaction that the sculpture was now his. He loved the process, the furor, and the result. The king could not calm down, he thought. Wasn't lunatic gone? Why did he reappear? He was really afraid of something. They both looked at him closely, and both decided not to stay any longer, so that lunatic would not notice them. The king apologized and took his leave. Lenley was surprised by their behavior. The auctioneer was frantically shouting out the bid eleven million times, eleven million twice. Dylan was paying attention and couldn't understand who had outbid her. She saw the lunatic and said, Of course. Her manager asked her if she would hurt the feelings of the guy standing in the mortar if she continued. Grandpa Sue, don't worry. Give this note to that man. He'll read it and understand, Dylan said as she handed over the note. She held the sign up high and said loudly, Twelve million! The crowd started screaming, as if everyone was going to have a heart attack from the surprise and the amount of the bet. The lunatic read the note, laughed, and said that it was okay. Since it was such a big deal, he wouldn't go against her. Three. The host hit the gavel, confirming the bet. The crowd sobered up a bit from the thud. The sculpture was finally sold. The presenter announced that the Leon family had won with a bid of twelve million, and Delia began to walk down the stairs in victory. Yale shouted that it was Delia, and Lenly's surprise was overwhelming. He looked at her and did not understand why. And then Kalan's father came up to her. It was clear that he wanted to ask her manager something. He turned to Mr. Sue, asking if this lady was a representative of the Leon family. But at that moment... Alice jumped up to her and started screaming, 
How could she do this, knowing how important the sculpture is to her? Why did you fight me? Alice couldn't calm down. Delia leaned over to her and said quietly, looking at her, that she didn't understand why Lenly liked Alice so much. It's none of your business, Alice told her. She could not control herself and rushed to Delia. But Delia turned away from her, reminding her that since they had broken up, they were now people from different worlds, and that she should remember that and walked away from her proudly. Lenly was looking at the figure of the sleepwalker from the balcony and could not understand who he was. The sleepwalker said loudly and with satisfaction that even though he was leaving, he had seen many interesting things, and it was worth it. He left the gallery cheerfully. Lenly quickly got his money and ran as fast as he could to Jabs and burst in and called out to him. The latter was sitting motionless at his desk. With the words, I'm here, you remember our agreement? Here are your six hundred thousand. The guy poured a pile of money onto his desk. For the assassin's blade, right? Jebs asked him again. Yes, that's right. Count the money, Lenly replied. Jebs said he had one more condition. He pulled out a polished stone tile and asked Lenly to carve a signature. His request was quite remarkable. Lenly pulled out his flat blade and in no time his signature was on the tile. Jebs stammered out that he was blind and didn't know that Lenly was a brilliant sculptor and apologized. The guy turned around and left with the blade. Mouse Beebe asked to be allowed to sign it herself next time, and Jabs looked at the signature on the plate with satisfaction. Lindley walked away looking at the blade and thinking that he had finally returned the family heirloom and fulfilled his father's request. Meanwhile, events were unfolding in the village of Wushan. The soldiers who were training outside noticed a group of people coming right at them, and they pointed it out to the surprised Captain Hillman. A whole cavalry of knights was coming at them, they were coming right at them, but it was impossible to see who was riding. Suddenly, a familiar voice shouted, Uncle Hillman, I'm back! It was a jubilant Lenly shouting. Hillman whispered in surprise, Lenly, what is it? What's going on? Seeing Hillman's surprised look, Lenly explained that the cardinals had sent these cavalrymen to protect him and asked them to come inside to talk. They entered the Baruch family home where every corner reminded Lenly of his joyful childhood. Then they went to the Hall of Fame. On the shelf where all the busts of deceased relatives stood, there was now a bust of Nog. Lenly knelt down and put the box that contained the killer's blade on the floor and said that he had come back and brought it, so its loss was no longer a disgrace to their family. Hillman was amazed. He asked him loudly how he had found the blade and why a bunch of cavalry with him. What did you do to achieve all this? His mind was exploding. Lenly silently handed him his certificate. Hillman read it in surprise and asked him that the seven stars were proof of seventh level magic, which was the level of a two elemental mage. So did you graduate already, Lenly? You're only 17 years old, and you already have a seventh level dual elemental mage certificate. Your father would be so proud of you. It's an honor for the entire Baruch family. You're a great boy. Your father would be proud of you. Hillman could not calm down. But what is this cavalry? Does this mean you've joined the Shining Church? The captain asked. Lenly stood up and began to explain to him that after his graduation, the cardinal came to him and offered him to join the Shining Church, but he refused. Then he received invitations from various forces who hoped that Lenly would join them. The Dark Alliance also sent people after him. And after the auction, the king of Feng Lai also wanted him to join the army. The cardinals sent cavalry to protect him on the way to Wushan village, so they didn't have to worry about other forces luring him away. Lenly concluded his story. So you've come a long way in such a short time. Wait, did you say that the king invited you too? Hillman asked again. Yes, but I want to talk about something else now. I want to know how my father died and who the enemy of the family is. Lenly blurted out decisively. The boy burst into tears and shouted for the captain to tell him everything, and Hillman began his story. It all began with an investigation into the cause of his mother's death. He and Nog found out that the year Lenly's mother was kidnapped, she was not killed immediately. The man with the spider mark was only ordered to kidnap her. The cause of her death remained a mystery, the captain said. When they decided to continue the investigation, the man with the spider mark found them and followed them constantly. 
But Master Nog knew about the properties of the spider tattoo, and it meant that together they would not have escaped. Fierce fight broke out between the unknown man and Nog, and at the end of the fight, Nog shouted at Hillman to run away. But Hillman refused to leave him, but Nog ordered him to do as he was told. The captain guiltily explained that he really wanted to stay and help his father, but he forced him to escape, and with tears he apologized to Lenly and added menacingly, but he found the one who killed his mother and father. It's the younger brother of the head of the Fung Lai kingdom, Luke Patterson. So the younger brother of King Clyde? Lenly's surprise was overwhelming. So the king invited me to join them, and his younger brother is the murderer of my parents. Lenly exploded, his eyes filled with rage. I will never forgive this, he hissed, and his fists clenched like dragon claws. I'll have my revenge. He yelled at the top of his lungs and his blood began to boil in his veins. Hillman tried to calm him down because he could not let the dragon's blood get out of control. He continued to tell him that, because he and Nog were wearing ordinary clothes, the man with the spider tattoo could not recognize who they were. The guy interrupted him and quietly asked him to help him with something. Hillman told him that he could ask for anything, because he had sworn to Nog that he would help him get revenge but Lenly asked him to give the killer's blade to his younger brother, Horton. But Horton is still training for the O'Brien Empire. Hillman answered him in surprise, but Lenly didn't hear him and gave him a magic crystal card and explained that there was money on it and it should be enough for both of them for a while. And I'll be fine on my own, Lenly summarized. Then let's go and I'll show you something. Hillman answered him sadly and left the room. They went into the dilapidated room and Hillman took out an urn among the stones and began to say that it contained Nog's ashes. When he left them, he did not announce it to anyone. For some time, he secretly kept these ashes, and now that Lenly had returned, the boy must decide what to do with them and gave it to Lenly. Lenly took it in his hands and walked silently to a flowering sakura tree, where he scattered his father's ashes near its roots and covered them with earth. The boy put up a memorial sign where he had engraved his father's name and surname with his own hand. He was crying bitterly, but he told Hillman that he would mourn his father for seven days, and Hillman left in silence. The cavalry approached the boy and asked if they could now return to the Shining Church because Cardinal Guillermo was waiting for them. The boy let them go. He didn't want to meet anyone during the morning and continued to sit by the tombstone. The cavalry sent a letter to the cardinal about Nog's death and Lenly's mourning. The cardinal was shocked when he read the letter. At the same time, King Feng Lai also received a letter about Nog's death and ordered everyone to gather for the funeral in Wushan village. His servant could not understand why he would go to the old poor family. Meanwhile, in the bedroom, Delin was sitting on the bed. She felt that something had happened to Lenly and could not sleep. She quickly got dressed and ordered the carriage to be started. It was already late at night outside. Dellen sat in the carriage and bitterly thought why God was punishing Lenly so much. By sending him trouble all the time, he must be strong. The news of Nog's death spread throughout Wushan village, and people were shocked and desperate. Lenly, while mourning, remembered how he and his father were in the ancestral hall. At that time, his father tested him for dragon blood and told him their family's secret, and Lenly remembered everything in detail. When Lenly was in mourning, he spent the night in a small building near the cherry tree with his father's grave. He found a tattered book there, and at night he read the secret dragon blood training manual and began to train. Reading and repeating all kinds of spells, he could feel the dragon's blood in his veins. After training for seven days, he became much stronger and felt like a dragon 100%. He also learned how to control the blood in his body and how to dragonize properly. Lenly had perfected his skills. Bibi the mouse looked at him with delight and said that after the transformation, Lenly's dragon-like smell became even stronger. And then Delin finally appeared, and she slyly asked the boy how he planned his revenge. But it was her advice on this that he asked. Bebe suggested that she should deal with Patterson herself for Lenly, and then it would all be over. But the boy replied that there was no need to hurry because Patterson was the younger brother of the king and it would most likely be difficult to deal with him and, based on his abilities, it would be difficult to fight him.
Dellen noticed that Lenly began to speak like an adult thinking person. After analyzing all the circumstances, Dellen said that it was not a good idea to ask someone for help. But the Shining Church appreciated Lenly, and so it would not be a big problem to get close to Patterson. After dealing with the king, the boy could easily get close to Patterson. But he had to be very careful. Lenly stood in the form of a dragon and said that everything was right. The main thing was to get close to Patterson. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door. Lenly was surprised to think that it was already midnight and who could it be? And he was also completely dragonized. Quickly returning to his previous form, he opened the door and saw Delia there. He was very surprised. Delia looked into his eyes and finally calmed down. Lenly was alive and well. She told him that she had heard that Nog's father had died, but seeing him alive finally calmed her down. Lenly thanked her for her experience and asked if she needed anything. Delia smiled and said that she could just come and see him, but there was something else. And she began to say that there were only eight months left until the end of the decade, according to the Yulin calendar. On the Yulin mainland, there is always a festival on the first day of the year, and Leon's family orders her to return to her family before the festival starts. The kingdom of Yulan is very far away from the Holy Union, and this journey will probably take about a year, and tomorrow she will go to her family. Delia whispered sadly. So we probably won't be able to see each other for a very long time, maybe never. Delia could not stand it and burst into tears. Lenly was shocked by her story. They both stood there in silence and the room was completely silent. Well, then I guess I'll go, she said quietly. Lenly asked her if he could hug her before she left. Dylan was silent, so he silently walked over to her and hugged her. She was an important person to him and had done many good things for him. The girl was touched and thanked Lenly for everything, and she became a little happy. But Baby the Mouse hissed that no one could touch her boss. Dellen turned around and quietly walked across the courtyard to her carriage. The boy stood there and silently watched her go. He was distracted from his sad thoughts by Bebe, who was screaming that she wanted to hug him too. The guy threw a towel at her and ordered her to go to bed. He was in a bad mood. After seven days of mourning, Lenly returned to the Shining Church with the cavalry. Guillermo personally came out to meet him and asked if he had considered joining them. Lenly hesitated for a moment and told him that he was still very young, but he planned to... To serve the king, he said with all his might. Guillermo was surprised and said that the capital of the kingdom and the Shining Church is Feng Lai, and the king obeys the orders of the Shining Church, which means that the boy refuses an invitation to a high position and chooses a lower one. Lenly told him that he understood, but the cardinal thought to himself that it was not so important. The main thing was that Lenly had decided to join the Shining Church. V put his hands on his shoulders and kindly said that this was a very important decision, and now he was considered part of their church and asked if Lenly had studied spells above the seventh level. Lenly replied that he hadn't studied such spells, but had learned the technique of flying through the principles of magic at the academy. Guillermo told him that the technique was not that complicated, and that the fact that he learned it by hovering was also good. But he reassured him and promised to get books on air and earth magic. The boy was amazed because it would be a great gift. He told the cardinal that he had once read a description of the power of the wind element in a book that said that the power of magic increases with level, especially single-target spells, and that it was the best of the elements, the ninth-level spell Destroy the Wasteland, and the forbidden spell Spatial Rift proving it. He thanked Lord Guillermo, and Delin, who was sitting in the ring, squeaked out that Lenly was very lucky. Guillermo smiled and told him to wait until they returned to Fen Lai, and he would immediately order Clyde to make Lenly a marquise and provide him with a large house. As he was getting dressed, Guillermo added that Lenly should concentrate on his training and not think about trifles, and then in fifty years the Shining Church would have another strong saint-level magician. Lenly listened to him, and thought that fifty years was a very long time. He would not be able to avenge his father, and find out his mother's whereabouts. Meanwhile in the palace hall of Fung Lai City, all the residents and nobles gathered, and King Clyde stood in the middle of the stage. He announced to everyone that today the king had important news for everyone, and Clyde announced that from now on, 
the youngest dual elemental mage in all of Yulan would be Lenli, and he would now serve their country. Lenli stood in front of him on one knee. He was very handsome and dressed in a festive outfit. The king put a sword on his shoulder and announced that Lenli Baruch was promoted to the rank of Marquis. Bibi the mouse, who was hiding under a cloak, looked at the sword in shock and grumbled. How dare the king put a sword on her boss? Lenli reassured her that it was just a ceremony. The king loudly thanked Lenli for his service to the kingdom and appointed him court magician, which he was very happy about. Lenli thanked him sincerely, and the hall was silent. And then the king noticed that his servants were whispering, and he asked them what their problems were, or if anyone would not like his decision. Everyone fell silent in an instant. He turned to Lenli again, telling him that he could not return to Dawson's conglomerate, and that he had prepared a nice quiet house for him. Lenli again thanked him sincerely. Suddenly, someone's luxurious carriage pulled up outside the castle. A stranger came into the hall and said, Who is this Lenli, whom my brother has awarded the title of Marcus? And Lenli saw King Patterson's brother. He realized that this was the king's younger brother, and the murderer of his unfortunate parents. Bib the Mouse also heard all this and understood everything, and screaming, she rushed towards Patterson, and Lenly barely managed to stop her, but because she was invisible to him, only some unknown wind blew past Pattinson. It's not time yet, Lenly whispered quietly to her, holding the hysterical girl by the tail, and he went to get into his new carriage. After a while he arrived at the luxurious small castle that the king had given him, as a new marquise. Maid stood on the threshold and greeted him. Bebe looked and wondered how big the castle was. It looks like Clyde spoils you a lot. Delen giggled from her ring. Lenly told her that the things in front of him belonged to his enemy, and he would not forget his goals. Suddenly he saw Kalen's father. He came up and greeted him. The man began to congratulate the boy and told him what a coincidence it was, because their family mansion was also on the same street and not far from Lenly's house and so he should definitely come to visit them. Lenly was very surprised that the Deb's mansion was right next door. Kalen's father continued that Lenly's house was much bigger than theirs, and that the king used to stay here all the time. The man looked at the boy and thought that he hadn't seen him for a long time, and he had really changed a lot. After Lenly was given the title of Marquis, he became a title higher than the Deb's family. Suddenly Lenly's surprised gaze fell behind Bernard's back, and he was amazed to see the figure of Alice standing there, looking at him in surprise, noticing that he had become completely different. Just then, Kalen approached and realized that the enemy's paths had crossed again. Bebe could not stand it, and began to yell that he was an ungrateful brute, because he had forgotten how he had been saved in the mountains, and how dare he say such things about her boss. But Kalen didn't hear her, but he noticed how angrily she was staring at him, Lenly turned to Bernard and said that he was leaving now and would not bother him again. And he turned around and left. Alice looked at his back and thought sadly that Lenly had not said a word to her. The guy returned to his new luxurious home for a while. His life will now be here. He decided to start training again and started by restoring the gravity field and doing handstands. I must train more in the gravity field and then my skills will grow thought Lenly as he stood on his hands and broke out in a sweat. Suddenly, Dellen said that someone was in the room. Who is it? Lenly shouted. A frightened maid was standing in the doorway, holding a tray of tea and fruit, and she dropped everything in her fright. When she came to her senses, she greeted him with a bow and explained that she was doing her job and brought him something to eat. Lenly was surprised to pick up the fallen apple. He had completely forgotten that he now had a servant. Well. If there's nothing else important, then don't bother me and you can go, replied Lenly to the maid. And screaming, the BB went outside to train. Lenly flew out the window. He took out his new sword and continued to train hard to learn how to manifest his purple dragon blood faster. He swung that sword like a madman, increasing his speed each time, and the sound of it slashing could be heard in the air. Then he began to chop stones with all his might, which flew into the gravel around him. Pausing for a moment, he shifted his grip on his sword, thinking that purple blood was an unusual weapon. Depending on its aura, the blade could really become flexible or hard as stone. And then he noticed someone's figure behind the lantern. 
It was the frightened maid again. Afraid to say a word, she stammered and said that the cardinals had come to see the master, and they wanted to see him. Lenly was surprised because he was not expecting them, and his training was interrupted again. Angry, he left, leaving the maid to collect her emotions. When he entered the room, he saw Guillermo sitting there drinking a cup of coffee. When he saw the boy, he said that he had heard that he had gotten a good job in recent days. Lenly looked at him in surprise because he didn't expect to see him here. And Guillermo continued that the guy was either training or making sculptures, and he actually missed that kind of leisure and even envied him. He continued that although art has a high price, the value of a person is determined by his or her abilities. The Deb's family, who lived not far away, was richer than him, but also weaker. So he ordered his guard to open the wooden box he was holding. The guard obeyed the order, and Lenly saw in the box two huge books beautifully bound in gold. Guillermo commented on his surprise, for he had said that he would give him books on higher-level spells. These two books are on the elements of fire and earth, and they are yours now. They are real volumes of higher-level magic, Guillermo replied. Lenly couldn't get over his shock. He thought it would be great. Spells and spell-casting techniques are very important, and even with great mental strength, without knowledge, it is impossible to cast a high-level spell. Guillermo looked at the boy with satisfaction and wished him success in improving his skills. The boy got down on one knee and thanked the cardinal for such a valuable gift, to which the cardinal laughed and explained that marquises do not kneel. The cardinal left the large group of soldiers and went about his business. Deline emerged from the ring and enthused that now that these wonderful books of Lenley's were available, it would not take long to learn new powerful spells. We are even closer to our goal, the girl kept saying. Lenley told her that it was true, but she shouldn't lose her focus, because Patterson was the king's younger brother, and he wouldn't get away with killing him. Biba the Mouse started screaming at this point, because she heard that Patterson wanted to visit Lenley. Lenley took her in his arms and calmed her down, explaining that Patterson was in charge of the king's finances and was just paying a visit for show. Suddenly an unknown blast wave hit Lenley's body. He could not understand who was next to him. He ran outside and could not understand what was happening. Lenley saw smoke where the cardinal's soldiers had been standing and couldn't believe that the cavalry, which consisted of fifth-level mages, had been defeated by someone so easily. Dylan shouted at the boy to stay away from the smoke and close his eyes. He was some kind of unusual guy. And Lenley decided to dive into the water of the pond next to the house. While he was bubbling in the water, he wondered what this strange smoke was and what kind of magic it was. The whole sky above the lake was covered with black smoke, and the unfamiliar warriors were already here. One of the black warriors suddenly appeared in the smoke. He had a skeletal face, and his entire outfit was black. Lenley was lying at the bottom of the lake and saw it all. He counted five strangers in black, but he did not know who they were because he had never seen them. He remembered that the church guards who were guarding him were level five, but they could not do anything against these strangers. Dylan emerged from the ring and explained to him that the knights were most likely killed by hypnosis magic and so they were unable to use the battle aura to protect themselves from the smoke in time. Lenly thought that he had to be very careful. After all, he would meet the same fate as the guards. Meanwhile, one of the strangers shouted that he should kill Lenly at any cost. Hearing this, Lenly decided to join the battle, but to take the form of a dragon. His dragonization began. Turning into a dragon, he flew out of the lake with a roar. The strangers did not expect to see a dragon here. The boy caught up with one of the strangers and struck the first blow. Being in the body of a dragon, his striking power increased several times. His hands, which turned into dragon claws, tore the strangers apart one by one, his incredible fury helping him to keep up the pace. Watching the black strangers fall one by one, the boy deliberately tore his arm open. The last of the five strangers looked at the whole trash and could not believe how this was possible. The information they had been given about Lenly was a lie. Lenly stopped in midair for a moment, and it was clear that a new plan of action was ready. One of the black warriors shouted the blade spell, and they instantly received weapons. 
Lindley also wasted no time in casting a spell of jade armor on himself, just in case. He looked at the strangers and thought that most of them were level 8 warriors, so his armor should be enough for the fight. With the spell Purple Blood, he activated the action of the flexible sword and it glowed with purple light, and he took off to attack the last three soldiers, dashingly slashing and piercing their bodies in midair. He moved through the air with ease, delivering deadly blows, and the warriors fell to the ground one by one. The last warrior looked at his companions and shouted in horror that indeed this sword was very sharp and fast. Lenly noticed him and started his hunt again. Delin whispered in his ear, To strengthen the purple blood, Vada, Lenly needs to use the dragon blood aura, but activating the dragon blood aura is not as fast as activating wind element magic. The last warrior flew into the air and shouted that Lenly was stronger than they thought, and since he had joined the Shining Church, he must be eliminated. Flying as close to the boy as possible, he shouted, Shine! Lenly looked into his eyes in surprise and thought it must be the magic of hypnosis, and the boy began to fall helplessly, losing his height. The black warrior was laughing with satisfaction to the whole sky. It seemed to him that everything had worked out, and then something incredible happened that surprised them both. B the mouse flew up into the sky and bit into the black warrior's stomach, who was not expecting such a surprise. Before the attack, she transformed into a beast mouse, and thanks to her master and his dragon blood, she was the strongest beast mouse on the continent. The black warrior fell helplessly to the ground, dying. He managed to say that this was impossible, that he, a level 8 warrior, could not defend himself against a level 4 shadow mouse. After recovering from the battle, everyone heard someone approaching. Delin could see that it was the allies of the guards, and they definitely didn't expect Lenly to deal with the Dark Alliance assassins alone, she said. Lenly quickly shouted out redragonization and cut himself again on the arm. The guards had already approached Lenly and asked if he was okay. Guillermo was walking quickly behind them, and he turned and asked if Lenly was injured. Guillermo explained that he was running errands and heard some strange, loud noises coming from here. Lenly showed his wounds on his arms and said that they were not critical and thanked him for his concern. There were two long, deep cuts on his arms. Guillermo looked at them and began to tell him information about the killers. And looking at their corpses, he explained that they were eighth-level killers. And he thought to himself, how could Lenly have defeated and killed them if he was a seventh-level dual elemental mage? and it was unrealistic for him to do so. Guillermo really didn't understand it, but he didn't question the boy either. He told Lenly that he would send someone to clean the yard of his house. Beeb the mouse looked at Lenly pitifully and asked why he had cut his hand. She adored her master. Dylan quietly reassured her and said that the boy most likely did it to hide the truth about his abilities. And it was true, because until the time came to show everyone his power of purple blood and dragon blood, but to avoid unwanted problems, you have to hide your abilities, especially when your opponent is Patterson. Lenly answered them both. Meanwhile, other events were unfolding inside the Shining Church. An unknown gray-haired cardinal said, So you're saying that Lenly has defeated all the assassins of the Dark Alliance? Guillermo stood in front of the stranger and bowed, and replied that it was true, father and that Lenly's ability was enough to allow him to finish the battle with only minor injuries. The priest was surprised to hear that the people of the Dark Cult were taken care of, but Lenly was left with injuries. Then he asked Guillermo again that the Shadow Clan knew that Lenly was a seventh-level two-elemental mage, and do you think they would have attacked him knowing that? Guillermo answered that the assassins who attacked Lenly were not weak. They were good at dark hypnosis magic. Lenly's skills are great and he works hard. In fifty years he will become a saint-level magician, but it is hard to say anything now if he becomes one of them. I hope Lenly can get better training and better protection. I think he should train with Lord Lao, Guillermo said politely. Lao? asked the Holy Father in surprise. Ask Lao himself first, he said, thinking that Lao has legendary power for the entire Yulin continent, and this is a good candidate. Everything will be done right away. Guillermo bowed and left. Father stood there motionless and thought, Did Lenly really single-handedly deal with the Shadow Clan assassins? Baruch. The Baruch family was one of the four families of warriors, dragon blood warriors. Meanwhile, 
Lenly was sitting in the middle of his kanata. In great pain, his wounds from the purple blood were very painful and did not heal well. Mouse BB brought him some medicine and reported to the procession bowing. Lenly sat and thought that Guillermo knew he was attacked, and he would not have sent anyone if they were not important to him. He must have suspected something. So the guy decided to pay a visit to the cardinal and got into a carriage and left. He wanted to play a little trick on the cardinal. When he arrived, the cardinal came out to meet him with a smile. He was really glad to see him. Lindley noticed a very thin and strange old man next to him and asked who he was. Guillermo introduced the old man as an ascetic of the Shining Lao Church. Beb the Mouse was very surprised to hear that this was the legendary Lao, and he was even thinner than the other ascetics. And then Lao jumped to Lenly and grabbed his hand with lightning speed. Everything happened so fast that the guy didn't even have time to blink. It was very strange because Lenly was a strong warrior, but he could not thank him for anything and was so easily grabbed by some weak old man. What are you going to do? The boy shouted, and Lao silently ran his finger over his wound, and in an instant it healed and disappeared, and Lenly's eyes became square. Lao bowed to him and quietly said that he had healed his wounds. He was indeed legendary. Grandpa asked if he was really Lenly. Guillermo said he was very talented. Lenly confirmed that he was, and then Lao suddenly said that he would not train him. Everyone around him looked at him in surprise. Because he only trains people with a good heart and a pure soul, but he... and looked deep into Lenly's soul with his eyes, and he continued that his desire to kill was too strong. Listening to him, Lenly thought that this old man was very insightful, because he never forgot about revenge for his parents. He's always thinking about how to kill Patterson, and so apparently this is clearly increasing his thirst for murder. And the guy said that if that's the case, he's going home, and he left in silence. Shocked, Guillermo apologized to Lau for the boy's behavior, explaining that he was only 17, and asked him to forgive him as well. Lau replied that it was okay, it meant that Lenly could be independent in making his own decisions. But he continued to tell him that people like Lenly are becoming a terrible weapon for the Shining Church, and in the future the boy may become a praetor of the church tribunal, and therefore Lau's training would not be suitable for him. But the old man added that Guillermo shouldn't worry about finding a teacher. A strong personality will find his way to success, because Guillermo is also a ninth-level archmage and he can achieve success on his own than from his instructions. Meanwhile, Lenly finally got home and lay exhausted on his bed trying to sleep, the mouse also lying next to him. Someone was knocking on his door again, and when he opened it, he saw a maid who brought several invitations from the Deb's family and asked to see them. The boy was quite surprised.